Bulgakov's friends usually become easily friends among themselves as well. So I wall, warmly welcome you as friends. We have already felt encouraged in preparing this conference by the support of His Eminence Rowan Williams, our dear colleague Rowan, who accepted not only the patronate for our conference, but also to deliver the keynote address this morning. We are most grateful that you are among us. I am especially grateful to Regula Zwalen, who as scientific director of the Sergei Bulgakov Research Center has borne much of the burden of preparation. My gratitude also applies, of course, to the two co-organizing institutions, Fordham University in New York, USA, and Volos Academy, Greece, who will extend their own welcome addresses. First of all, I welcome the dean of our faculty, Professor Dr. Mariano Delgado, who is a Spaniard and a Swiss citizen, a church historian and an expert for the interreligious dialogue. He will introduce us to the local spirit of the bilingual university, French-German of Fribourg. Mariano, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Schwer colleague Barbara Hallesleben, Schwer co-organisateur Votre Eminence Rowan Williams Archevec Emerit de Canterbury, Schwer colleague et participant à cette conférence sur l'œuvre en mans et créatif de Serge Bulgakov. En tant que doyen de la Faculté de théologie de l'Université de Fribourg, Je tiens à vous saluer et à vous souhaiter une chaleureuse bienvenue. C'est un grand honneur pour notre faculté que vous avez accepté l'invitation de Madame la professeure Barbara Hallesleben à étudier de manière approfondie Bulgakov ici. Grâce à l'initiative de notre collègue Barbara et de son assistante de recherche, Regula Spallen, notre faculté est le lieu de recherche et de transmission de la pensée de Bulgakov dans le monde germanophone. Le centre de recherche Serge Bulgakov, associé au projet d'édition de longue durée, est un honneur pour notre faculté. Depuis sa fondation en 1890, sous l'impulsion des catholiques suisses, la faculté est intégrée dans une université publique, cantonale, qui est marquée par la tradition de l'humanisme chrétien. La faculté est aujourd'hui une des cinq facultés de l'Université de Fribourg. L'intégration dans une université publique lui donne beaucoup de possibilités pour un enseignement de qualité pour la recherche et pour la collaboration scientifique à l'intérieur et à l'extérieur de l'université. Malgré le nombre restreint d'étudiants par rapport aux autres facultés de l'université, la faculté est la plus grande faculté de théologie en Suisse par le nombre d'étudiants, environ 500, de professeurs et de collaborateurs et collaboratrices scientifiques. Notre faculté est un lieu important de médiation entre les cultures théologiques et ecclésiastiques par l'internationalité de ses enseignants et de ses étudiants et par l'offre de ses programmes d'études en français et en allemand tout en intégrant de plus en plus l'anglais pour des conférences telles que celle-ci et des programmes de spécialisation. Depuis sa fondation, la faculté est étroitement liée avec l'ordre des prêcheurs. 
le corps des enseignants comprend un nombre important de frères dominicains. Le maître de l'ordre des dominicains est aussi le grand chancelier de la faculté. Le lien étroit avec l'ordre des prêcheurs a par conséquent un point fort dans certaines spécialisations théologiques. Par exemple, la théologie dans la tradition dominicaine, principalement dans le domaine de la théologie systématique, ce qui attire aussi des étudiants de l'étranger. Un des points forts est aussi l'esprit écuménique qui est vécu dans la faculté depuis longtemps. Et cela, non pas seulement dans la discipline spécifique de la théologie écuménique, mais aussi, mais aussi dans d'autres disciplines pour lesquelles des approches écuméniques sont évidentes. Tout le travail de la faculté se déroule d'une certaine, certaine manière dans un réseau écuménique et s'est intégré les églises de la réforme, les églises orthodoxes et l'église catholique chrétienne, en attirant également des étudiants appartenant à des communautés. Pendant la dernière décennie, la prise en considérant et certaines collaborations avec des communautés évangéliques dites libres ont également gagné du terrain vu le développement de la vie religieuse en Suisse et l'intérêt plus récent du Saint-Siège sur cet aspect du dialogue écuménique. La faculté est, d'une certaine, certaine manière, une faculté de recherche. Un bon exemple est cette conférence internationale sur Serge Bulgakov. Je ne suis pas un expert dans ce domaine, mais j'ai l'impression que Bulgakov a un profil théologique inhabituel. Il ne vient pas aux questions de politique et d'économie à partir d'une foi mystique, mais la préoccupation séculaire et sans Dieu de la dimension de l'économie l'amène à la découverte du mystère de Dieu dans l'histoire et la nature et à l'ouverture pour la perspective apocalyptique. C'est une voie prometteuse pour une théologie contemporaine d'aujourd'hui. Barbara dit toujours « Bulgakov est un si bon théologien parce qu'il n'a jamais étudié la théologie. Il s'est enfin préoccupé de façonner le monde et l'Église dans l'esprit du message du bon pasteur et de l'attente de sa venue dans la gloire, ainsi que de la descente de la nouvelle cité de Jérusalem. Et sachant bien que l'agneau dans l'Apocalypse de Jean est l'alpha et l'oméga, le commencement et la fin, qui a promis à tous, à celui qui a soif, moi, je donnerai l'eau de la source de vie gratuitement. Je vous remercie d'être venu à Fribourg et je souhaite à tous une conférence fructueuse. Merci beaucoup. work inside and beyond the faculty of our university. Thank you so Thank much. You. And I have the joy to give the floor immediately to Dr. Regula Zwale. Dear patron of this conference, Rowan Williams, dear co-organizers, dear speakers and participants, dear viewers at screens at home. 
I am cautiously starting to believe that this will indeed happen. That is actually a quote by Professor Catherine Yvduchov, not from her seminal biography on Sergei Bulgakov. Of course, that is probably part of many a library of many a library of people attending this conference, but it is a quote from our email correspondence from about two weeks ago. Hence, standing here, I am really starting to believe that this conference will indeed happen. And I want to thank everyone of having embarked with us on this adventurous journey that happened to be a bit more difficult than expected when we started planning this more than two years ago. And it still seems to be exceptional that we are able to meet in person at this very moment. Unfortunately, there are a few exceptions. Pantelis Kalaitsidis, David Bentley Hart, Pavel Chandinsky and Paul Ladouceur cannot be with us in person for various reasons. They will address us by Zoom connections that we all know so well now. I especially would like to thank the organizers, Barbara Hollensleben, Aristotle Papanikolaou from the Orthodox Christian Studies Center of Fordham University, who will join us tomorrow and Pantelis Kalaitsidis from the Volos Theological Academy for the fruitful exchanges and great support on and off several Zoom meetings. Also, I would already like to thank Dr. Stefan Constantinescu, co-director of our study centers of Eastern churches and the doctoral and postdoctoral students that will help us to navigate through this conference. At the moment, I see only Dario Colombo here, who you already met. You can either ask all of them practical questions or, of course, discuss theological issues about Bulgakov with them. So let's talk about the birthday child now. And instead of a photo, I would like to show you a very short footage from a film about the School of Paris that Antoine Orshakovsky has shared on YouTube. It's not of the best quality, but it shows Bulgakov in a vivid conversation with his colleagues and students, which is a very important feature of his personality. As for Bulgakov's work, there is a passage in his book, Unfading Light, that he wrote right before the Russian revolutions of 1917, and in which he described his work as a message in a bottle for future generations. Let these pages too, this lackluster record of great importance, be cast like a letter in a corked bottle into the raging abyss of history. Already in 1911, Vasily Kandinsky, to whom our conference design obviously refers, considered the economics professor Bulgakov a great expert on Russian religious life. And as early as 1914, the Russian philosopher Fyodor Stepun had noted that this thinker's contribution to the treasury of Russian culture will in the end prove more significant than much written by his contemporaries. Today, this statement can certainly be affirmed, but Bulgakov has not remained a phenomenon of Russian culture, but in the continuing raging abyss of history, he became a significant player in both the Orthodox diaspora and the ecumenical movement of the 1920s and 1930s. Today, we discover him as one of the most important theologians of the 20th century. Above all, the publications and English translations by Catherine Yevtuchov and Rowan Williams, as well as the translations by Boris Yakim and Thomas Allen Smith, have triggered a real boom in the study of Bulgakov in the English-speaking world. 
the awakening giant, as Brandon Gallagher put it nine years ago, seems to be quite awake now. The recovery of Bulgakov's message in a bottle in the German-speaking countries is mainly due to Barbara Hallensleben, who initiated crucial translation projects. In the framework of this university's Interfaculty Institute for Eastern and East Central Europe, Hallensleben's enthusiasm for Orthodox theology and Sergei Bulgakov reached not only students of theology, but also students of Slavic and East European studies who were well prepared by Professor Edward Schwiderski's philosophy lectures on Russian philosophy. Several students, like me for example, were involved in these translation projects and on this basis our Sergei Bulgakov Research Center was founded 10 years ago and in order to publish scientifically edited German translations and to increase the visibility of Bulgakov's work. All in all, Bulgakov's message in a bottle still seems to be helpful and to stimulate contemporary reflection on personhood, on political, social and economic ideals, the role of religion in society and history, on the relationship between God and his creation, and last but not least, it still nourishes the ecumenical hopes of many Christians. Let me add a few words about sophiology here. Since our current project is about editing a Russian-German version of Bulgakov's booklet on Sophia that was published in English for a Western public in 1937. This summary, as Bulgakov called it, brings to mind that his development of sophiology in the 1930s was not an old pre-revolutionary project over which he brooded as an isolated Russian emigrant, but Bulgakov did not shy away to present it as a modern theological conception, which in his, in his view does nothing less than to link all the current dogmatic and practical problems of modern Christian dogmatics and ascetics, and indeed the problems of Christian theology and culture as a whole. But, as he wrote, as a result of the atmosphere of sensation or scandal for Western readers, of course, the words Sophia and Sophiology are tinged with the peculiar exotic oriental flavor of Gnosis and indeed smack of every sort of rubbish and superstition. No one seems to suspect that in fact we are talking about the very essence of Christianity das Wesen des Christentums, that is a problem which is even now being discussed by the whole of Western Christendom. And he mentions Harnack, Schleiermacher, Barth, etc., etc. Bulgakov located the essential problem of contemporary Christian theology in a one-sided focus on God or the world, transcendence or immanence, God or man. For example, he criticized Karl Barth's non-acceptance of the world in the early 1930s. But for Bulgakov, heaven stoops toward earth. The world is not only a world in itself, it is also a world in God. And God abides not only in heaven, but also on earth. Christ and the Holy Spirit, the church, are in the world with human beings. In Bulgakov's view, the essence of Christianity is expressed above all in the dogma of Chalcedon on God-humanity that defines the complex relationship between divine and human nature that are united unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. Sorry. At the very heart of things stand, as of old, the basic Christian dogma of the incarnation of the world made flesh in the dogmatic setting bequeathed to us by Chalcedon. The roots of this dogma penetrate to the very heart of heaven and earth in the inmost depths of the Holy Trinity and into the creaturely nature of human beings. According to Paul Vallier, 
Bulgakov started developing a theology of culture in the beginning of the 20th century. And for Valier, it was no surprise that Bulgakov ended up with dogmatic theology. Because, as Polier wrote, what is the dogma of the incarnation of the word after all, if not a bridge to the world? Thus, what begins with a streit der Fakultäten between dogmatics and theology of culture sometimes ends in the mutually enriching project of church and world dogmatics. Bulgakov's sophiology, despite all justified criticism, is such an enriching project. Regarding secularization in view of oppressive church structures, Bulgakov definitely considered the secular, secularizing forces of the Reformation and Renaissance, as he put it, positive forces aimed to restore the dignity of individual personhood and the respect for the world as God's creation. However, he deplored the cutting of any fruitful relation between religion and secularity by atheist humanism or socialism, political religions, and churches instrumentalized for political goals. Hence, Bulgakov's sophiology, this lackluster record of great portent, was a daring attempt to reconcile God and the world, religion and secularity, as well as the Christian denominations. Very often, when it came to disagreements or even quarrels with people whose honest intentions he did not doubt, Bulgakov quoted the verse, in the Father's house are many mansions. For example, he did so at a theological conference in 1930 in the Swiss capital Bern, where Bulgakov and the Swiss theologian Karl Barth actually met and had dinner together. I would like to conclude this talk with Bulgakov's introduction to his lecture he held in Bern. In the Father's house there are many mansions and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are different and so are the ministries. There are undoubtedly very strong differences between different types of Christian piety, which perhaps make mutual understanding difficult, but one must be patient and wise in order to be able to learn from the other and not to persist in one-sided and vain arrogance. This is what our Christianity demands of us. Therefore, I think that many mansions are an important feature of the House of Wisdom to the building of which this conference shall contribute. Thank you for your attention. So I'm giving the floor to Nathaniel Wood from the Orthodox Christian Studies Centers of the Fordham University in New York. Good morning. I am Nathaniel Wood from the Orthodox Christian Studies Center of Fordham University. I don't have much to say other than to express my uh, great pleasure that we are actually able to meet here together in person this morning, however small a group we may be. Um, we certainly were not sure that this was going to happen. Uh, we at Fordham were not sure that we would be able to come, so we are very uh, grateful that this has worked out. Um, as Regula had mentioned, uh, we will be joined tomorrow by my colleague Aristotle Papanikolaou, the director of the center, um, who had been planning to be here this morning as well, uh, but was invited to speak uh, by the Patriarchate at the Synaxis of Bishops on the uh, document of the social ethos of the Orthodox Church, a document which bears um, many traces of uh, Bulgakov's own concern for uh, social issues in the Orthodox world. Um, so Bulgakov um, is in many ways very close to uh, the heart of what we do at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. Uh, his creative engagement with modernity, 
his ecumenical focus, his uh, close attention to social and political issues are all things that uh, shape our own programming. So uh, we are very excited and very grateful to uh, have had the opportunity to um, participate in this conference, to contribute to this conference. Um, and so on behalf of uh, Telly and uh, the other co-director, George Dimacopoulos, um, I would like to extend my thanks to Barbara and Regula uh, for all the hard work that they've done in getting this together um, and to welcome you all and uh, hope that you have a very productive and enjoyable three days. Thank you. So the next speaker would be Pantelis Kalaitsidis, who should be here from a Zoom connections. Hello, Pantelis. <laughs> Sorry, we can't hear you. Hello, Regula. Do you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Hello uh, to everyone. I'm very sorry uh, not to be able to be there physically, but uh, um, I, I joined the conference in my... Th uh, thanks to this uh, technological means. So I will read a short uh, address to the conference. Uh, Your Eminence Archbishop Rowan Williams, patron of the conference, dear co-organizers of the conference, dear colleagues, dear participants. It is a great honor for me to welcome you to this extremely important gathering on the occasion of the 150 years of Sergi Bulgakov birth, organized by the Sergi Bulgakov Research Center and the University of Fribourg, in cooperation with the Orthodox Christian Service Center of Fordham University and the Volus Academy for Theological Studies, of which I'm the director. The recent rediscovery of Sergius Bulgakov's work has not come out of the blue. Being a prolific thinker, a devoted priest, a pioneer of ecumenism, as well as a widely recognized systematic author, Bulgakov soon destined to attract an unexpected for an Orthodox theologian, but still increasing interest from the Anglophone scholarly world. With his extremely broad work, ranging from philosophy to economy and theology, opened new horizons, paved new paths in so many respects, such as anthropology, church-state relationship, Christology and pneumatology, eschatology, etc., etc., without whom contemporary Orthodox theology and church could not have or find the proper mean to deal with the critical challenges our world is facing today. Although often quite obscure in his writings or flirting with condemned or marginalized figures of patristic tradition with regards especially to sociology, as well as struggling with the demons and fears of his early unbelief, like Marxism and atheism, Bulgakov, by experiencing the upheavals of his time, and especially the Bolshevik Revolution and the two world wars, never stopped to cope with the spirit of his era in his efforts to find ways of giving witness as a new Old Testament prophet to a world which were living and perhaps is still living in the darkness. The above briefly described Bulgakov's ag uh, agenda is not indifferent to our vision in Volos. Since its foundation, Volos Academy has been pursuing a creative and critical discussion on the challenges the Orthodox Church is called to face today. As for example, the task and mission of Orthodox theology today, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue, 
the theological dialogue with modernity and postmodernity, secularism, church and state relations, liberal democracy, and more and more. It also sought to contextualize the message of the gospel in our time to ensure the constructive role of orthodoxy in the public sphere and to highlight the prophetic and eschatological dynamic of tradition in the dialogue with the anthropological, political and other parameters of Western modernity. This is exactly why Volus Academy much welcomed this event to the degree that Bulgakov's theological vision covers many of the Volus's goals in our attempt <coughs> to offer time to Christian witness to the present secularized and globalized world. The present world structure to fit to Bulgakov's own agenda conference emerged as a long awaited event due to the due to the urgent need of cultivating a serious, deep, and overall scholarly reception and critical appreciation of Bulgakov's work, which remained for the most part of the last century either untranslated or understudied. Living again in a period of time where many of our challenges had been foreseen by him, I'm confident that our eminent speakers representing different Christian traditions and research fields, and all of them specialists of Bulgakov's work, would have much to contribute to a new and constructive balanced reading of his legacy beyond polemical anachronism and parochial condemnations, a reading useful not only to scholars, theologians or clergy, but also to all those interested in the relevance of the saving world of the gospel for our contemporary world. With these thoughts, I greet the conference and I wish a fruitful dialogue and exchange and a successful conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pantelis. So now I'm giving the floor to Barbara Hollensleben for the general introduction to this conference. Thank you very much, Regula. It is my task and my pleasure to introduce us to the topic of our conference, Building the House of Wisdom. But as the house is toujours, uh, is always, you see, we are a bilingual, three-lingual university, <laughs> is always a very practical element, I will anyway start with some practical uh, remarks. We live together in this house of wisdom. By the way, you can discover here that we have these columns, not seven, some more, 10 or 12. I asked to take some of them out so that we would really have seven, but the request is not yet decided on. <laughs> but uh, remind uh, the pillars. So the University of Freiburg, we live together here in this house of wisdom for three days, and I think it should be good life, oitzen, in the sense of Aristotle. A basic element for physical well-being might be the coffee machine that we will have all the three days at our disposal. You can serve yourself with coffee and tea even outside the coffee breaks and always before you fall asleep. You received a bag with some useful and also important information. Please sign the form that you agree with the filming of the whole conference, the live stream, and the permanent online documentation afterwards. Of course, you maintain the right to cut personal elements that you really do not want to be published. Our film team, conducted by Mr. Alain Hornung, maybe he can show himself, 
the others have to work behind the, the floor. So thank you so much. He, they work in a highly professional way and they are also very likable. So in order not to disturb the huge office over there, please use the entrance on the other side of the aula or the entrances above where you can enter and leave the hall as you wish. We need from your side an urgent information even until the first break now. This is your registration for the different meals because we have to inform the restaurants and the bus company for Saturday. You find this printed form in your bag where you can announce your presence or absence and your preference for vegetarian food or food with meat. I have the pleasure to invite you to a final solemn meal in Bern, the capital of Switzerland, uh, on our last evening, Saturday 4th, where we will go by bus, by our own bus, to the restaurant Kornhaus Keller, where Bulgakov had a dinner with Karl Barth about 100 years ago. Regula will tell more about it, but only in Bern, so you have to come with us. And you should not miss this genius Lotzi. At this place, we will also have a true uh, Tischrede by the former president of the Swiss Reformed Churches, Dr. Gottfried Locher, incarnating in a certain sense Karl Barth. Please give the sheet to one of our collaborators or just leave it next to the coffee machine. We are obliged to distribute the corona guidelines of the university. You find you found your own small bottle of, for disinfection besides the two big bottles in the entrance hall where you have also masks at your disposal that you are obliged to wear inside the hall. I read these guidelines again and uh, if I understand them well, we have to wear these masks even during the sessions except when you speak. So when you need fresh air, Find some intelligent words to speak. <laughs> the guidelines are somehow embarrassing for us because they allow up to 50 people inside the aula, but only 30 people for the coffee break. And for the welcoming reception this evening, and only while sitting. These are the guidelines. But this does not apply to people drinking coffee and eating outside or in another room. I kindly ask you to take your coffee and tea and your food at the reception at a convenient place, including the Aula Magna, the upper part over there, uh, the entrances, other parts of the building, and the, the places outside when the weather is good. Those of you who have a blue point on their badges can show this badge to the register place in the Mensa so that everything you took is noted down for our invoice. I kindly ask the others to pay themselves or to try to get a blue point somehow. <laughs> For all those who need it, we organized corona tests, PCR and antigen, mostly tomorrow during the lunch break in a pharmacy next to the station, so it is not far from the university. There will be somebody who will contact you and accompany you so that you will not get lost and you will also find time to eat something and to join the conference in time. I hope that you easily find the connection to internet by the public access that the university offers, but I assure you that the conference is far too interesting to spend too much time with your emails. One simple proposal, this conference has its own post office. You find a postcard with this wonderful decoration of the aula which I will refer to in my following introduction, 
and you will get stamps and envelopes if you want to send it in a more discreet way. And of course, we prepared a small bookshop with our Bulgakov publications, mostly in German, but also the English translation of Bulgakov's book on the Apocalypse of John in English, and some other uh, books published by our study center for Eastern churches. I reflected on a special prize for the conference, and to make it really easy, let us say it is 10 francs, or 10 euro, or 10 dollars, not 10 rubles, uh, for books up to 300 pages, and 20 whatsoever goes beyond. I think this is a real good deal. A further important information, uh, now you will see it shortly, some 200 meters from the Aula Magna, you find a large fresco on the wall of a house that includes Bulgakov's whole sociological vision. It is the work and inspiration by the Romanian iconographer Gabriel Solomon, who is among us during these days. Um, can we see you? Here, there he is, you see. So, uh, we did not officially integrate a visit to the fresco in our program, where Bulgakov himself is uh, present, but uh, Gabriel is willing to show the fresco and also the iconostasis in the Salesianum, where some of you live, to smaller interesting groups, individuals. Please just contact him and fix a meeting. It will be also possible on Sunday morning for those who leave a little later and not already early in the morning. So I'm sure that I forgot something important, but let us start now and answer further questions when they will come up. Enjoy your time. We are grateful to all of you that you joined this adventure that seems still impossible in the moment when it already started. We are grateful to Sergei Bulgakov that he brought us together and continues to inspire us. And we transmit to him our congratulations at the occasion of his 150th birthday, Mnoga Yelieta, and an ongoing fruitful reception of his work. In principle, my contribution starts now. But I clearly decided that in no case I will go beyond the time for the coffee break. For this reason, I will just tell you what I wanted to tell you and what you will see as a full documentation in, uh, after the conference. I wanted to go to, to proceed in three steps, and maybe the time will be sufficient for the third step. Starting with the negation, the wisdom did not find a place on earth. You can read this in uh, the Ethiopian book of Enoch, considered the oldest known apocalyptic writing and well known to Bulgakov where Enoch says, no, uh, the, wise, the wisdom went back and took her abode with the angels. If you read this deep apocalyptic inspiration, second step, we even um, realize in a stronger way the affirmation that we read in the Old Testament. Wisdom has built her house, hewn her seven pillars, book of the Proverbs. I will try to point out how Bulgakov lived these two experiences and then show in a third step that I will try to present to you how he reacted by creating, by looking for, by developing an edifying oikodomain rationality, what is necessary today to do theology and maybe to think in our modern world. 
Our world shares with Bulgakov the insight into the political impasse. Politics is impossible, or at least, politics is possible under the condition of recognizing its impossibility, at least its inescapable limitations. To promote good life for the individual and the community, as well as for the whole of creation, in the same dynamics seems to be a contradiction. Bulgakov's alternative is by no means shared by all today. It ties in with the foundations of the political economic constitution of the Western world based on the duality of the house, oikos, and the city, polis. In Aristotle's perspective, the two dimensions are mutually dependent. In the house, the self-rule of the free and equal is practiced. Because in each house, rule is exercised, dealing with the necessities of providing all the goods of life, each householder is available for the role of both ruler and ruled without losing his sovereignty. The transition to the city, to the polis, is not only given by a collection of houses, but also by the freedom that the house gives by taking over the economic constraints. Here we find the weak point of this order. The political sovereignty of the master of the house, of the householder, is bought by the bondage of the slaves. House and city, in Aristotle's sense, live from the split between freedom and necessity and the delegation of necessity to people who hereby become slaves. This basic political framework of the good life forms a constant until the development of modern times. The delegation of the sovereign rights of householders to the state in the political theories of the 16th and 17th centuries finally dissolves the oikos and even the polis in their original political meaning. The newly acquired moral and political importance of domestic society remains without political weight of its own. Now the demand is made to declare the house as a private sphere, as an asylum in which the citizen, after fulfilling his public duties, is safe from the grasp of state power. From now on, the freedom of the home is constituted in an apolitical way. The constraints are administered <coughs> and distributed by the state. Almost unnoticed, Christian faith, with its proclamation of the house of God on earth, offers a perspective for the basic political constellation. If the house failed because of its inability to grant the freedom of self-rule to all members of the house, the Christian proclamation begins and ends precisely with this message. To all who received him, he gave power, ex usia, to become children of God to all who believe in his name. Gospel of John, first chapter. It is the same ex usia that the risen one, according to Matthew 28, now possesses and shares in abundance. The inequality in the house is removed by all assuming the role of slaves in freedom and friendship. Just as God emptied himself in Jesus Christ to take upon himself the resistance and constraints of his creation, up to the radical opposition of death, so believers share this kenosis. Among them, the reign of the free and equal 
in the spirit of the risen one becomes possible because, because all are douloi, diakonoi, ready not to delegate the burdens of life, the necessities of life to others, but to take them on themselves. In Bulgakov's words, incidentally, I'm used to thinking and understand this even more deeply. Ultimately, tragedy, along with its overcoming, of course, is the only worthy way of salvation. Bulgakov did not abandon his political concern when he became a priest in 1918. He continued, like Paul, for oikodomain, as oikonomos of the mysteries of God. Perhaps precisely because of his professional training in national economics, he can decipher the scope of the divine economy of salvation for our world today. So let us conclude by looking at the great symbol image of our conference, which you will be able to meditate on during the various talks. The artist, Vasily Kandinsky, already mentioned by Regula Zwalen, like Bulgakov, studied political economy at Moscow University and was distantly related to Bulgakov's wife, Yelena. His work mirrors Bulgakov's political struggle for the polis of humanity. In the beloved real city center of Moscow, he symbolizes the spiritual city. And I quote um, Kandinsky, where suddenly such forces are at work as the spiritual architects and mathematicians cannot, had not reckoned with. Here the sky is open and offers to life its colorful dynamism. Here apartment buildings and church buildings are part of the landscape. Birds represent the animal world. The cemetery of the dead joins those who are alive. Everything is in motion without a clear ordering center, yet in an attractive harmony. The term erbaulich in German, edifying in English, edifiant en français, does not sound as praise in the ears of contemporaries. But an edifying reason is what we need for our world today. The title of our conference, Building the House of Wisdom, honors Bulgakov as an edifying thinker. In doing so, we go beyond the reverend commemoration of 150 years after his birth, archive putting Bulgakov to the archives, and take on the task of co-designing a house of thought in which it is possible to live today and which makes its contribution to the city of people that we symbolically embody in our linguistic and cultural diversity, housed by the house of the university and its spacious Aula Magna. Welcome, the adventure starts, and also the first break starts. We will call you back uh, by the bell. Thank you so much.
So I ask you to take your seats. As I always have to look if I'm, I have the permission to speak. I got it, thank you so much. As uh, some other events, we too have a surprise guest. I warmly welcome Metropolitan, Metropolitan Hilarion Alfeyev speaking to us from Moscow. He would have liked to be with us these days, but his work schedule did not allow it. Metropolitan Hilarion is a member of our Faculty of Theology in Freiburg since his habilitation in dogmatics and his uh, since he did his habilitation in dogmatics here at our faculty. And his habilitation thesis refers to the disputes over the veneration of the name of Jesus on Mount Athos at the beginning of the 20th century with an important chapter on Father Sergei Bulgakov. Vladika, we are glad to listen to you. Welcome. <laughs> it's a more pleasant place than in the aula. He will appear, we already saw him. You see. <laughs> I already gave you the floor, uh, Metropolitan Hilarion Vladika. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Very well. I was trying to connect my microphone. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, I would like to warmly greet the participants of the conference dedicated to one of the greatest theologians of the Russian tradition, Father uh, Sergei Bulgakov. His uh, literary and theological heritage is immense. He was interested in a wide range of subjects related primarily to Orthodox dogmatic tradition. And in his uh, theological quest, he was relying primarily on the fathers of the church. But not only, he was deeply influenced by the uh, theological thought of uh, Vladimir Solovyov and here are the roots of his sophiology, which produced a deep controversy in the Russian immigration. He, in turn, deeply influenced many Russian and not only Russian theologians, including Father Sofroni Sakharov, who was recently canonized by the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Due to uh, time constraints and also due to epidemiological restrictions, I am unable to travel to Fribourg to participate in this conference. But I am glad to have this opportunity to welcome its participants, among whom a special word of welcome is due to Dr. Rowan Williams, a great scholar and connoisseur of the Russian theological tradition. Dr. Williams, I am glad to see you and would like to use this opportunity to inform you that we have just published one of your books in the Russian translation, the one dedicated to the sayings of the Desert Fathers. The group of your Russian admirers is therefore likely to expand. I hope to see you in Moscow for the presentation of this book once sanitary restrictions are lifted. My own contribution to this particular conference will be related to Father Bulgakov's theology of the name, which he developed in the context of controversy that arose on Mount Athos in 1912. I sent my paper to Dr. Barbara Hallensleben, whom I also sincerely greet and thank for her dedication to the Russian theological tradition in general and to Father Sergius Bulgakov in particular. May I wish every blessing from the Lord to all the participants of this conference. May God bless us all. Thank you. 
Ayman, Ayman, uh, thank you so much, Ladika, for joining us. You are welcome for the whole conference, but we understand that you are quite busy. But we strongly hope to see you soon again in Freiburg in personal presence. Welcome always in your faculty. Thank you very much. So we already heard a first introduction to our keynote speaker this morning. There is no need to introduce in detail the former Archbishop of Canterbury from 2002 to 2012 and the Master of Magdalen College in Cambridge from 2013 to 2020. Already for your doctorate, you worked on the Russian Orthodox theologian Vladimir Lossky. Your book, Sergei Bulgakov, towards a Russian political theology offers a representative selection of translated texts that constitute a wonderful introduction to Father Sergei's worldview. And in your book, Christ, the Heart of Creation, which I will recommend to the Metropolitan for Russian translation. Ah, this is a good idea. Uh, thank you, the inspiration of the conference is working. This book traces it seems to show traces of your profound familiarity with Bulgakov. So we are looking forward to listen to your conference on Bulgakov's Christology, taking up and questioning the criticism of Lossky and others that Bulgakov's Christology has an Apollinarian flavor. So probably we will uh, listen to a kind of synthesis of these two books. We are looking forward to listen to you. Go on. Welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction, but thanks even more to all those who have made this conference possible. I first began to read Father Sergi, I suppose, um, around 50 years ago, and a conference such as this almost inclines me to say nunc dimittis. At that time, very few people in the English-speaking world were at all interested, not only in Father Sergei, but in the entire world of Russian religious philosophy. That has in my lifetime changed dramatically, and is a fact for which I can only give the most heartfelt thanks. We are open as never before to being enriched philosophically and theologically by this unique and remarkable legacy. In my contribution today, I've set myself both a rather modest and a rather immodest task. The modest task is to look a little bit at Bulgakov's own evolving conception of the hypostatic in his theology to try and correct some of the misunderstandings that have prevailed among many readers early and late. The less modest task is to suggest just what this evolution of the concept of the hypostatic might have to say to us in our contemporary world. And because it is so immodest, I'm hoping that other better qualified persons will pick it up and develop it as it should be developed. So let's plunge in to the middle of things, to the controversy in the mid-1930s, to which Metropolitan Ilarion referred a few minutes ago. Vladimir Lossky's notorious attack on Bulgakov in his 1936 pamphlet, Spor Sophie, the Sophia controversy, addresses a range of topics, from the nature of canonical authority to the status of angels. But one of the central points of contention is a set of concerns about Bulgakov's doctrines of the person and work of Christ. This is not surprising, since the publication in 1933 of the first volume of Bulgakov's major trilogy, Agnitz Bozhi, primarily an extended treatment of Christology, was the trigger for the series of critical discussions 
which culminated in the dramatic public exchanges of 1936. Wolski, echoing to some extent the criticisms of Bulgakov made by Metropolitan Sergei, deputy locum tenens of the Patriarchate, Wolski challenges Bulgakov's emphasis on the eternally determined character of the incarnation of the word. He questions the apparent Apollinarianism of Bulgakov's account of the person of Christ and concludes that Bulgakov allows no real place in the economy of salvation for the free and personal agency of Christ's humanity. I quote, the Christology of Father Bulgakov diffuses itself in a cosmic pan-Christism, swallowing up both the Holy Spirit and the Church, and in the same way, annihilating human personhood in a sophianically natural process of divinization. That's from the Spor pamphlet. In Lossky's judgment, what is most conspicuously lacking in Bulgakov's theology is any vision of the church as a genuinely plural and interactive human community of unique subjects called into communion by the spirit, realizing in their countless free and distinctive ways the single reality of a human nature renewed in Christ. Instead of this, according to Lossky, we have a suprapersonal process in which the restoration of the human as such disappears. The incarnate Christ becomes the embodied sign of a non-temporal drama of intra-Trinitarian relations and a vehicle of the nebulous activity of divine Sophia whose ontological status remains obscure. And the result of this is a cavalier attitude to the actual historical and social constraints of the church on earth as the God-given context for each finite self to discover its true uniqueness in the form of a personal discipleship worked out collaboratively in a flesh and blood community. Lossky's essay sketches many of the concerns that were to animate his own later writing as a dogmatic theologian. And these foreshadowings are well worth a longer discussion in themselves. You might notice already the complementary tension between the work of Christ and the work of the Spirit, which is so fundamental in Lossky's mature theology. But I want in what follows to look at some of the specific criticisms Lossky makes of Bulgakovian Christology and to suggest that some points have been missed. Briefly, what I want to argue is that Lossky does not ask what the questions are that Bulgakov is actually trying to answer. He doesn't engage with the metaphysical hinterland of what Bulgakov was writing as a theologian. And so he misses something very central to what the older man has to say about humanity and its transfiguration. And as I shall suggest, there are elements here that are of very particular pertinence to contemporary theological discussion. The toxic ecclesiastical politics of the Russian emigration in the 30s certainly intensified Lossky's polemic. And his later discussions of Bulgakov in the lectures of his last years in the 1950s, um, for the most part unpublished, are more measured. But ironically, Lossky misses some of the ways in which Bulgakov could have been an ally in his own project. And his characterization of Bulgakov's thinking has unfortunately done a great deal to set in stone a view of Bulgakov's system especially his mature treatment of sophiology, that continues to cast long shadows over his legacy. I think it's time to see if some of those shadows can be lifted. Now, one of the points which is made insistently in Agnitz Boji is that the Chalcedonian definition provides only a negative account of the mystery of the incarnation. It is 
quite incidentally, a remarkable coincidence that the other great groundbreaking Christological work of the early 1930s, the Christological lectures of Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Berlin in 1933, make exactly the same point. And there's a conversation to be pursued there. But back to Bulgakov. It is tempting to conclude from the definition of Chalcedon that what happens when the word takes flesh is that divine omnipotence simply brings together two separate substances to attach them to a single subject or hypostasis. And the refinements of the centuries that followed do not add up to much more than a set of clarifications of detail within this negative framework. But if that is how we read it, we're left with at least two problems, so Bulgakov argues. We're left with a certain arbitrariness about the event of incarnation, the danger of, dis of reducing it to a display of divine power, exactly the kind of distortion that came to dominate a lot of late medieval Western Christologies, especially William of Ockham. And secondly, there is a conceptual problem in that the terms of the definition seem to deny the inseparability of nature and hypostasis, implying that we can somehow think of them in abstraction from one another, in defiance of any intelligible metaphysics. Bulgakov, in contrast, wants to present the incarnation, you might say, as miraculous but not absurd. And the balanced counterclaims of Chalcedon are, he emphasizes, not flat contradictions, but perspectival truths capable of being held together in a synthesis. Of course, the doctrine of the divine image in humanity is an element which qualifies any apparently arbitrary character to the incarnation. But the chief resource in rethinking Chalcedon in positive terms, so Bulgakov claims, is sophiology. Not, as Losky feared, sophiology as a system which directs our attention away from the concrete relations of finite agents to infinite and to each other, but as a metaphysical reinforcement for the valuation of the personal and hypostatic, which becomes ever more significant in the works which compose Bulgakov's major trilogy. To understand what's going on in this respect, we need to look at what Bulgakov had been saying about the concept of hypostasis in the period leading up to the publication of Agnitz Boji, especially that forbiddingly complex and compressed discussion in his 1925 essay for Struve's festschrift, Ipostasi Ipostasnost, with its attempt to clarify a notion of and how on earth do we translate hypostasnost? Hypostaticity? Hypostatic actuality? Well, but when we speak of the disjunction between hypostasis and nature, we are not, according to this essay, designating two components of some ontological hybrid. We are simply describing the grammar of being a subject. The life of self-reflexive intelligence is what happens as the subject's engagement with the world becomes itself a matter for engagement. In the light of this, we can say that this process of engagement with world and self is the core of hypostatic existence and activity, hypostasnost. I think this makes some sense of the way in which the earlier Bulgakov writes about divine Sophia as the love of love, or the love of loving. Sophia is not some kind of ontologically intermediary reality between God and the creation. Sophia is the sheer actuality of divine engagement with both the divine life as such 
and the finite reality which is posited by God as the other, in which God realizes love externally, just as God realizes love internally. So whether in finite or infinite reality, what hypostasis actually means is the concrete and continuous activity of engaging with what can and must be embraced, loved, understood, connected with, and transfigured. And nature is ultimately just that, a world, an environment, in the process of being perceived lovingly and brought into sustainable mutual relationality. Nature and hypostasis are not two components of some metaphysical hybrid. They are the complementary moments in the action of engagement with an environment internal and external. Hypostasnost is in no sense a thing, not even a quality or property among others. Hypostatic actuality is just the name for, first of all, divine actuality in relation, in the eternally stable relation of the Trinitarian life, and in the unfolding relatedness of God at work in the created order. And when we speak of Sophia, divine or created, we are speaking of this actualization in relationality of the world, the defining environment or defining conditions of the life that particular hypostases are living. To put it very succinctly, divine Sophia is simply that which God actualizes. Divine Sophia is that which God actualizes in the Trinitarian life and in the life of creation. In eternity, what God actualizes or realizes is the timeless reality of the shared Trinitarian life. In the finite universe, in time, it is the interdependent order of a creation which God allows to be other than the divine. So creaturely Sophia, accordingly, is what humanity, made in God's image and exercising God's likeness, actualizes when it is restored to its proper hypostatic liberty and is drawing and holding together the created environment in its maximal harmony, its optimal state of reflecting God. And this already makes it plain that hypostatic life is one of the ways in which finite subjecthood reflects infinite life. We are made to be hypostatic. That is, we are made to extend a loving, sense-making welcome to the world in which we exist, to learn to see its hypostatic potential and make that real. In this sense, our subjectivity is intrinsically sophianic. This means that our engagement with our environment is always already caught up in the divine action of making space and making sense, allowing the otherness of the created order to unfold in time and engaging with it so as to serve the mutual life-giving that anchors its stability and well-being. This is typically God's action in making the universe both genuinely other to the divine and also genuinely invited into unitive relation and so into harmony. But our human calling is to reflect this and realize it in the specific circumstances of our own existence. So in the light of all this, it's possible to see how we can speak of the divine logos acting as the hypostatic center of a continuum of human hypostatizing agency that is, the Incarnation. It's not that some alien subject has mysteriously inhabited the shell of a created nature, but that the mode in which human nature is routinely activated, that is, the hypostatic mode of the awareness of self in relation, this remains unchanged even when that activation originates directly 
in the divine hypostasis of the eternal word. Since all humans have the capacity to act theanthropically, in the sense that they are always already in some degree involved in the hypostatic transformation of their ambient reality. Whether we know it or not, and frankly whether we like it or not, we as human beings are always necessarily involved in that act of transformative appropriation of the environment outside and within. That is our humanity. And because that act of transformative appropriation is in itself continuous with, in some sense, the eternal transfiguring appropriation of God, what God activates. One can say that every hypostatic reality is in some sense continuous with the divine hypostatic activity. All human beings are ultimately defined, therefore, by this Sophianic gift and vocation, which in turn means that humanity from its first beginning is disposed towards the culminating realization of Sophianic transformation that appears in Jesus of Nazareth. So the mystery of union between the divine and the human, to which the Chalcedonian definition points, is no arbitrary matter, nor is it, so to speak, an opportunistic solution to a problem. It is the crown of the divine purpose in creation, the fulfillment of humanity's vocation to personalize and humanize the world in alignment with what divine love purposes for it. And this is what Bulgakov means, I think, when he says that every human hypostasis is in some sense already supernatural or even uncreated, language which he uses um, at various key points in Agnitz Boji. But it should be clear from the discussion so far that what he's not claiming is that there is some part of human nature, some separable element within human nature that is uncreated. Strictly speaking, as we've seen, there is no such thing as a hypostasis any more than there is such a quality as ipostasnost, in the sense of some identifiable, circumscribable characteristic we can scrutinize. The human subject is activated at its fullest, at its most human, by relation with the creator, a relation that frees it to behave hypostatically in relation to its environment. That is, to act in a way which releases the world it is part of to be fully and harmoniously itself. From the point of view of the activating energy in this context, we can say that the reality of a finite hypostasis, like yours and mine, is not an item among created substances. It's a configuration of finite life such that the infinite agency of God brings about certain liberating and transforming relations within the finite order. From the point of view of the unbroken continuity of the finite world, of course we can say that the hypostatic agent is unequivocally a created being. What else would it be? Now, I think Bulgakov is pushing the envelope in his terminology here, to put it mildly. But I don't think we should be convicting him too hastily of material heresy. Though his argument in Ugnitz that the language of Chalcedon permits a distinction between the human psyche of Christ and the divine principle of noetic rationality is completely unsustainable. Patristic theologians were determined to rule out the idea that any specific aspect of human existence, including the nous, was lacking in Jesus. Bulgakov's curious sympathy for Apollinaris, as someone who at least saw as no one else did a question in need of an answer here, repeatedly pushes him to defend the idea 
that the supreme controlling reality in Jesus, that which constitutes Jesus as spirit and life, is not any created presence. And that's at best an ambiguous and misleading emphasis in the context of the traditional insistence on the unequivocal human completeness of Jesus's humanity. Lossky is not wholly wrong to see some problems here. And yet Bulgakov himself is clear enough that there is nothing lacking in the humanity of Jesus. Though when he says this, it seems to be on the grounds that every created hypostasis is similarly open to the direct action of the divine. Christ's incarnate reality is undoubtedly unique for Bulgakov, but it's also true that Christ fully realizes what all human agents are called to, so that the hypostatic presence of his divinity is in no sense alien to the common pattern of human nature. Well, I began by noting that Lossky understands Bulgakov as effectively denying a role for genuinely human agency in Christ's redemptive work. In what sense can we think of the incarnate Lord as acting freely, as being tempted, and so on? Well, in fact, as all of you will know better than I, Bulgakov's discussion of the consciousness of the incarnate Christ is one of the most original and interesting features of his Christology. And read carefully, it should certainly qualify any suspicion that he gives insufficient weight to the actual liberty of Jesus as a human subject. It is, though, undeniable that Bulgakov tends to see hypostatic life as almost identical with self-awareness. Once again, Lossky's challenge has a point. To exist hypostatically is certainly, for Bulgakov, to appropriate a calling to relate consciously to the reality around and to one's own being as subject. Yet, all this being said, it's not entirely accurate to think of Bulgakov as identifying hypostasis with a purely psychological reality, the process of the self-realizing of consciousness. I think that's what Lossky is worried about, and he's not wrong to be worried about it. But Bulgakov is certainly not proposing that the human self-awareness of Jesus is in some way replaced by the divine mind, as if the cognitive limitations and moral or spiritual acts of questioning and discernment ascribed to Jesus were fictive. The detailed discussion of Jesus's theanthropic consciousness in Agnitz, one of the most sophisticated speculations on the subject in 20th century theology, attempts to tease apart the divine self-consciousness as such, which the word must retain in the incarnation, as the loss of this would be the destruction of the word's eternal hypostatic existence, from the specific actuality of the self-awareness of a human individuality within particular finite conditions. The divine self-consciousness of the eternal word, we could say, is not and cannot be the awareness of a set of conditions. And so it's not in any competition with the self-aware individuality of Jesus, the first century Jew. And um, thank you, Barbara, for referring to the book on Christology that I published a couple of years ago where uh, themes around all of this are developed a bit further. The point is that to say the eternal word does not lose the eternal divine self-consciousness in the incarnation is absolutely not to say that there's some intrusion of items of divine knowledge into a human mind. Equally, though, the word cannot become incarnate without consistently maintaining the filial consciousness, the filial awareness, the, the awareness of being utterly dependent on the gift of the Father's generation. And that is expressed in human terms, says Wolgakov, 
in Jesus' prayer. So, quoting from Agnitz, divine sonship is precisely what the divine I in Jesus is. Let me just read that again. Divine sonship, filiation, is precisely what the divine I in Jesus is. It is his self-consciousness as divine consciousness. In other words, if we talk about the presence of divine self-consciousness in the incarnate Christ, it is fundamentally the presence of filial awareness, the awareness of being the son of the eternal father. Anything else is unthinkable simply because the divine self-awareness is not the awareness of an env a contingent environment. Follow this through a bit further, and it does imply that we're not in fact looking at any simple identification of hypostasis with self-awareness. And so, as Bulgakov's treatment, quite substantial treatment, of the obedience of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus make clear, we are not looking at any kind of evacuation or compromising of human freedom or finite agency in the incarnate life of the kind that Losky most deplores. Bulgakov certainly asserts that all human subjectivity includes a tacit connection with the infinite reality of God. It is the immediate effect of our existence in relation to God and our bearing of the divine image. What it isn't is an element in our conscious psychological processes, an item of consciousness. So to be human is to be a subject activated by God. But that hypostatic reality, the activation of the hypostatic capacity in us, is not necessarily an item of our self-awareness in the ordinary way, a psychological fact. It could better be described as something that grounds or conditions our consciousness. And once again, this is in fact an idea not at all alien to the mature Losky's theological account of the person, as developed in some of his um, late 40s, early 50s articles. The articles contained in the collection um, A l'image et la ressemblance de Dieu. So we might attempt to sum up Bulgakov's concept of hypostasis and the nature of Sophianic existence and action along these lines. To exist hypostatically, to exercise hypostasnost, is to exist in a certain relation to a world, an ensemble of life or activity. This relation is not precisely the same as that of a conscious subject to the content of its own perceptions or sensations, though this is the most familiar expression of it. It is certainly to have, in the broadest sense, an intelligent relation to it, a relation of understanding, even if that understanding is not systematized in concepts. It is to have a capacity to respond consistently and creatively to what engages the subject from outside. In the context of speaking about God, the world on which divine hypostatic action works is simply the divine life itself, the life that is eternally and irreducibly a life of dispossession or self-displacement for the sake of another. This is what Bulgakov means when he, from time to time, talks about Sophia as the divine world. Sophia is the content of what divine action acts upon. Reflexively in the Trinitarian life, dialogically in relation to creation, as it generates the vast scheme of coherent interaction that is finite reality, the house of wisdom, to coin a phrase. Within the created order, human subjects stand in a special relation to the divine. They are sustained in their particular form of life by a fundamental connection with the hypostatic action of God, such that they are enabled to be vehicles of that divine action, 
in relation to what lies around them in the finite universe. In this respect, human hypostases can be said to stand on the frontier between created and uncreated. Or to use a rather different idiom, their relation with God is non-dualistic. They don't relate to God as one determinate substance to another. For certain limited purposes, therefore, Bulgakov would say, we can refer to their spiritual and hypostatic life as uncreated. Finite hypostases exercise their vocation as hypostatic creatures by acting so as to allow or direct or release sophianic energy in the world so that the world's coherence and beauty, its character as cosmos, are sustained and intensified. Our human fallen state is precisely our turning away from hypostatic accountability. We have erected our subjectivity as an object of knowledge in itself, ignoring the fact that this subjectivity is always already necessarily turning towards the other, the world, the human other, and the entire ecology of a material universe. To be fallen, for Bulgakov, just as, dare I say, for Augustine, is to treat the inner life as a self-contained, atomized reality, the generator of its own objects. Salvation, therefore, is the restoring of that accountability, the recognition of an already existing relation to our world, which requires us to accept the calling to care for and make sense of what engages us. So the incarnational restoration of our humanity is the reformation of authentic hypostatic existence. It is an act of radical self-emptying, kenosis, that permits human subjectivity to recognize anew its already given investment in and definition by its world. And so to be released from the fiction that the basic ontological truth is a plurality of atomistic and abstract subjects of consciousness and desire. Divine hypostatic existence in this context is the originating act on which the existence of a world summoned into intelligent, conscious and developing harmony is grounded. God as threefold hypostatic existence embraces the unconditioned love and gift that is already the actual shape of divine life. In the language Bulgakov uses especially in Svet, God loves God's loving and God's wisdom is God's love of God's loving. But God loves what is not God, refusing, as it were, to be God alone, but creating a world to share in the love that is God's. So Sophia is also God's love of the love God has for creation. Finite subjects, realizing their, hypost uh, their hypostatic life in time, are already Sophianic in that they are taken up into relation with this love, whether they know it or not. But they are also called to make that love active in finite particulars. The hypostatic, sophianic vocation of human subjects is to love God's love for creation and to be effective conduits of that love in the act of what I called transforming appropriation. And of course, their love for God's love is already itself an aspect of God's love. They are brought into being as lovers by the love God has for the world which God canonically allows to be. Bulgakov brings us back repeatedly to the non-duality of hypostatic life, Sophianic agency, transfiguring love, as these appear in God and in creation. And I think that's what makes sense of some of what seem to be the more problematic aspects of his Christology. Nothing in human nature is supplanted or replaced in the incarnation of the word because all finite hypostatic existence is at some level 
in the same non-dual but distinct relation with the eternal hypostatic act of God as word and son. Nor is Bulgakov suggesting that hypostatic life is self-conscious subjectivity, personality. It is what makes self-consciousness possible, but is operative at a deeper level as grounded in the finite subject's status as image of God, activated precisely by the hypostatic life-giving reality of the eternal other, the word answering to the Father. And I might again just note in passing that a similar distinction between the person and the personality is drawn again by Bonhoeffer in his Christology lectures of 1933, building on some of the arguments he'd advanced in his Habilitationsschrift uh, three years earlier. Now, how exactly we are to think about the divine word and son, or indeed how we are to think about the interrelation of the three divine hypostases as such, is an issue about which Bulgakov has a number of diverse and complex ideas. The implication of what we've just outlined is that each of the divine hypostases is what it is in virtue of its activating of the same divine substance, the Uzia, Sophia, which is ultimately the reality of self-abandoning gift. But in the wake of the patristic tradition of distinguishing the three persons on the basis of their mode of origination, Bulgakov offers two schemata for understanding the differentiation of the divine hypostases. They can't be three coordinate instances of divine life. And Bulgakov is very critical of the degree to which even theologians as sophisticated as the Cappadocians give hostages to fortune on this. Bulgakov would not have been sympathetic to the idea that an orthodox Trinitarian theology was necessarily more pluralist, let alone social, than Western, to pick up the cliches of some of the last few decades. The three divine hypostases have to be configured in a set of specific non-transferable relations, not as a coordinate plurality. So in the Ipostas essay of 1925, we have a model that owes something to Fichtian philosophy, though it takes it in a very distinctive direction. The subject is always the subject engaged in, invested in the object or datum which actualizes it as subject. At the same time, it's inseparably bound up in the perspective of the other I, which guarantees that the first subject isn't caught up in a simple binary relation with what it sees or grasps. That is, there is a fundamentally triadic structure in the hypostatic world. I am I only because of what I receive and appropriate. At the same time, reality is not just the polarity between the I and the what it appropriates. There is the I that is constituted by relation with the other I, equally constitutive, equally significant. Notably in the very complex pages of um, the Capita de Trinitate, the Golveo Trichnosti, this is supplemented by the linguistic account of Trinitarian ontology which has been so very well explored recently by Joshua Heath. Communicative or meaningful reality has the propositional form of X is F. There is a this specifying a unique substantive point of orientation and there is a thus specifying a continuous or coherent form of existing. And there is the copula which directs us to the actuality of this existing thus in actuality, X is F. Relating this to the earlier Trinitarian model, we can see that the thus of the interhypostatic life of the Godhead is a version of what that model presents as the primordial object which constitutes, constitutes the primordial subject, what it is. While the copula, the is, 
announces that the relation between subject and predicate is not an abstract, context-free identity, but a living non-equivalence that is at the same time an inseparable interdependence and mutual definition. As Bulgakov argues in Glavi, the propositional form X is F has as its paradigm the first person I am A. The subject's recognition of being constituted in and by otherness, existing in and only in a state of relatedness, an active mode. Not I am I, but I am A, I am something. The copula, the am here, establishes the related self-reflexive subject as both living and productive of life, and the form of predication mirrors the form of subjectivity. Now, Lossky and other critics worried that Bulgakov's Trinitarian thought reduced the divine life to the self-realization of a single subject, the Fichtian pattern that haunted a good deal of idealist-inflected theology and philosophy in the 19th century. But this would be to ignore the subtlety of Bulgakov's models, not to mention his explicit repudiation early on in Agnes Boji of any Fichtian assimilation of divine life to the unfolding of human selfhood. From one point of view, Bulgakov can indeed affirm that the divine life is a single consciousness, not a fusion or cooperation of three subjectivities. From another point of view, it's clear that what it means for God to be subject entails the irreducible plurality of the points of orientation set out in the two models of hypostatic diversity we've just considered, and that each point in the triadic life is fully hypostatic in the sense that it exists eternally and actually and is both wholly implicated in and wholly distinct from both other points. So the entire life of the three persons of the Trinity is hypostatic action. And we can also say, rightly, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equally hypostases. But because they are hypostases in the fullest and most perfect sense, we can't enumerate them as if they were three coordinate agents. They act hypostatically only in their differentiated relation to one another. And this is an aspect of their kenotic reality, the fact that they have no reality en soi, no reality that is not constituted by their unrestricted gift of life to each other. The self-sacrifice that would seem to us a tragic self-destruction is in God the plenitude of productive love and bliss. And Bulgakov's discussion of intra-Trinitarian kenosis is, again, I think somewhat misunderstood if it's thought of in terms rather more like those of Moltmann, the tragedy within the divine life. I don't think that is ultimately what Bulgakov is saying. He is saying that the uh, dispossession, even the devastation of the self in the Trinity would in finite terms be tragic and in divine terms is the opposite. Infinite spirit, and infinite, love, infinite spirit and finite spirit are alike in that both the hypostatic agencies realized in the embrace of generative love towards what is other. But what is always to be realized in the world of finite spirit, that is the coincidence of hypostasis and nature, of subjectivity and content, what is always to be realized in our lives by struggle and failure and pain is eternal and simultaneous and joyful in God. So moving towards a conclusion, I'm saying that Bulgakov's Christology can't be understood without this distinctive approach to hypostatic existence. It's this that enables us to see his ambiguous and often what I'd call lyrically transgressive language about the uncreated character of hypostatic spirit doesn't, in fact, amount to a denial of the concrete humanity of Jesus, just as his conception of Sophianic transformation doesn't subordinate creative freedom to a collective or suprapersonal cosmic process. Lossky's engagement with this hinterland is, at best, sketchy. And as I've already noted, the irony is that Lossky's own insistence 
on the unfathomable singularity of the hypostasis and its freedom from the determinism and repetition of the merely natural addresses precisely some of these concerns. But one aspect of Bulgakov's scheme which finds no echo in Losky, or indeed in other theological personalists of the 20th century, is the point noted at the end of the preceding section. And it's a theme of particular pertinence to current theological and practical discussions. In effect, Bulgakov is claiming that hypostatic existence is intrinsically a form of life characterized by care. I'm aware of the Heideggerian resonances of this, but it seems the best word for the moment. To exist hypostatically is to be already in a relationship of nurture towards the world that is encountered. To put it still more strongly, any account of human subjecthood, which ignores the responsibility to nurture and include the environment in the construction of human meaning, is illusory and destructive. For Bulgakov, God's Sophianic existence is the continuity of a form of life, an essence that is ceaselessly productive of and affirming of otherness. As we have seen, this is primarily the internal differentiations of the Trinitarian life and derivatively the creation and sustaining of the finite world. I'm saying then that Bulgakov's phenomenology of subjectivity is distinctive and markedly non-Fichtian in that the object whose co-presence establishes the subject as subject is not simply an object to be known. The Sophianic analogy, to use a rather shorthand expression, implies that self-reflexivity is at the same time, always, consciously or not, the love of loving. What is encountered, encountered as other is that which has an immediate claim on my love. What I know when I know myself, what, sorry, what I know myself as if I know myself truthfully, is a subject whose life is constituted by offering or sharing life with the other. In the hypostatic life that is God's, this life is literally generative of the other, the father's birthing of the son and the creation of the finite cosmos. We finite beings don't and can't originate otherness in this way, but our role in creation is quite specifically to bring the environment more fully alive in its Sophianic interdependence. Bulgakov's already richly developed anthropology in Svet related the Sophianic to art and politics as well as liturgy. And it is the transformative vocation of the human in all these diverse contexts, art, politics, economics, liturgy. It's the Sophianic vocation that is the transformative vocation of the human, enabled by and grounded in Sophia. So, I'm skipping just a page or so in the interests of time here. The way Bulgakov is developing the doctrine of the divine image, which runs through all his discussion, is something which offers some very decisive insight, I'd say, into what needs saying now in a Christian anthropology for our own context. It's become almost commonplace for theologians and others to complain about the individualistic models of human selfhood in, in modernity. It's increasingly common to note that many aspects of inherited Christian anthropology have reinforced the illusion of a human destiny detached from the world to which humanity belongs. What Bulgakov's discussion of hypostatic existence achieves, in spite of all the overcomplex idioms and loose ends, which you will have become well aware of in the last 50 minutes or so, is a way of connecting non-individualist concepts of selfhood, not only with the givenness of interpersonal relations, that's the easy bit, but with a pre-existing relation to a world whose fulfilled meaning requires the human hypostasis to be itself and to enact its vocation to responsibility. 
Not only are we always already connected with the material and temporal universe we inhabit through the countless natural processes we're part of, we are always already called to love the world that is ours as God loves, that is, to make space for its freedom and integrity and to animate and enrich its interconnection and balance, to serve its beauty and its justice. The self that we become conscious of in reflexive human activity at any level, not just in canonically sophisticated forms of self-awareness, is a self which would not exist except as a self capable of and summoned to care, because its foundation is the prototypical self-giving identity of God in whose image the finite self exists. There is no other way of being self or spirit. And the attempt to create and sustain a culture in which investment in and nurture of our environment is an option irrelevant to the integrity and well-being of our selfhood is an exercise in dangerous fantasy. It's an aspect of the dangerous fantasy that seduces us into trying to think of our selfhood independently of human others or of the transcendent other. Like those doomed enterprises, it will finally make us less fully human. No less in the divine image, no less embodying a summons to love, but persistently frustrating the expression of that image. So I've suggested that there are points to be made in defense of Bulgakov against Lossky. That the immensely complicated and technical elaborations of his discussions of the nature of hypostasis, in fact, carry with them a more or less adequate response to Lossky's accusation that we lose the personal, the incarnate, the specific, the fleshly, and the contingent in Bulgakov. It may at times feel like it, but I don't think that's what's going on. And if we take on board this ambitious and innovative reconstruction of the idea of the divine image as carrying with it a definition of the personal as fundamentally invested in care and nurture for the environment, external and internal, we have a Bulgakov who has some very significant things to say to the contemporary consciousness. It's a theme which could equally well be read in the light, say, of Dostoevsky's affirmation of the universal answerability of the self for the healing of the world. Not as an individual achievement, a manifestly absurd picture, but as the grace-prompted readiness to exercise care and serve the processes of reciprocal life-giving in whatever situation the self finds itself in. Bulgakov presents his readers with a sometimes disorienting abundance of insight about art, politics, and discipleship in their interdependence. And our current social and intellectual context is badly in need of that level of integrated reflection if we're adequately to resist the dominant myths of a reductive market ideology even more ambitiously destructive than the varieties identified and attacked by Bulgakov in his day from his early work onwards. His Christology, I want to say, deserves further unpacking to draw out an anthropology in which, quite simply, what makes us human is the shape or direction of involvement in the making of meaning, which is prior to all our choosing or self-positing. Bulgakov's friend and spiritual daughter, Saint Maria Skopcova, argued with passion that Christianity needed an ethic that went beyond an ideal of loving action that was somehow added on to the basics of discipleship, something that was anchored in connections which pre-existed our moral dispositions. For Mother Maria, this was symbolized above all in the love of motherhood, where the bare fact of physical involvement entailed a kind of love that went quite beyond choice and policy. And this symbol provided for her a key to grasping what love in the body of Christ actually meant. Now, Bulgakov works in a different idiom entirely, but I do think some of the same concerns are in view. The recognition above all 
that the self, in order to be a self in any robust sense, must recognize the givenness of its investment in the service of the world's ecology, in the embodied meaningfulness of a fully reciprocal pattern of life for human society and for the society, the oikos of the finite cosmos. Bulgakov's efforts to spell out what life as hypostatic spirit entails are labored and not always clear, and the exposition you've just heard shares abundantly in those characteristics. But in their Christological setting, it's possible for us to see them as guidelines for imagining the spiritual as essentially to do with the intentional giving of life and building of mutuality and solidarity, which runs analogically through the whole pattern of the life that God unveils to us in the narrative of the divine action and supremely in the self-emptying act of new creation that is the Paschal mystery. Thank you so much for listening. Dear Rowan, thank you so much for your precious contribution, especially your translation of Sophia as care and nurture seems to me extremely fruitful. So when I listen to you, I am even more proud of being a professor of dogmatics because you show and you uncover how these most classical concepts really uh, bring into communication and unite the time of the early Christianity with the time of Bulgakov, with our most uh, contemporary um, discussions, our central concerns, our engagement, and how even they uncover in dogmatics new fascinating aspects. We have about a quarter of an hour until our uh, break for lunch, so it is maybe the moment to adapt to the conditions of our filmed conference, and I propose to proceed in the following way. Rowan Williams has already taken his seat on the podium again, those who want to ask a question so that you are seen and better heard should advance and, and proceed to the stage. You can talk there at the microphone. I ask you to start by presenting shortly yourself by your name and, uh, of course, being short and precise in your uh, question or your reaction uh, to what Rowan told us, and in the end we will give the possibility to Rowan to answer to all those statements. Is there the possibility, please just come take a seat in the first place and then create an order among your interventions. Uh, Antoine. Uh, this, please use this microphone. Good morning, everybody. I'm Paul Gavrilouk, University of St. Thomas. Uh, uh, Archbishop, thank you so much for this uh, profound and really nuanced and inspired lecture. I think setting uh, Bulgakov from the very beginning in conversation with Lossky, I think, is, is just an incredibly illuminating and enlightening way of, of, of looking at what Bulgakov is doing. I often find myself siding more with Lossky and not with Bulgakov in some of these points. But I want to specifically address one issue. I have many, but one, one issue. And I mean, any act of explanation is rendering the author that you're explaining more coherent than the author really was. And so your point about Sophia being self-actualization uh, of, uh, uh, of the divine vis-a-vis -vis the divine life and vis-a-vis -vis creation, um, there's, there's plenty of language in Bulgakov that speaks to self-actualization, so there I agree. But there's also plenty of language in Bulgakov that speaks about Sophia as, in completely impersonal terms, as the foundation or the ground of being and the world and also as a repository of the paradigms of all things. Bulgakov is not committed to the classical doctrine of divine simplicity. He's not committed to the uh, let's say, Thomistic understanding of God as the pure act. And so in light of those two points, it seems to me that 
if one were to go with the kind of access definition of Sophia as self-actualization, one at the same time misses that secondary context of Sophia as the ground of uh, all being and also as the repository of forms. I just wanted your, you know, your thoughts on the matter and perhaps also the way in which this could be folded into the understanding of Sophia. Thank you. Maybe we can collect some questions, uh, if you agree, Rowan. Yep. And, uh, so maybe already approach the scene so that we can see how many people want to take uh, the word. You can already start okay. with your question. But Hello, everyone. My name is Nicolas Spurlis. I'm deputy director of the Volos Academy of Pathological Studies. So, Your Grace, I'm grateful for your uh, intervention about Bulgakov uh, Christology which is uh, something that sometimes has been uh, undervalued in general, in Orthodox theology. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, what is the role, the specific role of the Holy Spirit in this kind of Christology? At, uh, if we take into account that the Holy Spirit is the Trinitarian person that sanctifies creation. And the second one is, if I understand well, uh, Bulgakov defines human hypostasis more or less in terms of uh, self-consciousness. If that is the case, uh, is there any place for those disabled to consciously relate or act in creation in the own reality? Thank you. So we may add one more question, and afterwards uh, Rowan can answer a first time, and then we have two more, um, two more questions, and then we will finish the first session. Yes, thank you. Uh, Brandon Gallagher, University of Exeter. Um, I'm just curious, in, in all of this, um, uh, very often there's this idea that uh, Lossky is all the fathers and um, uh, Bogakov is, is, is not interested in patristic. This, the translations, uh, of course, Yakim cuts a lot of the, the things. And when I asked Yakim about this, he said, well, he, he didn't think anybody was interested in this material, that it was of arcane interest. So um, one of the, the things that I was wondering is in the elaboration that you do, uh, to what extent is, is he reading, in a way, rereading the fathers in light of some of uh, his romantic interlocutors? So it's a new type of, in a way, neopatristic synthesis, which Matthew Baker, in fact, uh, uh, said. So the first time to, for Rowan to answer, and then we will continue with the questions. Good. Um, this is obviously on. Thank you so much. Um, three fantastic sets of questions, um, which would really need another lecture or so to respond to. But let's start with um, Paul's question. I think what I wanted to try to say was not so much that Sophia is for, for Bulgakov self-actualization. It is that which God actualizes. Therefore, yes, it is the already existing life of God in action. It's a sort of recursive feedback. But it's also that which God activates in the, the generation of the conditions for God's life and God's grace and God's love to be real outside the divine life. So all you said about the, the non-personal elements of the Sophia language, I think, come in at that, at that level. Um, which is why, though I didn't have time to develop this, I mentioned the way in which Bulgakov uses that rather strange phrase, the divine world, for Sophia. Because that is, as you might say, the, the, the whole set of conditions within which the divine action becomes active. And that's, you know, that's Sophia. Um, to Nikos's questions. Um, the role of the spirit in Bogakov's Christology. Well, indeed, um, I wish really I'd had time to, to say more about the follow-on from Agnitz in the second volume of the trilogy. Some of us were talking about this at dinner last night and agreeing that Utishitio is in some ways the most coherent and finished of the great trilogy. And that's where I think you'd look for um, a fuller exposition of what the role of the spirit is in all this. Um, 
very, very briefly, and I'm quarrying some very imperfect memories here, I think that when Bulgakov writes about the role of the Spirit in the incarnate life of Christ and in the life of the Church, it's very much in terms of how the hypostatically actualized humanity that is Jesus' humanity, because it is itself always already suffused by the eternal life of the Spirit in the Trinity, how that then becomes actual in the form of community, and how it is the ground of Catholicity. Again, a theme which is pretty much in common with Losky. So there's a great deal to be drawn out there. Um, and the fact that Agnitz has a, a lot of exegesis and quite a bit on the way in which spirit and Christology interweave in biblical material, it's certainly not, um, not alien to or foreign to what, what he's after. The question about hypostasis as self-consciousness, yes, you nail a really, really significant point here, and it's something which I, I share the concern about. If you have a personalism for which a particular kind of self-awareness or self-consciousness is essential, what about those people who are not typical? We don't follow the normative patterns of self-awareness. That's why I mentioned in passing that I think Bulgakov does leave room for what I called something other than the canonical forms of self-awareness. There is an understanding, an attunement to, and a, an engagement with, consistent engagement with the environment, which can be perceived in people who are neurologically atypical, disabled in whatever ways. I think there, there is a way of salvaging that. But it's very important to note that so much of personalist rhetoric can end up implicitly dehumanizing those whose self-awareness doesn't reflect the kind we take for granted. Very glad you raised that. And Brandon, the uh, last point about Bulgakov and the Fathers. Well, yes, indeed. Um, what is astonishing, of course, in the quite early Bulgakov, above all in Svět, is that Bulgakov, without any formal theological training, displays a really formidable range of patristic literacy in Svět. I've often enjoyed saying that the first substantive treatment of Palamas in any European language is probably not Father Staniloy's thesis, it's actually the discussion of Palamas's apophaticism in Svetnevicherny. So, um, yes, Bulgakov is, is a reader of the Fathers, and while in Svet he's, um, he's mostly looking at the apophatic in the Fathers, in the later works he's undertaking what I'd call a very sympathetic critique of certain kinds of patristic consensus. So what is rather daring, you might say, in his context, is for him to say, Chalcedon gets you so far, but it's the recipe, not the cake. And Cappadocian Trinitarian theology does a great deal of ground clearing, but it also does a great deal of um, contaminating some of the concepts it works with and pushing you towards an anthropomorphic pluralism in the Trinity when it's not read carefully. So he's neither someone who's writing off the fathers, nor someone who in Florovskian mode is simply saying, well, there is a canonical language here which has to be observed. He's reading the fathers with total commitment and sympathy and assuming that within, in a theology done within the body of Christ, it's perfectly all right to say to another theologian, that's brilliant, but have you thought of this? Which I think is really what, he, what he's saying sometimes in his reading of the Fathers. And I think it's a disaster that some of the translations just amputate those discussions. I'm afraid it was a habit that Andronikov set in motion with his abbreviation of Agnitz.
We give the floor to two more speakers and then the final word, word to uh, Rowan again. John. Um, thank you very much, Ron. This, this is a kind of, that was brilliant, have you thought of this sort of question? Um, and and um, yes, I'm totally in 90% agreement with, with what you're saying. Um, the, the, the defense of Bulgakov, especially, I think, your account of the Trinity, and most of all, the, the sense that sociology is connected to a qualification of personalism that's profoundly relevant to our contemporary ecological crisis. There are things as well as people, and, and, and they go together. I'm absolutely delighted that you've said that, and I really welcome it. Um, the 10% of, of questioning is kind of like the equal and opposite reaction to Paul's. I'm wondering whether you're still too much personalistic in a losky mode in, in responding to um, the, the sociological um, perspective, because it seems to me that it's insisting on the primacy of the divine perspective where freedom, there is no contrast any longer between uh, freedom and determinism, even though it's incomprehensible for us, just as somehow the contrast between essence and personhood is, is, is transcended. Uh, and, and as you so absolutely rightly said, these aren't sort of two different things being jammed t t together. Um, but my concern, I think, is especially with the Christology, whether you're being too defensive and, and still looking at it in Losky and personalist terms that actually in the end risk a little bit something like, uh, something a little bit Nestorian. So I, it, this relates, I think, to the critiques of your Christ the Heart of Creation book by Jordan Daniel Wood and also surprisingly by Karen Kilby um, that, that to me seem to have some point to them. And, and this is very, very complicated, but just to try and state this quickly, absolutely you're right to say, obviously, you know, the core of the thing is there's no competition between the divine knowledge, in inverted commas, that's without any limitation, without any containment, and so on. Whereas our finite knowledge is about, you know, containing and circumscribing things. So there is no competition. They're not on the same plane. And in a sense, it's because they're not in competition that they can coincide. But then the question becomes something like this. Okay, for ordinary um, human beings, just for that reason, we're, we're open to the divine. We can, as it were, live in both worlds at once. But, but then what is then the difference between, between us uh, and Christ and the fully Christological consciousness? Don't, don't we at this point have to say, nonetheless, we don't fully coincide as human beings with this divine non-containment? And so if in Christ we're saying there is an absolute coincidence of that with finitude, then even though there is no competition, there is still paradox, it seems to me, because um, it's not normally the case that we're fully both things at once, but in Christ there is. So my, this is, this is uh, you know, I love your book up to the point where you get to Calvin because I, I worry then what's happening to the communication of idioms and Calvin's downplaying of the communication of idioms. We're, and at that point it seems to me that you can't avoid the kind of extreme paradox there's even a, even a coincidence of opposites for Nicholas of Cusa. And I, I, it seems to me that's, that's quite legitimate. And that, that if we're insisting on this extremity of paradox, that somehow this is the point where we, you know, we transcend the creator-created difference. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with all this, as Paul is not. Um, we, we, somehow the aporia is, is resolved at that point, then is it really possible still to talk about personality and person as being different? I mean, if, if the hypostasis is, the divine hypostasis is simply the entire shape of Jesus' life, that, and that goes beyond self-consciousness, isn't that something like we mean by personality, but it can't be separated any longer from our engagement with the world 
and with objectivity. And so just one more point, and then I'll wrap this up. Similarly, I think to talk about filial obedience, well, don't we have to be a bit paradoxical and extreme here and say, yeah, well, Jesus is only, the son is only obedient to the father because he's not obedient at all. He doesn't need to be. But if, if you take substantive relationality really seriously, in, in other words, we can't just think of Christ's um, possession of divine knowledge in this personal way. We also have to think of it in terms of the, the divine essence that he really does coincide with, with, with that incomprehensible, non-circumscribing, non-self-circumscribing knowledge that, that he's got God himself. Thank you. So as usual, we have the tension between this huge uh, discussion that is necessary and the constraints of time. Uh, would you agree that we finish here with a short, uh, thank you so much, you can put yourself next to, the, to, to Rowan uh, in the Mensa. So I get the final word. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, John. Um, as, as always, I feel I need a, another couple of hours on this. Um, I, I, was, I must admit I was a bit surprised that some people thought Christ the heart of creation to be Nestorian for the simple reason that Nestorianism is about a two-subject model. That is, it is explicitly about an incompatibilism between the finite and the infinite. And I, you know, I would very much resist that um, that characterization myself. But am I, is this too personalist in the Losky mode? And does the defense of Bulgakov lead us to a kind of assimilation of the divine presence in us to the divine presence in the incarnate? Well, there are long passages of Agnes Borgi which I think veer in that direction in a way that I'm not entirely happy with. I would like Bulgakov to say more clearly at some points what I think is, is said routinely in uh, Byzantine theology, what is unbrokenly real in the incarnate is the process in which we are involved as finite members of the body of Christ. Whether at the end of the day then there is a total difference of kind between the presence of the word in Jesus and the presence of the word in us. It's a slightly more complicated question than it appears. Evidently, that reality of unbroken, um, as the medievals would say, supposition in the humanity of Christ, that is unique. There is no other case of such such coincidence, to use your, your words. And even the relative coincidence that we grow into if we, if we realize our filial vocation in heaven, even that continues to expand or deepen in a way which is unthinkable in the case of the incarnate. So I need to reflect a bit more on that. I, I don't think that we're committed to just assimilating there if we go down this road. Um, the question of obedience, I actually wouldn't, wouldn't really disagree with. I think there's, yep, that, that's about right. That's why I, I would want to say of the obedience of Christ, what we see in the incarnate Christ is clearly something which is utterly continuous with the eternal relation of the word with the Father, but within the constraints of the contingent, it can only appear as, as costly obedience. Um, so coincidence, there again, is, is a, a complex notion. The personality thing, I'm not, I'm not quite convinced by how you, how you put it there. Um, I, I think I see what you're after, but I would want to say that, yes, of course, the the totality, the unqualified totality of the presence of the active eternal consciousness in the man Jesus of Nazareth includes everything about the man Jesus of Nazareth and also includes the, the effect and impact of Jesus as the, um, the federal head of the church and the new humanity. 
And that goes, I'd say, a long way beyond the personality. The, the, the difficulty people have expressed about assimilating person to personality is, I would say, the difficulty of supposing that there is some psychological quality in the incarnate that qualifies him as God. And that, you know, that, that's nonsense, frankly. So one would need, again, to rethink the whole notion of how personality as a word is being used. But just a few thoughts in response. Thank you. So we see the discussion goes on, but the session finishes uh, now. As the weather is good, I propose that you go out here and you cross the central court in front of the university until the street, then you turn twice to your right and you will see the building of the Mensa. There you have the free choice for your menu. You can even point to elements you want to combine. Uh, don't forget to be back at 1.30 because we are looking forward to listen to Brandon Gallagher and to Cassian Jeftuchov in the afternoon. Quarter past one. Uh, 1.15, I'm sorry, I have to, we have to be precise. Today it is really 1.15, quarter past one.
Welcome back, everybody. First, I have some uh, a practical issue. Uh, Twelve people didn't say uh, yet if they want to come to the Saturday night excursion to Bern, where we are going to eat where Karl Barth and Sergei Bulgakov ate together <laughs> some time ago. So if you did not fill out the form with the meals and this Saturday excursion, please do it now. You find it in your bags. Or if you don't find it, go to Dario above and talk, just talk to him. <laughs> or fill out the form and bring it to him in the next 10 minutes, please, because we need to book the car. <laughs> So now we are going to start the next session with two of our main speakers at the conference. We're starting with Brandon Gallagher, the senior lecturer of systematic and comparative theology at the University of Exeter in the UK. So you may know his major publication, Freedom and Necessity in Modern Trinitarian Theology which is on the triumvirate of modern systematic theology, Karl Barth, Hans Urs von Balthasar, and Sergei Bulgakov. And his recent research focuses on ecclesiology, comparative theology, Sergei Bulgakov, and Eastern Orthodoxy and modernity. So we're very happy to welcome Brandon for his talk. Hello, um, thank you. Um, yes, in this lecture, in a way, um, this lecture could be um, subtitled uh, the, um, How I Changed My Mind. Um, I find, um, as I enter into middle age, that a lot of the positions that I initially took uh, in um, theologically, um, so for example, uh, my critique of Yanaras, uh, I've, I've had to rethink that, and um, my critique of Bogakov and his pantheism, uh, that has changed as well, largely because um, I feel actually Bogakov presents many possibilities for engaging with the world in his doctrine of creation that um, uh, some of the other figures which inspired me, the neopatristic uh, figures, don't. So um, this is the beginning of that fruit. So, yes, so creation out of nothing is creation out of and in God, Bogakov's Chalcedonian ontology. So Bogakov's sophiological account of creation is one of the most obscure, contradictory, and controversial parts of his work, because in it he characteristically weaves together, but simultaneously holds apart, God and creation. This blurring of the uncreated, created distinction forces us to look at the limits of orthodoxy, and I mean that in both senses of small and big O. What constitutes, uh, on a basic level, an orthodox doctrine of creation? Faith in the creation of the world by God out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo. Creation out of nothing is re-envisioned as a distinct form of active and creatively directed emanation out of God, which ultimately can be understood as in or within God if you're going to reify or specialize this, with God self-positing himself as both creator and creation, with all creaturely beings said to mirror Christ in being uncreated created. We shall suggest, therefore, the Bogakov's account of creation and creation out of nothing by blurring the uncreated created distinction, surprisingly, does not necessarily fall into pantheism. But through elaborating it, he puts forth a position that both possibly remains within the ambit of a doctrinally orthodox vision of creation, and states a highly original, radically Christocentric doctrine of the same. Creation embodies a difference in unity of God and the created, the divine and the creaturely being uncreated and, un and created, underwritten by God himself, without mingling, without change, indivisibly and undividedly. I call this uh, Bogakov's Chalcedonian ontology. But what are the basic lines of an orthodox position on creation out of nothing? 
In its most basic form, we affirm in Creatio Ex Nihilo that God is not the world, and the world is not God. The world was created out of nothing into being by a free act of God's will and is very good. It is not eternal, that is, it was not created out of some pre-existent matter, being co-eternal and over against God. Creaturely being is finite and temporal in contradistinction from divine being, which is infinite and eternal. However, this doctrinal minimum does not mean creation out of nothing is wholly explicated. It remains without a theory of or detailed Christian teaching concerning creation that might save the appearances of faith, highly ambiguous. And so there exist multiple orthodox, with a small o, theological accounts of creation out of nothing. Christian orthodoxy generally um, is able to embrace multiple ways of parsing creation out of nothing. As long as one keeps a distinction between the eternal God and his contingent creation he freely wills, the uncreated and the created. However, the predominant strain of modern orthodox theology, neopatristic synthesis, predominant strain in 20th and 21st century, is an exception here. And for almost a century or more, it has maintained, arguably in reaction to Bulgakov and sophiology, that there is only one legitimate way to understand creation out of nothing. And this position is presupposed in orthodox circles as basic. Creation out of nothing, it is alleged, always must mean that creation is something which is over against God, that it is alien to divine being, that there is um, uh, an abyss of being, as it were, between uh, God and creation, that it is uh, an aspect of, of it which is radically contingent and always threatened by an abyss of pre-creation nothingness or non-being seen above all in death. So in this position, God creates the world he, in, in creating an other over against him and outside him. Now, here I'm summarizing, obviously, Florovsky and Losky, but this is followed by other such theological luminaries as John Zazulis and John Meyendorf. Florovsky and Losky developed their doctrines of creation in reaction to Bogakov's sophiology. Bogakov held that there was one Sophia in two forms, related to other, one another in an antinomy, the uncreated and eternal divine Sophia and the created and temporal creaturely Sophia. Sophia is, as I have written elsewhere, a living antinomy. Bogaka blurred the uncreated created distinction by arguing that the uncreated eternal divine Sophia, the Usia of God, and the created temporal creaturely Sophia, creation but sometimes the world's soul, were not ultimately two radically different realities, but one reality in two different modes of being. The creaturely Sophia, or creation, is held to be a special revelatory or theophanic uh, mode of the divine Sophia in becoming and temporality, which had as its uncreated and eternal foundation that of the divine Sophia. Now, let's quickly sketch the main moments of Bogakov's complex theology uh, of creation. Bogakov held that every created being is simultaneously uncreated created. Uncreated in its guiding root or base, he talks about divine seeds or logi, and creaturely in its mode of becoming or existence. Between God and creation, therefore, for Bogakov, there is one, a difference, but also simultaneously continuity and even identity. For one must, he says, simultaneously unite, identify, and distinguish creation and God's life. Two, um, you have the divine and the created Sophias. God as uncreated and creation as created are one Sophia, a united reality. So there is, strictly speaking, no being outside divine being, or there is no extra divine being, if you can even talk about outside. Three, creaturely being or the created Sophia is a divinely posited and divinely mediated form of divine being or the divine Sophia, which is a result of God limiting himself ontologically or by God positing himself as creator, which Bogakov sometimes describes as God positing the world outside God as a creatively, initiatively directed and realized emanation, 
relativity as such. Four, by creating through limiting himself or acting as creator over against himself as a world creation and self-positing, God relates to a part of himself as other than himself ontologically, whereby we can say creation exists and God is the creator towards it. So it's an intra-self relation. Five, in limiting himself, God is said to create out of nothing or create from himself, which for him is the same thing. But this is fundamentally a relatively new self-relation in himself, whereby he both relates to himself as relative being or as self-alienated and self-sacrificed being, and this relative being presupposes nothing as a new divine self-relation. So creation and nothing um, being are different aspects of the divine self-relationship of creator to creation. So creation and nothing are both posited by God. Six, creature, the cre that creaturely modality of the divine being has a self-existence and autonomy apart from God, making God to be bound by creation's distinctness and a potential opposition. And finally, seven, if you're still following me, God is unable to omnipotently swamp the creaturely in its divinely mandated unique ontological self-existence in God. And it's his work in Judas Iscariot where he really develops this um, in some detail. And he um, cannot control it, but he's only able um, uh, to interact with it through persuasion and cooperative synergy. And the ultimate example of that is in Christ. So as we can see, Bulgakov's understanding of creation out of nothing has as its core a divine and eternal self-relationship um, of God as creator to God's self as created and temporal. Though, as Bulgakov talks about it as self-positing, it also appears to be a relatively novel self-relation. Bulgakov simply could not accept that the world could exist in any other sense than in God himself, if God was infinite and eternal being. God is, for Bulgakov, everywhere present and filling all things. Moreover, as Bulgakov says, if God is the creator, he is the creator from all eternity. Or put differently, God is the creator and the creator is God. Ontology for Bulgakov must follow theology, and theology must follow revelation. And we know nothing but God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as creator, always now and ever and unto ages of ages. Bulgakov refused to see creaturely being and the creature as fundamentally other than God's self. If that meant uh, that the creature was ontologically alien to God, or apart from him, or outside him, this is the language which is often used, so I'm using it. The creaturely modality was a divine, eternal, intramodality of temporal otherness. But that temporal creaturely otherness existed not outside the eternal God, but in God's self. Um, this he described as panentheism, and not pantheism, which he attacked. So Florovsky and Lossi, Lossky, it is not surprising, feared that, and we talked about this a little bit already, that Bogakov's doctrine of creation risked pantheism and monism by allowing ontological continuity and identity between the creator and the created. Um, I used to hold that position, but now I disagree with it. I'm trying to rethink it. So creation, they argued, comes from without. And so, quote, as it comes out of nothing, it is utterly unlike the self-existing creator who brings creatures from non-existence into being, unquote. This is Florovsky. In short, there is a, quote, infinite chasm between God and creation. Uh, and the nature of creation is radically different from the nature of its creator. So this is the position which Bulgakov, as it were, is completely different from. So this radical opposition of creation and its creator in neopatristic thought has had, I believe, lamentable effects for contemporary orthodoxy. Both Florovsky and Lossky took little or no interest in secular culture, art, politics, and ethics, unless it touched on the religious realm. It is not an accident, then, that contemporary orthodoxy has not, until the last decade or so, developed much in terms of um, theological ethics, the theology of art, religion, 
culture and work, and indeed the whole vast area of social thought until fairly recently. Creation in itself, for many Orthodox theologians following the neo-patristic writers, is not understood as graced in itself, and um, it is literally unlike God, separated from him by a chasm, threatened by death and annihilation, and is called from without. As it is created and held over nothing, it is called from without to participate in God, either through an ecstasis beyond itself or by being taken up into the energies of God. The only interest in nature and creation for many Orthodox theologians influenced by neopatristic accounts of creation is at the points where creation meets with the divinizing energies of God or the Eucharistic mode of being. Um, let all those who uh, are aware I hear the echo, a being as a proxy for the Trinitarian form of reaching out to the other. So one has much writing on iconography, spirituality, patristic commentary, and liturgy, but until recently, nothing on the secular. Um, but when you turn to the fathers, I'm not going to get into this, but there is a whole portion of my lecture which deals with this, references to the teaching of Creatio Ex Nihilo in many of the fathers in classic texts, from the anaphora of the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom to John of Damascus, they usually use formal and stock phrases, God brings us uh, all, uh, or all things out of nothing into being, and they're generally not elaborated, um, uh, and they're vague. Um, so it's not um, the sort of position you find um, in the neopatristic thinkers who seem to have really based this, I think, on um, maybe the first oration against the Arians of Athanasius and a few passages which they try to make into everything in the patristic tradition. Yet, and one would not get this from the neopatristic account, creating by some fathers is drawing on neoplatonic tropes, often identified with thought, so creation is said to flow as free thoughts from the divine life, understood as eternal contemplation. So exactly the sort of thing that one finds in Bogakov. So Maximus, for, for, for example, he says, it must be accepted that all things have been created from the eternally existing God from nothing. So he, he mixes and matches these things, quite like Bogakov. Now, the claim made by critics is that Bogakov's sophiology leads to a collapse of God in creation. Uh, I indeed have argued this. But what comes up repeatedly in Bogakov's account of creation is that one must avoid the twin dangers of monism and dualism. Um, dualism is not just seen in Gnosticism, but in all forms anti-cosmism, which put an impassable gulf between God and the world. So I would argue this is what you find in much neopatristic synthesis. Bulgakov goes into great critique of monism or Spinozism, pantheism, which he says results in the suicide of the relative. To say all relative being is simply speaking the aggregate of the modes of the absolute, he says, would make creation into an illusion. So he actually argues firmly against monism. So, what Bulgakov wants to assert is that creation is neither radically other than God, nor is it collapsed into him. Creation is, in some sense, distinct, but yet dwelling in God. Bulgakov, in opposing dualism, argues that one must say that there is nothing apart from God, no separate reservoir, divinely willed being apart from God, who is limitless, God, and that only the divinity of the existing God is. And there is nothing apart from or outside of divinity, he argues. Creaturely being, the created Sophia, is a special modality of divine being or the divine Sophia. Yet this does not lead to the equally danger of error of pantheism, for one affirms that God creates out of nothing, which means positively, not as the neopatristic writers affirm, that there is a reality alongside, outside, and apart from God, but that the, quote, whole world of the world's being belongs to divinity, since God created the world out of himself. Absolute nothing, uk on, simply does not exist in itself. So to say something is created out of nothing is simply to say that it is related to God as creator, from which it finds its origin and reality. So he says, the directness of the world toward God for createdness 
is precisely this relationship. So it's an intradivine relationship. So the divine receives in creation extra divine being, otherness of being, which precisely constitutes creation and creatureliness. And when God creates or so relativizes himself in being, and one speaks of relative being, it is at this point that one can speak of relative being, maon. So creation and nothing, which go together, are both posited creations of God uh, in this special modality of divine being. And so he also says, we'll be getting this uh, with Taylor Ross's uh, paper later on, he also talks about creation containing emanation. So he rethinks and brings together uh, the let there be of creation and emanation. So he does this in a variety of ways, which I won't get into, but it includes um, talking about a self-positing of God. He talks about God submerging himself in nothingness, God creating through revealing himself in creation, God as Trinity, he says, also self-emptying himself, self-sacrifices himself, um, God releases or lets be creation. So there are a variety of ways that he uh, avoids uh, or, or articulates this reality. Now, I want to argue that this quite eccentric panentheistic doctrine of creation um, is um, uh, the basis of Bulgakov's account of synergy and human autonomy. Created nature does not remain outside God, Bulgakov argues, because ontologically extra divine being does not exist at all. Creation abides in God, although it is not God, and the relationship of God to his creation is not one of unilateral action of uh, God towards a world lying outside of him and alien to him, but as a cooperation or synergism of creator with his creation. In order to become self-existent, the world, Bogakov says, must be divine in its positive foundations. Thus, it is only because creation is first in some sense uh, um, God's own self-relation in himself or divine in its substratum if you want to use natural language that the world as he says maintains its self-existence in the eyes of God although it is created from nothing so I quote him God is not free in respect of the world but it is bound by its nature its inertness, its opposition. God cannot do everything with the world that he wants, having once already given the world its self-existence. So, um, now that I have explained this, um, to turn to the Chalcedonian aspect of the ontology. Why would Bogakov go to such trouble to elaborate this panentheistic doctrine of creation, besides the fact that clearly he thought it was more plausible? I want to argue that, and Rowan got into this, that he is uh, applying a type of Chalcedonian methodology. He saw Chalcedon um, as a, something which was uh, not, you know, uh, the end, but preliminary, needing a filling out. So um, the whole of Bogakov's Lamb of God, for example, can be viewed as an attempt drawing on the intimations of Apollinarius, but without falling into his errors, to express patristic Christology positively. Yet we, cannot argue, uh, we can also argue the same for all of his theology. Yeah, uh, now, Sophia for Bogakov is the missing piece of the puzzle between God and creation. It is the mediation or third term that exists between that which is created and the divine. Sophia, he says, is the bridge that unites God and man. And it is this unity of Sophia that constitutes the Chalcedonian yes, the foundation of the incarnation. Therefore, ontology for Bogakov was itself Christiform, insofar as it involves a perfect union and difference between God and creation. In Christ, one has the absolute hypostatic and unique pinnacle of a process of personal embodiment or concretion that undergirds all that is, with the uncreated and the created united without mingling, without change, indivisibly and undividedly. Bogakov's panentheistic account of creation simply is one more version of a vision of how in God the created and the creator are simultaneously united and separated, identified and opposed. 
Now, this type of uh, opposition really comes out of the fact that he believes that the Logos is the cosmoergic and incarnate hypostasis. So it couldn't be any other uh, a reality than that creation, as it were, w would have been uh, produced uh, uh, by the word. Because everything, as it were, is geared towards the incarnation quoting him, imprinted in the world is the face of the Logos, who in the fullness of time descends from heaven to earth in order to be inhumanized in it. Now, if one thinks this reminds me uh, one of something, it reminds one of Maximus um, and Maximus and how the Logi are in the Logos, the Logos in the Logi. And Jordan Daniel Wood has argued uh, um, that created being in Maximus is itself fully Christological. So I want to argue that what you see uh, in uh, Bogakov, in his ontology and his doctrine of creation, is a type of creation uh, being incarnation. In conclusion, we can now see, I hope, uh, beginning to see, uh, why Bogakov insists on his panentheistic account of creation. It is a vehicle for a radically Christocentric vision of creation and redemption, where it is absolutely inconceivable that God would not have become one with us in Jesus Christ. For every doctrine in Bogakov speaks the name of Jesus, from the nature of God being God-manhood, to creation reflecting Christ and being uncreated, created reality in God, to the incarnation redemption in the church as an extended incarnation and divinization, whereby not only can we say God becomes all in all in the eschaton, but God in Christ becomes uh, everything for everyone. And for some of you, this may say, well, maybe Losky was right, and perhaps he was, but that might have been a good thing too. Furthermore, Bogakov's panentheistic sophiological account of creation, if it is shorn of its deterministic eschatological excesses, and I've cut out the section which my friend David Bentley Hart would be interested in, it remains, I think, plausible as an orthodox vision of creation. It not only keeps the distinction and unity between God and the world, but it maintains the orthodox affirmation that creation is not created out of eternal matter, but out of nothing, having no foundation in itself, but only being founded on and in God. Where it is unique is in understanding creation as an intra-self-determination of God, as an intra-relationship, a different type of relationship. Here, um, maybe Rowan's lecture points the way. This does not lay lead necessarily to determinism if we hold with Bulgakov that God is not free in relation to creation's opposition to him, but that his omnipotence is freely limited by the self-existence of the world in him. All of creation is held together in Christ for Bogakov, and the world has interest in itself as it is made to be divinized at every point behind every facet and curve and edge of the creaturely. We face Jesus Christ. The world is infinitely precious, infinitely interesting in itself from ethics to science to economics, because that world is the creaturely Sophia, which is itself in a unity and difference with the divine Sophia, without mingling, without change, indivisibly and undividedly. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brandon. I think we have the same regime as we already knew after the conference of Rowan Williams. You will sit here, okay. and people who would like to ask questions would do that okay. there. <laughs> so, please. I think we have time for three people. 25 minutes. Please introduce yourself quickly. And then. Hello, I'm Sarah Leibig Moses from Boston College. Um, I'm certainly glad as a reader of your work to know that you've changed your mind on this. Um, 
I have two questions, so I'll try to be brief. The first is um, with regard to your point about God's sort of self-limiting uh, activity in the, in the desire to create. Um, and of course, Bulgakov also talks about the Christological self-limiting, even in the kenosis of the, the sort of retaining of glory until the ascension. Um, but I think this is a point that's always confused me um, when trying to pair it with his doctrine of kenosis, which he puts in terms of self-excess rather than limiting. Um, so I was wondering if maybe you could speak to that um, and whether the orientation um, towards the other in Bulgakov isn't in itself um, a self-limiting activity, or, and maybe it's both in an antinomic way, um, with regard to Rowan Williams' presentation this morning, is, is, is self-limiting um, the fruit produced somehow by hypostatic activity? The second question that I have is with regard to, you briefly touched on Sophia um, and its relationship in the act of creation as a third. Um, and you also talked about the distinction between mayon as relative nothing and ukon as absolute nothing. Um, there are passages in Unfading Light when he talks about Sophia as mayon or as the reception of mayonal content, um, which I find rather strange. And I just wanted to know sort of what you think about the relationship between Sophia and nothing um, in the way that you're now reading his doctrine of creation. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Um, uh, well, first of all, um, the, this whole distinction between meonic and ukonic, um, you see this in a lot of um, uh, Russia. You find it also in, in Berjaev. Uh, but I'm told by those uh, who uh, are better scholars of this in terms of the fathers that, that it's a false distinction. Um, but um, as I understand uh, this, um, and I'm, uh, this is a synthetic thing, so I, later with Taylor's paper we'll get a much more sort of fine grain thing looking at uh, Sviet, because with Bogakov obviously, um, uh, you know, it depends what period it is, but I'm trying to hold it all together. But um, he um, seems to say that, um, well, first of all, that uk on uh, um, uh, the, this sort of absolute nothingness, at least he says in Nevesta Agnitsa, in, in the, the Bride of the Lamb, that this does um, uh, not exist, that it is an illusion. So my understanding of him is, is that when we can talk about uh, ukonic nothingness, it is only um, insofar as um, it is uh, it, it is the reality of God being related to himself as creator. So it's a self-relation, and it's at that point that we can talk about it as, as a sort of shadow. Um, uh, that's ukon. But mayon, and he seems to say this both in uh, uh, Sviet and also in later accounts, um, uh, he actually will talk about this almost as a type of prime uh, material, um, uh, a sort of, and here again, Taylor's uh, thing will be uh, coming in, which is is that um, you wonder, you know, is there something going on with Plotinus? And and um, in fact, I think he is actively drawing from that. So it is something which um, God creates, and he quotes um, uh, he quotes. Uh, um, uh, Dionysius, uh, um, pseudo Dionysius, in this that God also creates nothing. So in that sense, um, uh, at the same time that God, as it were, posits or uh, creates uh, that which is which is relative being, and he has a variety of ways of talking about this. Uh, uh, out of that also is this. I guess, hule or stuff which is shaped. Uh, um, now, whether this actually all holds together is, is something which needs to be, I think, further queried, but that's how I understand that. In regard to canonicism, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, trying to um, hold it all together is, is difficult. Um, but as I've understand it, uh, understood it, um, and a lot of my thinking about this has been also influenced by my work that I did on Balthazar, um, uh, that you have this uh, transcendent, kind of almost archetypal reality of, of God's um, uh, self-limitation and, and self-giving. And uh, in response to that, in the Trinity, there is uh, also um, uh, a kind of a gratitude, which is uh, a self-giving, 
back. Uh, so there's a, a kind of call and response almost, uh, like some forms of prayer. And this uh, reality cannot, this reality of that which is uh, um, divine self-limitation, and he's very clear, as I think Rowan mentioned, I think it's in a footnote somewhere, where he says that we're just using this. This is, you mustn't understand this in a carnal kind of sense. Uh, and that um, uh, this, as it were, spills out into the wor world. But I think one has to be careful with Bogakov, because uh, if you look at his Bride of the Lamb when he's talking about creation, um, uh, I didn't get into the details, I cut out a lot of my paper, but I think there's about six or seven different uh, uh, types of um, metaphors or images which he uses for talking about the same reality. So. Thank you. Next question. Justin Coyle, uh, Mount Angel Seminary. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gallagher. As a dedicated reader of yours, it's uh, been illuminating to see the dynamism of your thought and the movement of your reading of Bulgakov, so that was instructive, thanks. Uh, I have one question, um, and that is whether you could help me with a potential tension um, I think I've picked up on in Bulgakov's thought um, and showed itself again in your paper. Um, and that's this, just how Chalcedonian is his ontology? Um, that is to say, there's one pattern of thought, it seems to me, in his um, work uh, that one, uh, one word you use was example, right? So that the, the hypostatic union is an example of the of kind of uh, ontological dynamism between divine and human that's always already there, right? So the Adam Kadman business, uh, Sophia as... Um, uh, as al always already there, right, divine humanity and so on, right? And so here we have one reading of Maximus um, teaching on the Logi as really correlated with uh, Plotinus, right? It's the realm of the forms. On the other hand, right, it seems to me that, say, in Judas Iscariot, um, the, the, the essay on Judas Iscariot, um, he says things like that, that the word was always already incarnate, right? That, that, that the incarnation is eternal in some sense. Um, he says in the Sophia, the little Sophia book, right, that Sophia is actually just the two natures of Christ. Um, so that seems to me a second pattern of thought where uh, the incarnation is not an example, but the, the very ground, right? Um, and that kind of business makes Balthazar nervous, right? He accuses uh, Bulgakov of, of, of thinking about creation as proto-Christology, right? So that's another, another set uh, of, of images there. Are these reconcilable? Is it a tension? Should we punt to antinomy, or, or what's going on there? Um, so years ago, um, when I was doing my doctorate, I, I um, spent about a year working on Solovyov, and uh, out of it was produced an essay on um, reading, rereading Solovyov on Christology. And in that essay, I um, uh, um, and perhaps maybe I was reading him through Bulgakovian eyes, but I argued that he does precisely what you're saying, that he has this um, sort of call it proto, uh, you know, kind of Christology, and then he has, uh, as it were, the, the fulfillment of that. So what I think possibly is, is happening in Bulgakov is, is and, and it was actually Aidan Nichols who, who pointed to me to, to, to this, is, is that you have this sense, um, and, and whether this is um, problematic from an Orthodox um, perspective is something that we need to query, this, this sense that in God already, everything is always already accomplished. Um, and that uh, in some sense then you have uh, a sort of falling away. Um, maybe there's a Gnostic thing going on. Uh, it falls into creation and then through history, uh, this would be one reading, gradually uh, the reality which always exists eternally is accomplished. So that's sort of reading one. Um, reading two is, is um, something which I attempted in my uh, sort of book on the Trinity, um, uh, which is, and it's a, sort of a more Panenbergian type of reading, which is, is that um, history matters uh, for Bogakov. Um, and that uh, when um, uh, everything, the whole drama of salvation, this reconfigures everything 
including God himself. And so retroactively, um, we then come to see that who God is in God's self is God manhood. In this sense, um, then, um, Bogakov is radically revelational, um, uh, that he is revelational all the way down. Um, in this sense, he would be similar, um, and uh, I'm reading him in light of a lot of what Bart is doing, um, so he's a kind of a radicalization. He's where Bart feared to go, uh, except in uh, some passages. Um, so there's two possibilities. Uh, um, you can try to resolve it through an antinomy, but I would choose the second, this kind of revelational, uh, retroactive bit. And I um, attempted to develop this a little bit more in a book I wrote with some friends from Oxford on eschatology. Um, anyways, but that's another thing. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we will close this session with Brandon. Thank you very much. But we are proceeding this session with the talk by Catherine Yevtuchov, who wrote the seminal biography of Sergei Bulgakov, so we know a lot about his life thanks to this book, who, uh, which will be translated, that Russian translation will come out this fall, so I think that's a great thing to celebrate too. And also, thanks to her, we have the English translation of Philosophy of Economy, the World as a Household. So we are very happy you are dealing with Bulgakov again and are talking to us about it. <laughs> Thank you. So before I begin, I'd like to take my time at the podium one always thanks the organizers, but on this occasion, the thanks are far deeper and more sincere than ever. Um, and uh, so to everybody, but also especially to Regula, with whom it was a complete joy to correspond in the process. And I think they all have made this look easy, which it clearly is not, so uh, thank you. Now, um, I knew that this conference would be largely theologically oriented, so I thought it might be my role to inject a little bit of um, a different period of Bulgakov's life and, and a different aspect of his, uh, of his um, activities. So my talk will be called uh, Religion and Politics, which I stole from Bulgakov himself. Um, he wrote an essay with this title in 1906. So what does it mean for a religious worldview to lie at the foundation of politics? Bulgakov's 1906 essay with this title explores the deep structures of political parties, whether it is possible for individuals of profoundly different moral convictions to unite around a single political platform and the crucial place of the church in proposals for reform. I'd like to tell you a bit now about how I came to this particular question as the subject for today's conversation. My book on Bulgakov, as Regula just told you, has just been, uh, in the context of the Russian Silver Age, has just been translated a full quarter century later into Russian. And as many people in this room know, the thorniest aspect of this generally good news is that the translation requires restoring all the original quotations and hence a sort of journey through one's personal archives. When so much time has elapsed, it can be a fascinating process. Also, of course, I conducted the research when the Soviet Union still existed, which made the gathering of materials a starkly different process from what we experience today. Uh, the point of this little personal excursion is that while my interest is still in Bulgakov as a philosopher, I found myself, in the course of reviewing old materials, particularly drawn to the political materials, wanting to read the whole articles around the excerpts I was carefully extracting. From the vantage point of the 1980s, Bulgakov's engagement with politics seemed a dead end, a false start, 
whose residence had been extinguished by the triumph of a regime in which there was no room for anything like Christian politics. So I was surprised that, revisiting them now, the materials leap off the page and provide a window into a vibrant and com complex political process. I decided to take advantage of this talk to revisit some of these essays a little more carefully. Bulgakov's politics were as intense, thorough, and passionate as everything else he did. The period of his real political engagement coincides with the revolution of 1904 to 7. As we know, he was a founding member of the Union of Liberation, which held its first meeting at Schaffhausen in 1903. He worked together, sometimes in harmony and sometimes in discord, with key figures in the Cadet Constitutional Democratic Party, then more usually referred to as the Party of Popular Freedom. He was a delegate to the short-lived but important Second Duma before Prime Minister Stolypin shut it down on the 3rd of June, 1907, and altered its mandate and composition. In all of these roles, Bulgakov had some very highly developed and clearly defined positions on the burning issues of the day, and to be sure, there were many of those. So what I'd like to do today is take a look at some of these issues and let Bulgakov speak about them. What was his stance on particular political problems? And what was the deeper ethical worldview that underlay these positions? I have four such issues I've chosen to focus on just to give you a sense of how I'll proceed. So the first question is the agrarian question. One has to start with that. There can be no doubt that the single most burning question of the revolution was what was known as the agrarian question. It was the land and its uses that triggered the bloody agrarian uprisings of the summers of 1905 and 1906, polarized the intelligentsia, and ultimately proved the point of conflict between the Duma and the government that simply could not be resolved. One of the most dramatic spectacles of the revolution is of soldiers wending their way home from defeat in Manchuria, igniting rural revolts all along the tracks of the Trans-Siberian Railway. It is not surprising that as a political economist, Bulgakov had a considered and detailed position on this key issue, so much so that his program was adopted as the official line of the Union of Liberation and subsequently of the Constitutional Democratic Party. From the perspective of the liberal intelligentsia, the great reform of the peasant emancipation, which changed the status of 20 million private and 30 million more state peasants, remained incomplete a half century later. Society, they believed, remained fundamentally unequal, and the peasantry inhabited a world apart, with insufficient means to provide for themselves subject to the constraints of the rural commune and hampered by the government's insistence on maintaining gentry privilege. Bulgakov's position on the agrarian question underwent some evolution during the revolutionary period, but the fundamentals remain the same. Let's look at two moments. The first is the major prog programmatic article in Aswabajdenya from October 1903. I won't rehearse the full argument, which has been well discussed by Galai and others, and I've spoken about it as well. It's clear, though, that with respect to the land itself, Bulgakov and the Union of Liberation recommended some degree of expropriation of the landholders and transfer to those who actually worked the land, with a concomitant abrogation of gentry privilege, such as special banks and greater representation in organs of local government. Democratic reform in the countryside could only be accomplished through political liberation. Hence, the solution of the agrarian problem first required the overthrow of the autocratic regime. Finally, the potential of the peasant proprietors should be enhanced by several also political measures. The commune should be converted into a voluntary association and a legal entity, which peasants would be free to leave at any time. Some of Bulgakov's formulations of these basic proposals are striking in the article. On his faith in the potential of the peasant economy, I quote, we are convinced that in a free Russia, the peasant household, supplemented by the widespread development of various cooperatives and in general the principle of mutual aid among producers, will prove to be a fully viable and even more that it will precisely it will play the primary role in Russian agriculture. 
And another passage that seems to foreshadow the not yet conceived philosophy of economy, quote again, from political economy, we know that no progress, no perfection of the peasant economy can be imposed from outside, but can only be the conscious and free doing of the peasant himself. The spiritual personality of the peasant. Here is the workshop, the laboratory in which agrarian progress is born. Therefore, the statement constantly repeated by the Zemstva in the press, the agricultural committees, and by scholars of the crucial significance of the cultural and juridical elevation of the peasant's personality is not a mere frond-like phrase, but contains an elementary truth of political economy. There is nothing religious, overtly or otherwise, in the agrarian program of 1903. Certainly a strong sense of social justice prevails, a clear emphasis on individual freedom, that's a quotation, as the foundation of both economic democracy and political liberalism, and a still untarnished insistence that the autocracy is the intract intractable obstacle on the path to a democratic solution. In terms of worldview, Bulgakov's position reflects an amalgam of his academic conclusions concerning capitalism and agriculture, that it does not follow the same rules as in industry, the intellectual shift from Marxism to idealism, and a continued expression of the traditional identification with the narod or people of classic Russian populism. What's curious is that the practical program did not change as Bulgakov brought religion more and more to his political activities. In the well-known manifesto of Christian socialism, Nyat Lozhne Zadacha, The Urgent Task, uh, written in 1905, September 1905, Bulgakov's social program focused on the issues of labor reform, equitable taxation policies, and of course, the agrarian question. This is what he says about this last, um, on the e this is therefore on the eve of the October Manifesto because it's September of 1905. And here a fairly long quotation from Bulgakov. How can we realize the, pa how can we realize the passage of land from the landowners of various categories into the hands of the peasants? Should we transfer the lands into the hands of individuals or entire communes and if the latter, which ones and how? Different economists and different parties provide various answers to this question. I personally, bearing in mind scientific carefulness and greatest practicability, consider the agrarian demands adopted by the cadet party and now also the Zemstvo organizations to occupy first place. The increase in the peasant domains by carving off land from private possessions with a redemption payment, as well as from state, crown, and monastery lands. Of course, this is only a first step, which must be followed by others, but one can't take the second step before the first. I promote this program in my capacity as a real politician and political economist as the most immediate and minimum wish, but also remain true to the general ideal demand in accordance with which only agrarian socialism is a normal form of agrarian organization. If anything then, an already radical program which considered gentry expropriation a sine qua non became further radicalized in Bulgakov's Christian socialist vision. He does not provide any further details, leaving specifics for future discussion and carefully dodging the issue of the commune even though he poses it himself. It is interesting that, apart from this apparent utopian proposal of an ultimately communal and socialist form of agriculture, Bulgakov takes care to distinguish between ultimate ends and the tasks of practical politics. In other words, he took very seriously this role of practical politician, of party representative, and responsible actor on the national scene. Point two is called, or issue two, is called freedom of conscience. When Bulgakov wrote the agrarian program in 1903, he spoke not only for himself, but for the Union of Liberation and ultimately the Cadet Party. This is confirmed by a meaningful footnote by, uh, by the editor as it, as it signed, which is in fact Pyotr Struve, fully endorsing the quote, practical demands of the agrarian program in his own name and that of the quote, friends of Aswabajdenia, or liberation. 
To return now to the essay on religion and politics, by 1906, this harmonious unity no longer held, though with respect to a different political issue that I'll refer to here as freedom of conscience. While accepting to publish Bulgakov's article in what turned out to be the penultimate issue of his journal, The North Star, it was closed down because of a different piece in the same issue, Struve felt the need to distance himself from the author strongly enough that he followed it with a short response, pointing out where Bulgakov had strayed. What was the disagreement among them, between them? It can help to remember that the spring of 1906 was the moment when the umbrella political organizations, no longer illegal, transformed themselves into actual parties capable of canvassing and collecting votes. Thus the matter of practical organization was far from trivial. Here is Bulgakov speaking. Um, I'm not quoting, but summarizing. Political parties, he proposes, can be of two types. They can unite a common worldview that is ideological around a common worldview that is ideological and even religious, or they can be a practically expedient, loose gathering of individuals with differing views, but joining forces to support a concrete program. He counts the socialist revolutionaries, social democrats, the German Catholic Center Party among the first, the cadets in the second. The second clearly makes him unhappy. Once one leaves the living room and goes, quote, to the people, and now I quote, atomistic aggregation must be transformed into a more complete, true subornist with one soul and one sermon. Another quotation, such a party must comprise a single spiritual organism, must have a common soul, a common idea, a common will, must present a supra-individual collective organism. So given the mission to the people, Bulgakov argues that the message of Christian socialism will have great success, a restatement of Mazzini's formula with which he concluded uh, the urgent task, God and people, Bog in Arod. Paradoxically, Bulgakov continues to endorse the cadets' program whose overall orientation still appealed to him the most, but is disparaging of their weak stand on religious and ecclesiastical questions. Quote, what then do the members of the KD party find in spe in its program on the church question, an indifferent, casually tossed together clause reflecting a, quote, Roman toleration to all faiths and all delusions, stated thus, the Orthodox Church and other faiths must be free of state control. And here is Struve's response. One and the same political God's truth can be preached in a genuinely religious spirit and with genuinely religious fervor by an Orthodox priest, a Muslim mullah, a Jewish rabbi, or a minister of any other religious community. What the idealist churchman, that's of course Bulgakov, sees as lack of religious principles can and often does represent a religiosity of a higher order than any kind of churchliness, tzirkovness. Bulgakov's position is flawed, according, according to Struve, because connecting politics with specifically churchly religion results in an abuse of both politics by religion and religion by politics, and because he misses the point that all all politics is in fact deeply religious, if it is sincere. In, his, in Struve's words, is in its essence close to the deepest internal subjective re religiosity. Bulgakov's problem is that his politics is tied to the church and therefore creates a false dichotomy between Christian and atheistic socialism. There is manifestly more to this disagreement than party organization, important as that may be. One of the most complicated points of the October Manifesto, along with inviolability of the person, freedom of speech, association, and assembly, was the provision for freedom of conscience. A special commission, the Ignatiev Commission, was created to work out the practical application. My suggestion is that the exchange between Bulgakov and Struve reflects two different readings of this key point. Struve chose to confront head-on the issue of cultural and religious difference or multi-confessionality, a question that stood front and center in an empire that counted Muslims, Catholics, Lutherans, Jews, Buddhists, not to mention old believers and uniates among its citizens. As historians have recently emphasized, more Muslims inhabited the Russian Empire than the Ottoman, 11% of the whole, and even this impressive number means little until broken down by locality. 
The Muslim and Old Believer Congresses were spectacular events in the wake of the manifesto. Bulgakov, in contrast, focused on orthodoxy itself and saw in church reform the convocation of a church council, which as we know almost happened, and appeal to a narod, presumed orthodox, the faith of the future. Though the movement to convene a church council shattered, it is also true that the revolution succeeded in removing Konstantin Pobedanosov as over-procurator, thereby ending his 25-year oversight over Russian religious life. Who is right then, Bulgakov or Struve? Uh, both and neither. Struve is right in the sense that a specifically orthodox interpretation of religi religious freedom begs the question of, is it toleration, coexistence? It is an issue that the church council, when it did convene in 1917-18, faced but did not successfully resolve. Who was this orthodox narod, given the significant representation of the czar's other faiths? And yet Bulgakov is also right, because without reform in the structures of the Orthodox Church and the involvement and representation of the laity, there could be no way forward. Paradoxically, representatives of the state religion felt maligned and impinged upon. In the documents of the era, clerics and lay people alike complained that they alone were disdained and discriminated against, for they were not granted the institutions and freedoms that had just been given to religious minorities. And of course, the church itself is a locus of politics, as became even more evident in the diocesan congresses that convened across the land in the spring of 1917. All right, my third point is, um, this is where uh, I'm actually going to put a, uh, uh, an image up. Thank you so much. I only have one image. And um, the, the third point is a bit of a di digression, but it's also, in a way, the, the center of, uh, of these thoughts. Um, a third point is called Seven Days of Narod. And actually, maybe you can lower it a little bit so we see the banner at the top. Yeah, that, yes, that's, to make it, yeah, it looks, looks impressive this way. <laughs> yes, and for this in particular, I have to thank um, Regula, I'll explain that in a moment. So um, this is a slightly, slightly different sort of point. It's not an issue like um, the previous two. Um, but this is, this is uh, uh, the manifestation of uh, genuine political activism by Bulgakov in the course of the revo revolution. Um, in the programmatic article, which I've already mentioned, Yet Lozhne Zadacha, The Urgent Task, Bulgakov proposed as part of the union of Christian politics the creation of a special organ of the press. And in his words, uh, we should strive to create a daily Christian press in which life in society would be presented from a strictly Christian perspective. In 1906, he became a main editor of the Kiev newspaper, uh, published by uh, a, a certain Lashnikov with the title Narod. The paper lasted only seven days, Easter week of 1906, with the first issue appearing on Easter Sunday. This is number four. But it was so ambitious and rich that it provides a brilliant peephole through which to catch a glimpse not only of the Christian socialist program, but of Russian society both locally in the Kiev region and throughout the empire. It is extremely rare and hard to find, uh, but Regula has managed to post it so that I was able to, to look at it in contrast to um, looking all over uh, the Soviet Union many years ago, read it in, on my iPad in the comfort of my living room, which was quite an extraordinary experience because I really got a good feel for it this way. Um, uh, anyway, unfortunately, I cannot do a full analysis of the content here. I th am feeling inspired to do that in some other place. Um, but let me just make a few remarks about, about why I think we should pay attention to this, uh, to this little paper that only came out for a few days. Um, I think the point that it's a daily paper is interesting. Uh, the main overall, it has an overall idea, which is Christianska Abshestinist, Christian society, but in a more dynamic sense than the word society can convey. Um, 
And I did, uh, it, it, the title Narod, of course, um, refers back to the God and People slogan um, from Mazzini. The paper itself, and this is why I wanted you to look at it, it, it is the product of many years of an active press. It looks like the mainstream, mainstream journals in the ca uh, newspapers of the capital, something like Rich or Novo Evrema. It also has a piece of the uh, you, uh, the local newspaper, provincial newspapers, the Gubernskie Vedomosti, that had been coming out now for uh, 70 years or so. They were first established in 1838. And a little bit echo of the Parchialne Vedomosti when they became radicalized around the 1917 revolution. So it synthesizes all these elements. Uh, I did a quick survey of, of what's actually um, in there. Uh, first of all, there's, uh, there's the, po the political, there's a sense of the approaching Duma elections and how we're going to go about participating in them. They're co connected to a national revival. There's a, a sense of sort of um, frightened optimism, I would say, um, optimism in a, in a uh, very um, acute context, a sense of the tasks that lie ahead. So the Duma elections... Being in Kiev, there is some attention to the Jewish question, especially extreme reg regret for the uh, pogrom, Kishinev pogroms of 1903, although with some interesting twists to several of the articles that write about this, they tell us how, what a terrible, terrible event it was. Nonetheless, it would be a good idea if the Jews all converted to Christianity. So it's complicated. Um, a summary of the press and telegrams. It's very much positioned in the world as a whole. We see the Algeciras conference where the Moroccan question is being resolved. Uh, I couldn't resist copying out um, the commentary on the San Francisco earthquake, which uh, was raging through. They were very, very fascinated by this. Uh, fires were raging through the city. People were throwing themselves from windows. It's really a very apocalyptic sense. And the quotation that I liked best, um, I'll read it for you. Um, According to refugees from San Francisco, torn and ragged electric wires threaten the lives of passers-by. The power of the earthquake caused fish to be thrown from the bay onto the streets of the city. The need for water is acute. People have to drink from muddy puddles. The extraordinary heat contributes to the suffering. Yesterday, a slaughterhouse caught fire. 300 head of cattle escaped and ran through the streets of the city, trampling everyone in their path. It's estimated that the cattle killed no fewer than 12 people. Okay, I'm sorry, that's irrelevant, but um, it, it's such an apocalyptic vision that it gives a bit of a flavor for the, the tone of the, of the um, newspaper as a whole. Um, and just to complete a few of the topics, church reform, Christianity for modern times, strong social consciousness, aid to famine victims, and the release of political prisoners, of whom there are many across the countryside, and long sections about workers' unions, very specific, different uh, printers' organizations, woodworkers' organizations, um, letters from below, provincial clergy. Uh, all of this is fit into, each issue is four pages except the first. Um, so it's a lot of material over the course of a week. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of that. There's a tiny clue as to why it closed in the final issue. Uh, there's a little remark that other local papers say that Leshnikov, the editor, is accused of crime for issue number five, uh, which the editors deny. So continuing to my next issue, um, so uh, you can all find this very easily and read in it. Um, it's great fun. Um, issue number four, capital punishment. Possibly the most interesting issue of Narod is number four, which is the one I had up on the screen, Friday the 7th or 20th of April. Because here the editors published for the first time a transcript of Vladimir Solovyov's speech from the 13th of March, 1881. It circulated in manuscript before. 
uh, in which, while acknowledging the obvious guilt of the assassins of Alexander II, he urged the new Tsar to pardon them and spare them the death penalty. It was a position that cost him his job at the university. The Narod, says Solovyov, can know only one truth, gods or the czars, and gods is thou shalt not kill. Capital punishment has a rich history in Russia. Let me mention Yelena Marasinova's recent work on the de facto abolition of the death penalty under Empress Elizabeth in the 18th century. Marasinova argues that it was a reflection not of the Enlightenment and hence progress, but of Elizabeth's profound religiosity. Orthodox principles made capital punishment untenable. As we know, it came back with a vengeance, most famously with the botched hanging of the Decemberist conspirators. Capital punishment was one of Bulgakov's main issues during the years of revolution, one on which he had a very specific practical position and a considered moral argument to back it up. The practical cases are the following. On the 19th of March, 1906, Lieutenant Pyotr Schmidt, who many know only as the name of a Neva bridge, now Blagoveshinsky, and three sailors were executed by firing squad for their leadership of the real Black Sea Mutiny of 1905. The revolt on the cruiser Achakov, not Potemkin, joined by a significant part of the Black Sea fleet. The execution was greeted by demonstrations and expressions of, I quote Narod, religious horror before the sea of blood in which our poor homeland is drowning and a controversial memorial service for Schmidt at the St. Petersburg Theological Academy. It's in this number of, um, of Narod controversial for clear reasons. Uh, the second was the case of the socialist revolutionary terrorist Maria Spiridonova, whose dates are 1884 to 1941, who carried out her mission to kill Tambov provincial official and leader of the local union of the Russian people, Gavril Luzhenovsky, in January 1906. In an echo of the acquittal of Vera Zasulich three decades earlier, Bulgakov came to the impassioned defense of this sweet Russian girl who had killed out of love and spiritual suffering, I'm quoting him, and suffered horrendous beatings, if not rape, this was discussed at length, at the hands of her captors. The article placed prominently on page one of the last issue of Narod. It's right, the next to last column. Um, exhorted readers not to pass judgment for, quote, our torpor, our indifference provoked this young girl to commit murder. Spiridonova's death sentence was commuted to exile to a Siberian penal colony. The theoretical mindset behind these very concrete and to many shocking views was outlined in an essay for a collection called Against Capital Punishment, published in 1906. Bulgakov's essay posits capital punishment as partaking of that evil which is inevitably embodied in an ill-conceived, godless law that forces individuals to participate in a cold and different execution. In an ironic commentary on the collection itself, Bulgakov noted that any number of pamphlets or edited volumes could be published. This was not important. What was important was the moral position, not because it is bad to take another life, but because the actual responsibility for any given execution rests with the public or narod as a whole. In other words, it is you and I who are killing this person, not the state. By his own criterion, society as a whole is complicit in the fate of the executed and also in that of the hordes of political prisoners that were thronging Russian jails. But he goes still further than this. It is not just a matter of collective responsibility, but of passionately and totally putting oneself on the line. I quote, the, the falsity of publishing volumes against capital punishment is in that only he can speak with a strong and powerful voice who himself is prepared to be executed. And only when he has internally performed this execution upon himself has denied his own being. 
Bulgakov's clear position found further expression in his practical activity as a delegate to the Second Duma. He extended his argument to the matter of Stolypin's courts martial, in which frequently innocent peasants or workers were arbitrarily hanged as a radical means of stopping the revolution. This to Bulgakov was a case of multiple capital punishments or the application of the death penalty to hundreds of individuals. Here I'm citing his speech to the 12 March 1907 session in which he once again brought a moral position, seeing the court martials as symptomatic of Russia as an agitated sea, torn by civil war, quote, in no condition to tell the difference between good and evil, inured to the value of human life. This little exploration leads me not so much to any grand conclusions, but to a couple of observations. As a hypothesis for our further consideration, I can suggest that while Bulgakov's spiritual development with its multiple sharp shifts in conviction and worldview is the result of events internal to his conscience, consciousness and cannot necessarily be, be related to events in the material world, Nonetheless, his extended return over two decades to the church as an organization and his willingness or need to work inside the church do appear connected to politics. The shift to Orthodox Christianity fully realized when he launched his new truly theological enterprise in the 1920s in Paris was completed through politics. The decision to devote his energies to concrete reforms in the church and its place in the world over the course of 1904 to seven, and the eventual ordination that followed his work in the church council and the Bolshevik victory in 1918. Who was Bulgakov as a politician? In his once universally read essay, Max Weber outlined an inspiring and demanding agenda for a vocation in politics. The essay was written in 1919 and became ubiquitous in the post-World War II period. One can say, Weber proposes, that three preeminent qualities are decisive for the politician. Passion, a feeling of responsibility, and a sense of proportion. In the political projects we've just been examining, Bulgakov starts to look like Weber's ideal politician. The passion and sense of responsibility with which he approached land politics, the question of church reform, a Christian press, and the in indiscriminate application of the death penalty are evident. Sense of proportion is a more difficult criterion. No matter how many times I read Bulgakov's agrarian program, I'm shocked every time by the almost casual ease with which he affirms the necessity of land redistribution. But by proportion, Weber means not so much the content of a program as the ability to convert abstract ideals into practical measures. So it applies as well in the sense that he was able to reconcile his goals with those of the cadets, get elected to the Duma and later church council, and implement a series of concrete proposals, some of them very significant. In each situation, Bulgakov's position was never instrumental or expedient, but always reflected a deeply considered moral stance, which does not mean that he didn't make mistakes. Weber's famous formulation in which a mature man feels full responsibility for his conduct and reaches the point where he says, here I stand, I can do no other, seems to fit Bulgakov very well and is characteristic of each phase of his life, no matter how distinct the specific circumstances and projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. So, we have time for questions. Yes, please come to the pulpit. Hello, uh, Joshua Heath, at Cambridge University. Um, thank you, Catherine. I was just sort of amazed by I was sort of just amazed by it as somebody who spends all my time reading the later Bulgakov of the 30s and 40s and just doesn't think about the fact that he also had such detailed opinions about the agrarian question. We've heard from Brandon and Rowan about how thickety his knowledge and opinions were. And I'm just amazed at the immensity that his life managed to span. And my question is, you sort of suggested it at the end about 
how somebody who spends a lot of time in the early Bulgakov then looks at the later Bulgakov and, and where you see the continuities. But I, I'd just like maybe for you to say a bit more on that. As somebody who spends this much time in the early Bulgakov, what, what should somebody who spends their time in the big trilogy be aware of? Or how should, it, how should that early activity shape the reading? Thank you. Yes, that's a clear, good question. Um, I was hoping that the discussion would revolve precisely around that because my, my, my own question is, you know, how, how do these considered positions for me, almost the most interesting one, because I didn't know it in advance, is the one about the death penalty. I mean, that clearly death in different dimensions is something he consistently thought about. And of course, this precedes his terrible experience with the death of his son uh, three years later. Uh, but yes, this is something I'm fascinated by. I mean, as I've said elsewhere, I, my feeling, and I would very much like to hear who agrees or does not agree, uh, Bulgakov, one of the main characteristics of his personality is he, uh, like Brandon, who's willing to change his views, he, 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 shifted, he shifted his positions uh, very radically, and often it's connected with some kind of very deep emotional experience. And so to me, the crucial moment is his illness in 1926, uh, when he tells us in, in the autobiographical notes, he, he tells us in very great detail that he burned up in a furnace of fire. Um, he basically died, uh, and this was the end. To me, I see the, his life as a theologian as another life. Um, yet he is the same person, because this absolute depth with, with which he approaches every question, that intensity, um, working out the questions of, um, you know, the, the second hypostasis he does with the same intensity as he works out um, land redistribution. Uh, so to me, he is the same person, but capable of completely uh, shifting and beginning anew. I mean, this is his, I, I find his uh, theological edifice to be extraordinary. I mean, it's almost as if he really did die. He's the voice from another world, or as, as um, um, uh, Antoine put, he calls him a saint of the universal church. This is another way of putting it to me. I mean, he's, he's somebody who is writing from the beyond, so to speak. And the elegance of that edifice with the minor trilogy and the major trilogy and the apocalypse at the end um, shows uh, something about his, his personality. Um, so to me, I guess still Bulgakov is always a very, I don't know, I'm, I, get, I just realized I also changed my views because I think I considered him not to be particularly political and I'm becoming, begin, becoming convinced this is simply the wrong tack to take. He's extremely political in the same sense that he's very uh, extremely engaged with these issues and he's still engaged with him in his theology but in a very, very, very different way. So that's a short, I think there could be much more discussion of that, but I hope that's a little bit helpful. Catherine, thank you so much for this incredible paper and especially helping all of us to connect various Bulgakovs, the Bulgakov of, uh, as the political economist, Bulgakov the idealist philosopher and then eventually Bulgakov the theologian. My question has to do with the following and that is Bulgakov of these articles that you brought to our attention and that we, let's admit it, we by, by, by this I mean theologians, rarely study. Uh, help us connect, help us connect what he has to say was the proposal of Christian uh, socialism uh, with Bulgakov of 1909 and specifically Bulgakov of the landmarks and, 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 and most especially Bulgakov in which you have a profound critique and prophecy in a kind of a Dostoevsky and vein of what is coming in the form of atheist or revolutionary socialism. And in that regard also I'm thinking of Marx as a religious type, you know, the article for which he was banished, at least according to his own admission, from uh, which that was at that point the Bolshevik, the Bolshevik Russia. So I'm wondering, you, you mentioned specifically 1920, 
26, and I couldn't agree more that there is something very important happening in the furnace of that suffering. But I wonder also, during revolutionary period, during revolutionary time, and I'm talking about, of course, the uh, um, uh, October Revolution, not the February, not the February Revolution, uh, but the October Revolution, 1917. He almost has this mystical engagement with monarchy. I mean, he, he sort of reawakens a mon as a monarchist, and then he also, uh, in, in the Crimean period, uh, he has this remarkable papal uh, sort of period, uh, et cetera. So what I'm interested in, specifically, is help us connect Bulgakov of these articles uh, to the Bulgakov, the profound critic of what's coming, not just in the form of a few executions, mm -hmm. but the slaughter of millions. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, I'm very happy you asked that in those terms because something I didn't really get a chance to articulate it while I was um, up there is uh, this year, 1906, there's a reason why a lot of this is written in 1906. It's a very, very crucial year for the intelligentsia. Uh, it's the same for Struve, although as we've seen they had different, they occupied different positions. But you can see in Narod, even though it's still called Narod, and in Palyarna Zvizda, which is the, the, where he wrote religion and politics, and Struve disagreed, uh, there was, they were both shut down. Um, but if you just read through them, you sense very real fear. And I have this quotation, which I didn't um, read. If you permit, permit me, I will, from... Bulgakov again on Narod. In the very first issue, it's this Easter issue, and um, it's, you know, the article is called Christ is Risen. Um, but there's a, a, a very telling sentence. We still share Dostoevsky's and Solovyov's faith that our Narod, that beast-like pogrom hooligan, pogrom ne hooligan Zverinova obraza, Drowning in stinking smradni sin is nonetheless a narod god bearer, narod baganosits, and has its own important and well defined task in world history with respect to the salvation of the world. So I think there's a political break in 1906. Uh, these, if you read into the 1905 revolution, the strikes and the agrarian uprisings, it feels uh, like the Civil War. It was terrifying. And um, this, in, these, this intelligentsia that had started out so enthusiastic and for decades they had been preaching the virtues of the people. Uh, they saw them in action and they simply were terrified out of their minds. And so you can see this tension here. And I think that's what then starts to get worked out after the revolution is shut down. You know, all these courts martial people, hundreds of people literally executed. Um, it was so serious and so scary that people, all, all of them started to find new political positions. And I think that's what Filosofia Hazaistva grew out of as well, and as well as his other later position, and then multiplied n times by the repeat scenario. Thank you for a, a really wonderful overview. Um, just a couple of observations and questions for more reflection. One is just to note in passing that, of course, the, the death penalty question is touched on, if I remember rightly, very briefly in the Viechi oh. essay, where Bulgakov mentions as one of the problems of the day the um, increasing use of the death penalty and how that is, as it were, politically corrupting in Russian society. But that, that's rather by the way. I thought Paul was going to ask a question I wanted to ask about monarchy, because, of course, that's one of the, the real shifts that takes place in the second decade of the 20th century. And you mentioned just then Bulgakov's appeal to the, the God-bearing Narod, but then there's the vision of the God-bearing Tsar, which I won't say takes over from that, but for a, at least a brief period, mm -hmm. comes into focus very sharply for him. And I wonder if you've got any reflections on what was going on behind that particular shift 
it doesn't last very long. I mean, Bulgakov doesn't end up as a kind of Tsarist in his um, emigre period at all. But it's there powerfully, as of course, in the autobiographical reflection. So just inviting you to Thank think you. out loud that about echoes, that. echoes Paul's question also. Um, I've never entirely understood that, to be honest. He has this Bailey Tsar thing that um, comes up uh, then. Uh, but, you know, in, um, in this period, that's absolutely correct. I mean, it, I don't know if I was able to convey, but Regula was also looking at some articles in Naroda, and we both had a very similar impression in the sense that it's extremely radical. I mean, it really, he has no doubts whatever he, the, uh, about the autocracy or, or what should happen. So I, you're absolutely right, it's a complete, complete shift. Um, I, I, I can't say I know about this, this thing with the, the shift to the, 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 the God-bearing czar. Um, I don't think I've ever, I, to be honest, I don't really know how to answer that. I just don't because um, it's, it's something that's a shifting phase. And then he goes and to Hagia Sophia and he's, he's wandering around there and having already very different thoughts and then it just seems to go away by itself. Um, yeah, so I will think about it some more. Do you have a suggestion yourself, maybe? <laughs> I don't have an answer, but the, the key perhaps is in the God-bearing thing, because in his autobiographical remark, he says it's, it's the image of the humiliated Tsar, which captures his imagination somehow. It's as if the, the suffering people is represented now by the suffering monarch. Mm -hmm. So it's anything but. Um, a political program mm -hmm. or a kind of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. monarchist view in, in the more general sense. It's not a, a kind of reworking of um, orthodoxy, autocracy, and nation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very hard to locate on any real political map, I think. And I, I'm mm -hmm. also puzzled by it. Yeah, but I yeah, think if there is a clue, perhaps it's in that, that sense when he sees the Tsar at Yalta, he sees this mm -hmm. figure who is carrying the burden of the people on their behalf who is doing the, well, all the sort of things he was writing about in the Vieki essay, mm -hmm. of just doing the duty, whatever mm -hmm. the cost, and there's a kind of Christ-like humiliation in the vision of the monarch mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. vein. As I say, it's not a political, but a kind of mm -hmm. aesthetic mm -hmm. perception that's going on, I think. Do you, do you remember what the date would be? That would probably be important oh. to I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't yeah, either, okay, I don't so. either. Easily found out. Can I one small question? You, you had mentioned death, and I think Paul uh, uh, Gabriel Duc is going to mention this at the end, as, as in a way, multiple lives dying and re being born with, with new ideas. But I was wondering um, one of the things that you mentioned in the San Francisco thing, really brought this through, is, is how strongly this apocalyptic sense. Is and um, I've been uh, working. I'm returning to material which I did when I was a seminarian on his uh, proposals for um, communion with intercommunion with the Anglicans. And one of the things that I think that's uh, driving that is is a sense that it's the end of the world. So I'm wondering, you know, was this uh, something that you saw that was driving some things? This sense of urgency that uh, you know that uh, everything is falling apart. I mean, now, he wasn't the only one. You look at um, multiple different figures. I mean, Balthazar with, with his apocalypse of the, the German soul. There are many, many people who, who think everything is just going to, to bits. I mean, sometimes I've thought of that during the pandemic. So maybe is that a driving factor? So you almost need uh, him psychoanalyzed to understand how, what was giving him this energy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Well, there's a very large emotional component to much of this, I think. So it helps to, I think you always have to be aware of his state of being emotionally. Um, and that helps as a prism to understand what he's saying. But anyway, yeah, thank you. That's a really good, good comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and Vasily from St. Petersburg, <coughs> for those who don't know me. My, um, 
being a politician means um, well some sort of relations, uh, relationships with uh, political opponents or even enemies. Um, apparently being a Marxist means rather a harsh attitude towards uh, enemies or political opponents, as we all know from history. And my question is about Bugakov, um, whether there was any shift in his attitude towards um, uh, his political opponents or enemies, because apparently there was always being uh, involved, engaged in politics means you are um, some sort of competing or even fighting. Um, so what sort of Mm. You mean during the, revolu during the 1904 well, revolution or in general? In general, in here, what, what, no. do you have any observations yeah, in this respect? Because he was what, sorry? Well, well, he was attacked as well, a um, mm -hmm. Well, I have oh. in mind also, you know, these, uh, of course, uh, famous um, criterion of uh, Saint Siloan, who says that being a Christian means um, you, need, you must love your enemies. Oh, well, just so. uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. I think I have to think about that one. I mean, he doesn't. There's no immediately obvious answer because he's always framing things not abstractly, but in terms of a stand on a certain issue, it, it's, there's not a lot of personal, uh, almost no, you'd have to look at, at the correspondence or something, some other, because he doesn't speak in those terms and anything he publishes. Um, what, what, what is interesting is, because I was doing work on Florovsky, mm -hmm. and uh, I came across uh, finally, the complete interviews uh, that Blaine used. Um, um, and uh, one of the things Florovsky says about Bogakov, because he's talking about this whole period when you know, Bogakov was being attacked as a heretic, and he says, whatever I can say about him is he never considered me an enemy. He never treated me as an enemy. He said, you know, I even love the man. Uh, um, so this seems to have been something that, uh, well, he, he actually was paying attention to Jesus. Um, uh, it was something constitutional about him at different periods, and maybe particularly in the late period when he was being attacked as, you know, a heretic. Tuan? Antoine Arjakovsky, uh, Collège de Bernardin. I just would like to, to add something to this previous question, mm -hmm. because I think it's important, especially today in Russia. Uh, should we do politics if politics is a place of, um, of battle, of evil, and so on? The, the Bulgakov's approach towards politics was not the one of Karl Schmitt. Karl Schmitt, who divides the society between friends and enemies. This is not at all the, the political theology of Bulgakov. The political theology of Bulgakov is a political theology of incarnation. And because of his sociological uh, vision of the world, and uh, uh, Rowan Williams spoke about the sense of responsibility that comes from, from, from the sense of the wisdom of God, then he goes into politics and tries to, to, to fulfill his responsibility as a Christian, which is to, to, to build the kingdom of God on the earth. And in the immigration, he came back, his first course at the Saint-Serge Institute was on the kingdom of God on the earth. And that was one of the discussions at the Fellowship of saint Alban and Saint-Sergius. And until the end of his life, that was the, the main reason of his involvement in politics. And when he came back from America, he said, well, I, I thought I was a monarchist, uh, uh, um, a monarchist constitutionnel, a constitutionalist monarchist. After my discovering of democracy in the United States, 
I am for the democracy as it is based in the United States, which is, I think, very interesting for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was an interesting last statement, and we will continue with these questions this afternoon, I think. Mm -hmm. But I also think no one has something against a few more minutes of a short break. So thank you very much for your contributions and for your discussion. So we'll meet again at 3.15 for the first panel of this conference. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>
So welcome back to our first panel of this conference, uh, which is about religion, politics, and economics. So we are proceeding with the topic Catherine Yevtuchov has already introduced. Uh, Adalberto Mainardi will moderate this session. He is a scientific secretary of the International Ecumenical Conferences on Orthodox Spirituality at the Monastery of Bosa in Italy. So welcome to everybody and he will introduce everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you to the organizer of this uh, wonderful conference. I will briefly introduce our panel, Religion, Politics and Economics. Unfortunately, Professor Khalid cannot be with us, so it was he who was uh, destined to this uh, session. And as we heard uh, just uh, now from the lecture by Catherine F. Tukov uh, and uh, Brandon Hallaher, the involvement of Bugakov with the world and uh, in detail with the politics, uh, the economics uh, and the uh, burning issues as a uh, um, penalty and uh, capital pen uh, um, and uh, the agricultural uh, reform uh, and uh, also the uh, politics uh, in Russia. Uh, make uh, clear how uh, deep was his involvement in religion, politics, and economics. That's why this uh, conference uh, has uh, planned uh, a panel on these topics, which is in, uh, uh, deeply related with, with what we have heard today. And uh, I just uh, uh, start uh, presenting the first of our panelists, uh, uh, Professor Dionysios Skliris, uh, who is professor, uh, uh, teaching fellow at the theological department of the theological faculty of the University of Athens. He is a research, he has a PhD from uh, Sorbonne, Paris, and uh, his research uh, deals uh, uh, mainly with uh, the theology and uh, the ontology of Maximus, uh, the confessor, but also with uh, a prominent uh, contemporary uh, philosophers uh, like uh, Slavoj Žižek, who you know is also uh, deeply involved in uh, politi um, politics and political issues. So I give the floor to the first of our panelists who will speak to us about the world as the household of wisdom, political theology and philosophy of economy. You have uh, 15 minutes and uh, I pray all the panelists to keep with uh, this time because then we have uh, respondent and time for discussion. Please, Professor Skliris, your, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, the subject is the world as the household of wisdom in what concerns political theology and the philosophy of economy. Uh, I will uh, mainly focus on a work uh, written in 1912, and it is translated by Professor Eftuchov. Uh, about uh, the philosophy of economy. This was in a critical phase in Bulgakov's career where he was uh, back into theology and into the church. Previously, uh, he was um, involved with, uh, as we have heard before, with, uh, with politics, with political economy. So this is a moment of self-reflection. Uh, I will start my presentation um, through systematic uh, remark in the, in the, um, uh, yes. Uh, reading this uh, book, I have uh, noticed that there are basically three different notions of the term economy, and one uh, should keep that in mind. The first one is scientific, the second one is, the second is more philosophical, and the third is um, the, theolo the properly theological notion of economy. Um, in what concerns the scientific uh, term, uh, the scientific notion of economy, uh, one should keep in mind that it deals with the contingent aspects of economy and it approaches them through analytic scientific methodology. 
On the contrary, the second notion, the philosophical one, is a speculative observation of the phenomenon of life as a whole in its combat with the forces of death. So we have a strong dialectic between life and death. In this notion, in the philosophical notion, we have a particularly human notion of economy that is different than the economy of animals. And um, we have a notion of production and consumption which are particularly human, but they play a similar role to that of inhalation and exhalation biology. And uh, what is particularly human is the universality of economy. Animals may have families, like men, but only humanity has a self-consciousness of the unity of the species. And this notion of universality is what differentiates economy as a philosophical discipline from economy as a science that uh, studies separate economic acts. Finally, um, this is human economy, but we also have the notion of divine economy, the plan of God for the salvation of the world through Sophia. And uh, what is brilliant in Bulgakov is that he unites, he tries to unite the two notions. In the properly theological notion of economy, we have an eschatological character instead of a teleological one. Uh, this means a certain reversal of terms. Uh, death is not avoided but is assumed by Christ, in con uh, contrary to the natural aversion to death at the level of uh, philosophical economy. And, um, and uh, this is an eschatological event where the expansion and progress of life may pass through the opposite, through the death and the mystery of the cross. I made this uh, threefold distinction in the beginning so that we, have, we keep this in mind. And uh, having said that, uh, we can see these notions are the notions of the dialectic, the, the struggle of dialectic between life and death. We will see that later. But uh, now I will start from the beginning. Uh, so, having said that, uh, now we can understand better the critique of Bulgakov to dialectical materialism. For Bulgakov, economics uh, is a particular scientific discipline pertaining to the domain of contingency. It is different from uh, a philosophy of economy with a normative value. Uh, the true philosophy is orientated toward the non-contingent given. But uh, since in political economy we have a conflation of the two and uh, economics become part of philosophy, then the task of an authentic philosopher is one of the construction of this master narrative through undermining methodic doubt. And this is the stance of Bulgakov towards Marxist uh, political uh, economy, for example, dialectical materialism. Uh, Bulgakov makes a harsh distinction. Science is analytic and fragmentary, whereas philosophy is, uh, is uh, oriented to universality. And uh, thus, it, it would be a mistake to make a conflation, but we should uh, keep in mind the distinction between the two. In the philosophical um, um, notion of economy, there is a connection with the theology of the logo of beings, as was referred earlier in the conference. And uh, one can think not only of, uh, of uh, different thinkers from Philo of Alexandria to St. Maximus the Confessor. Uh, the logo signifies a connection of beings with a transubjective and realist meaning. And creation is seen as a synthesis between, on the one hand, the subjectivity of formation, of ideas as forms, and on the other, the initial unconscious void that received this formation, this sort of meonic uh, nothingness, as was said earlier. A philosophy aims at a synthesis between subjectivity and objectivity, as well as between necessity and freedom. For this reason, it resembles to poetry 
which is also characterized by a combination of inner consistency and free creativity, being philosophy seen as a poetry of concepts. This aesthetic activity of poetry is the highest embodiment of philosophy because it synthesizes between creativity and necessary consistency, or in other words, between the conscious and the unconscious. As the Professor Eftuhov remarks, uh, when commenting on uh, these aspects. In, uh, in Russian philosophy of this era, we see some concepts that we find also in the West, like in German idealism, but uh, we see them in a different context and with different combinations. For example, in Immanuel Kant, we have the subject of, uh, of uh, science and ethics being in, uh, in opposition, and then aesthetics is what tries to unite them. Uh, this, we, have this, we have similar subjects in uh, Bulgakov, but uh, uh, I would say that we have, first of all, a more optimistic stance that aesthetics does achieve the synthesis, even in this life. And uh, secondly, uh, we have an element drawn from Dostoevsky and also from Solovyev that the beauty will save the world. So. Um, philosophy is aesthetic in its very essence as it will be revealed in the end of synthesis. Uh, for reasons of, uh, since we don't have much time, I would like to point out what are the main, uh, the main antinomies and uh, the main struggle that is synthesized through the work of the Sophia. What is characteristic about Bulgakov is that he has a very positive notion of economy and progress. In this, he follows the modern uh, project of uh, progress. And uh, his philosophy could, could be termed idealistic vitalism. It is a, a philosophy of progress of life. And the work of Sophia is this progress of life. This progress of life um, takes place through oppositions and through antinomies. But uh, as was said earlier, this is not a, um, this is not a, a victor. Uh, this is not a, in a Fichtean manner, a, a strong dialectic of I and non-I. This is more like the work of the Sophia that incorporates the antithesis in. Uh, his book on economy, we have the following uh, main, uh, main uh, differences. I, I developed them in detail because this is not something given in philosophy. I mean, this combination of Bulgakov does has some originality. For example, he speaks about the difference between life and death, but uh, he sees this also as a difference between teleology and mechanistic determinism, more intentionality and causality, freedom and necessity, etc. So this means that there is a movement of life, and uh, in this movement, life leaves behind uh, what are the dead products of this uh, force of economy. Um, so a, a philosophy should not be materialist in Bulgakov's uh, point of view, because if it, materialism is a philosophy of the dead, it's a, it's a philosophy of dead matter, of the dead products of life. And uh, only idealism can be a philosophy of the living. Uh, at the same time, this uh, difference between um, uh, life and, and its dead product, which, which is also something that we find in existentialism later, uh, is also a political philosophy of political progress because uh, life uh, always has a tendency to, to live behind these dead, pro dead products and uh, progress with something new. In this, he's also assuming the traditional difference between natura natura and natura naturata. We see that in Spinoza or uh, in, uh, in the medieval philosophy. And uh, the difference between personhood and alienation is also part of Marxism, the alienation of, of uh, man as creator in, in the dead products of technology and science. And also that of consciousness and the unconscious, which he probably draws from selling, but um, 
it is also something that was very timely at this epoch because of the rising science of the psychoanalysis. And now we can be a little bit more precise. Yes. Okay, thank you. The problem with Marx, according to Bulgakov, is that it conflates the first two notions of economy with, and ignores the third one. It conflates science and uh, philosophy. And uh, it mistakenly turns contingent relations into philosophically necessary ones after a false empiricism. And this is also a false holistic approach to what should be examined analytically. Economic materialism is basically a metaphysics of history that tries to present itself as science, thus failing in both tasks. And thus, Marx's political economy becomes both a false science and an immature or premature philosophy since it gives a universal character to what is partial. The political result is the exclusion of love from politics and its substitution by cold rationalism and utilitarianism as the criteria for the formation of collective bodies. Uh, now I'd like to focus on the difference between the philosophical and the theological level. At the philosophical level, we have a paradox. This paradox is mortal life. This paradox is shown by the Darwinian theory of evolution in which a life uses death as an instrument for its preservation. But one could also possibly claim the inverse, namely that death, the prince of this world, is strengthened through the reproduction of life. This uh, philosophical economy is uh, based on the necessity to defend life, and this turns economy into a function of death, since the individuals try, fear death and try to avoid death, and this is the motor of economy. This economy is a self-affirmation of life, that is defensive in character. And it is, of course, vain because man remains subject to death and uh, what the result is an instrumentalization of death for economic uh, relations. Whereas in the theological and eschatological notion, we have a reversal. Instead of founding the economy on the fear of death, uh, Christians can conceive of a life that knows no fear of death and is just ready for sacrifice, thanks to the God-man. The mystery of readiness for sacrifice leads to the resurrection that constitutes the final victory over death. This is the divine economy that is God's plan for the salvation of the world, and this is, but this is regarded by Bulgakov as being the peak of human economy, not only its reversal, uh, since it is the confirmation of life's struggle to expand and develop. Similarly, Christ's victory over death could be regarded as the true ontological progress of life. It thus seems that the mystery of the cross is rather integrated by Bulgakov in a narrative of the continuity of life, and Christian eschatology is rather viewed as a confirmation of teleology. Uh, I will skip that part for reasons of time, but we can, uh, we can hold that labor in Bulgakov is a sort of expression of subjectivity. And it has a Trinitarian meaning because uh, in the Trinity we have subjectivity, otherness, and the synthesis. And in human labor we have also the, um, the subject, the object of labor, and the synthesis of a humanity that is expressed in the product of labor. This is also for Bulgakov the way to avoid and overcome the solipsism inherent in Descartes and Kant. Marx does this overcoming of solipsism in a materialist way, but Bulgakov insists that the right way to overcome solipsism is an idealistic and vitalist one. And I now come to the subject of the conference. Uh, it is interesting that Bulgakov does use a signifier communism in his political thought, but he changes its, its, uh, its, uh, uh, its meaning. We have notions of physical communism, like in Stoic sympathy, a sort of similarity of being, a communism of life and death at the philosophical level, 
a sort of ideal of panzoism or idealistic vitalism, and also this communism of life and death is the ontological foundation for economy, because thanks to it, nature can become the object of man, nature can be consumed uh, by man, there can be consumption and production, and uh, this is an ontological uh, foundation of economy, but in this uh, philosophical notion of mortal life. Could you try to, to Yes, to yes to this the is end. the last one, and I finish now. On the contrary, in the theological uh, notion, we have the Eucharistic communism, which is based on the resurrected body of Christ, which does not know of death anymore. And in this, we have a Eucharistic theology that, on the one hand, it takes from Feuerbach. On the other hand, this is a precursor of Alexander Schmemann, according to which we are what we eat. But uh, in the Eucharist, this means that we are immortal and non not mortal as in a philosophical examination of economy. Thank you very much. We thank you very much, Professor Scleris, for this um, important introduction to philosophy of economy of Bulgakov and uh, the links with uh, theology and the different way to see to death. I think that we have a lot of uh, questions and uh, um, remarks for the following uh, debate uh, that uh, we keep for the, the end of the session. I, I thank you particularly, Professor Scleris, for having coped with the time that we try to, uh, um, to observe in order to have a, a discussion, which is the part interesting of our panel. And I go directly to the presentation of our second speaker, uh, Yuri uh, Safoklov. He is a research fellow at Fern University in Hagen, and he is a chair of a German and European constitutional and administrative law and international law. He holds also a bachelor on theology at Santikon University, so he has a double competence and I think is particularly worthy uh, hearing his presentation now uh, because he is the, the, this double uh, interest that also moved the thinking of uh, Bulgakov. His uh, mm, paper is on independent, resistant, cooperative, Father Sergei Bulgakov's thoughts on the church-state relations and the paradigm of post-secularism. Professor Safoklov, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, the organizers, if they are not there, as I see, but uh, I thank them very much because they uh, took the risk and invited a law scholar to such a conference, uh, a law scholar who um, touches theology is since a couple of years, uh, and yet uh, they did it. So I'm very, very thankful, and for me it's um, just overwhelming and a great opportunity, so thank you very much. Um, let me begin with a brief historical overview of the church-state religions in Rome, the second Rome, Constantinople, and the third Rome, Moscow. Religion was always an integral part of ancient understanding of the state. The power was considered a phenomenon with a halo of sanctity, a medium of a godly guidance, a, g a gift of gods to the humankind. This premise opposed the very possibility to separate state and religion. The Christian church, however, constantly kept aloof from the Roman Empire as it could not accept the dominating pagan cult and especially the obedience to worship the emperors. The imperial administration reacted by sanctioning this refusal as disloyal and insidious conduct. The relations were therefore reduced to a hostile antagonism. The church became the target of massive state persecution, responding to the sanctions by demonizing the state and its rulers as the fulfillment of the scripture's apocalyptic prophecies. It was Constantine the Great who revolutionized the church-state relations by legalizing Christianity and restoring Christian property in the beginning of the fourth century. This quite new perspective of an enduring coexistence between two mighty and influential institutions led to the abandonment of the early Christian apocalypticism and caused a turnover to the essential concerns and requirements of the inhabitants of the empire. The borderline, which used to separate the church from the state and vice versa, quickly vanished. 
in this new political-religious unity, as George Florovsky put it, it was quite natural to declare the one God the source of all religious and state power. The emperor was considered an image of Christ as the ruler of the heavenly kingdom, who received a blessing for his reign, just like the anointed one himself. Consequently, the emperor took the position of the protector and defender of the Christian faith. For two centuries, the idea of the united imperial ecclesiastical power long remained, to speak with John Mayendorf, a state of mind, until the Christian doctrine was granted the rank of state laws under Emperor Justinian I. According to the sixth novel of the Justinian's Code, which uh, is certainly familiar to all of you, priesthood and kingdom are interconnected elements of the imperial power, which emerge from the same origin that is our God-given and adorn the life of people. This coexistence is programmed to evolve to a perfect harmony, a swift and gentle guidance of the humankind. However, despite all idealistic visions of harmony and agreement, the novel gave the emperor the right to control all earthly issues of the church, such as property, legal status of the church employees, and the like. The clergy was only to take care for the spiritual sphere, such as prayer and the sacraments. Reflecting the monarchy of Godfather, the emperor significantly affected the legal position of the church and claimed exclusive responsibility for its welfare and prosperity. He was not subordinate to the church's judiciary, but willingly restricted his freedom in order to assist the church in its mission of universal salvation. It is noteworthy that the interdependence and permeation of church and empire left no room for a whatsoever secular sphere in the Christian society. Everything, considering public and personal life, was more or less ecclesiastical. In sum, the, Bi the Byzantine model of the church-state relations can be described as cooperative, but nonetheless state-dominated. I would like now to switch to the relations between church and state in Russia. After the overcoming of the Tata-Mongol yoke in the 15th century, a new political structure of the Russian state had to be elaborated. Of course, the Byzantine example of the church-state symphony attracted the attention of Russian dukes who sought for a fitting prototype to rely on. By this time, the unity of ecclesiastical and imperial power emerged to one of the essentials of the Roman state theory. The phenomenon of the Roman church-state unity continuously inspired Russian Christians and was finally incorporated in the state theory after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, when Moscow raised the claim to inherit the defeated Orthodox Empire as the Third Rome. The situation gained, gained quite new facets after the enthronement of Peter I. Having faced a strong opposition to Peter's freedom plans from the church's hierarchs, the Tsar's most dedicated supporter, Archbishop Fyofan Prokopovich, developed a new model to reduce the influence of the priesthood and subordinate the clergy to the state power. The spiritual regulation, the Hovne Reglament of 1721, explicitly declared the necessity to create a state organ for ecclesiastical affairs, which in the end would unavoidably downgrade the church to a common state ministry. Theophan's major manifesto under the title Truth of the Monarch's Will of 1722 contains many references to Justinian's laws which should present the author as a devoted successor of the Byzantine Christian traditions. However, bearing in mind his statist and servile presets, Theophan unsurprisingly presents a different model. Quite opposite to the Byzantine symphony, he defines not salvation, but common wealth as the, as the final goal of the state. The monarch serves only this ultimate purpose and hence must not be distracted by any obligations to contribute to universal salvation. One of the central ideas of the composition is the absolute freedom of the monarch accomplished by his absolute immunity against any earthly jurisdiction and the right to violate all existing rules, including canons of the church. Peter converted Fairfund's theoretical inputs into a system of total domination of the state by institutionally decapitating the church in implementing the Holy Synod as a collective substitute of the Russian patriarch. The subsequent Russian emperors continuously developed the Petrine Cesaro papism with more or less intensive means. The church state relations in the Russian Empire reveal a steady process of absorption of the church into the institutional structure of the state, accompanied by continuous loss of administrative and even doctrinal independence.
It should be mentioned that the Russian church never accepted the state-imposed synodal model and finally condemned it at the local council of 1917-1918, which I will be speaking about in a moment. I would like now to, to offer a summary of Father Sergei Bulgakov's view on the church-state relations. First, a few words about the historical context. The shadow of colossal socio-political changes was discernible to almost every person in the Russian Empire who faced the second decade of the 20th century. It was especially present to the representatives of the so-called intelligentsia, a community of well-educated, politically engaged visionaries who realized the meaning of the Tsar's abdication in a state with a more than a million, millennium old tradition of absolute monarchy. Sergei Bulgakov was one of many intellectuals who experienced a phase of utmost commitment to and devote adoration of the Marxist doctrine, followed by a total review of his political convictions and conversion to Christianity. As a prominent Russian scholar, he was requested to file in a report on the church-state relations for the All Russian Council in 1917. In this document, Bulgakov argued that the church cannot be abstinent to any kind of human activity because God integrated the entire humankind into his divine being by the incarnation and resurrection of his son. An isolated, parallel existence of the church and state is therefore impossible, although their, competence, their competencies may and do differ. Bulgakov urged the church to inspirit all aspects of human life and to aim not for political, but noetic and spiritual supremacy. In one of his opera magna, Unfading Light, Bulgakov characterizes the power as a, I quote, God-given instrument of external resistance against inner evil. Due to its intrinsic connection to and dependence on God, the power is never self-sufficient, but always seeks for justification in the absolute. The secularization, which means the loss of religious bounds and domination of political expediency, destroys the spiritual community between the ruler and the ruled. There we have this Aristotelian division, separation of the ruled and the rulers, the duly and the despotai, causes social alienation and provokes struggle for power. In his later works, Bulgakov argued against any support for political regimes by the church and reject, rejected to consider any forms of government, of government as saint. So he draws the line to this idea of the white tsar, white tsar, belly tsar. On the contrary, Bulgakov diagnosed the lack of the, I quote again, equilibrium between the state and the church as the cause of many historical aberration and human tragedies, which significantly damaged or even destroyed Christian states. Inevitable in a state, coercion and violence may have no place in a community which understands itself as the Christ's bride. Bulgakov claimed that the church-state alliance will be overcome by the historical process and advocated for a separation between the church and the state as the most favorable condition. A free church, independent from and unsupported by the state, would be more likely to avoid the dangers of clericalism. Bulgakov preferred a political mo mode he labeled the democracy of souls, which means a broad political participation of Christians which would increase the influence of the church on state affairs. The encharging of the politics, one of Bulgakov's central, central concerns, and Antoine, uh, it is the answer to Antoine's question, actually, should we do politics? The encharging of the politics provides the church with the role of the state's conscience, which unceasingly insists on promoting and of Christian values and acting in accordance with the divine law. Crowning his political theological program with an optimistic conclusion, Bulgakov stated that the secular fundament of the modern society will be, quote, dissolved in ecclesiastity. I finally come to speak about the church-state relations in the post-secular era we witness today. After decades of numerous attempts to separate the church from the state and discredit religion as a relevant socio-political factor, an opposite pro process has come into place. As the renowned German philosopher Jürgen Habermas aptly noticed, Supporters of secularism who aimed to replace religious terms and concepts by rational equivalents faced the undeniable fact that religious communities did not disappear or became marginal because of the growing secular pressure. On the contrary, they remained socially visible and managed to uphold their political influence. For Habermas, the adjustment of the society to the existence of believers is the characteristic feature of post-secularism. He argues 
that both religious communities and secular strata must undergo a complementary learning process, that was a quote, which sets acceptable rules of mutual respect and comprehensible dialogue. Habermas insists that the secular society must become sensitive to requirements and arguments of religious communities. He argues for the establishment of an all-round agreement between believers, non-believers, and other believers. However, Habermas points out that religion will not be accepted as a relevant social factor if it appears merely as a sum of ancient traditions and behavioral patterns, which have no impact on the current social and political situation. One of the most urgent missions of religious community in the post-secular era would therefore be to promote the social political presence of religion, especially its stabilizing and developing potential in constitutional states. It seems quite clear that Christianity faces an unknown situation in the post-secular world. Even under most secular regimes, religion was still considered a re relevant social phenomenon, which has a decisive impact on the lives of the citizens. It was this very influence of the organized religious community, that is the church, which was targeted by the apologists of secularism in order to establish a new, unchurched and dereligionized state order. The project was at least partly successful. Many basic values like human dignity, fundamental rights, equality and the like were dissected of their Christian roots and transformed into somewhat amorphous common principles of the humankind. The church, therefore, finds itself in a situation where the terminology for the dialogical exchange with the secular society is almost completely lacking. A complementary learning process, as it is anticipated by Habermas, requires a competent teacher who is to introduce the partner, which appears to be the disciple, to the foreign realm of the counterpart. It is therefore up to the church to re-evangelize the society that means to resurrect the rest of the Christian heritage buried, under deep, buried deep under the thick sheath of secularity. I come to my conclusion. It would be obviously of no use to adjust the old concepts of church-state coexistence to modern conditions. Florovsky was absolutely right when he stated that, I quote, the Byzantine politico-ecclesiastical experiment should not be reenacted. A revival of Christian symphony, as it has been defined in Justinian's novel, is impossible due to the lack of a Christian empire, a Christian emperor, and other necessary prerequisites. Any attempts to refresh the concept and press it into the realm of modernity are therefore doomed to fail. So, as was shown above, the secularism missed its crucial target. It did not succeed in eliminating the church from the public sphere and banning religious conscience out of the people's minds. However, it managed to alienate church members in the secular society and destroy the terminological, terminological fundament for the dialogue. The circle of history has closed. The church must once again confront the world with the good news, engage with the environment, where decisive existential question, if raised at all, are dealt without any reference to God or other divine beings. Of course, it will have, it will have to assert and prove its presence present relevance, its why and what for, in the world with a fading religiosity. Father Sergei Bulgakov's enchurching vision was not fulfilled due to opposite processes in society and politics. However, his works can certainly be utilized if the church reaches out for the chance of re-evangelizing its post-secular surrounding and reintroducing the Christian perspective into the current social political agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Safoklov, for this very interesting paper on how also the thought of Bulgakov can be exploited and useful for uh, rethinking religious and religious category in a post-secular uh, society and how, in fact, uh, the problem of church-state uh, relations is still uh, on the agenda and uh, the experience of church-state relations in Russia and during revolution and during the council uh, made uh, also Bulgakov uh, a sort of forerunner for problems that we are still facing now. I will leave the floor for the f debate after the last uh, presentation, uh, and I have the pleasure to introduce you Professor Tikhon Vasiliev, uh, 
He is uh, from Russia, from Petersburg. He holds uh, a degree in economics uh, and also in theology and uh, a PhD at uh, University of Oxford where he studied particularly Christian angelology in Pseudo Dionysius and uh, Sergius Bolgakov. His uh, talk is uh, about uh, rethinking the language of economics as a systematic Christian response to economic and ecological crisis in the thought of Sergius Bulgakov. Uh, Professor Vasiliev, you have the floor and uh, 15 minutes, please. Thank you very much <clears throat> for the introduction. I must correct perhaps that I am not a professor yet, <laughs> at least. Um, and I can only join in all the previous words of uh, thanksgiving to the organizers and all the previous and those to follow. Now, rethinking the language of economics as a systematic Christian response to economic and ecological crisis in the thought of Sergius Bulgakov. This is the right title. Greta Thunberg in her speech at the United Nations in 2019 voiced the problems that have worried humanity for over a decade. Thinkers of the generation of Greta's parents and grandparents have already called on politicians and economists to change the existing system of the world economy, not only unfair in the distribution of wealth, but also provoking serious environmental crisis for the entirety of the planet. In my paper, I would like firstly if this very short summary, a um, fuller paper was sent to the respondent. I would like firstly to outline the problem area of modern economics more clearly perhaps than has been done hitherto, showing why efforts to curb the growth of CO2 emissions have so far not led to transformative results. Secondly, I will to outline areas of economic, soci sociological, philosophical and theological thought that can be considered as an alternative to the existing order. Thirdly and finally, I will turn to Bulgakov's thought and see how relevant he is to modern discussions, uh, maybe make some points, how his ideas relate to the areas of research mentioned above. Um, so first point, um, identifying the problem area. In the 1970s, Environmental problems began to be at the forefront of political debate with philosophers and politicians discussing them publicly. The emergence of terms as deep ecology and ecological ethics belongs to that decade. However, it is difficult to disagree with the German philosopher Vittorio Hössle, who back in 1994 issued a warning, quote, those who think that the ecological crisis can be dealt with the help of economic measures alone, I'm mistaken. The ecological crisis is caused by the arrows directing the movement towards specific values and categories, without correcting which we will never be able to start radical changes." End of quote. Hersley was right. We are not talking about any radical changes so far. First of all, because the goals of economic activity remain unchanged, largely. Maximizing economic growth, increasing the material well-being of economic entities. No matter how beautiful words national governments say about ecology, the main goal is to maximize economic growth, increase consumption and the incomes of the population, or also increase their own incomes, if we are talking about authoritarian rulers. This reflects the consumer attitude towards the world, towards nature. In his paper, Central Forces of Modern e Economics, uh, published um, several times, um, Tony Lawson, professor of economics and philosophy at Cambridge, argues that, quote, the modern discipline of economics is in some disarray short of on explanatory successes, largely detached from its subject matter and seemingly without clear objectives or sense of direction." End of quote. Lawson opposes mathematical modeling as the only proper or serious scientific way of doing economics. He wants to emancipate economics from this domination of mathematics. 
He insists that economics should be concerned with questions of philosophy, in particular ontology, for which the Cambridge Social Ontology Group was formed. Hence, together with um, Tony Lawson, we can say that the main problem of modern economic theory is the methodological problem, the dehumanization of economics, the marginalization of interdisciplinary approaches, brackets of fundamental philosophical issues. Peter Rohner from Oxford goes further, arguing that, quote, modern economics is an ideology presenting itself in scientific government, but in fact, it is promoting a particular agenda, end of quote. He questions the scientific status of economics and convincingly argues that at the core of modern economic theory lies a normative choice. The solution to the current crisis appears thus to be in two stages. First, we need to recognize that the state of the world economy is conditioned by values, and therefore ethical, philosophical, and theological discourses should be considered in the global decision-making. Only after such a recognition can we be in a position to begin to imagine a new economics. Attempts to offer answers of this kind have been made in various fields of knowledge. I, don't pretend, uh, to, <laughs> I do not pretend to cover uh, all such attempts, of course, in five minutes. I will name only a few significant instances to set the context for discussion of Bulgakov's thought, which actually has uh, already started with the first um, paper uh, this session. Um, ideas about reforming economic theory can be said to be in the air. On the, other, uh, on the one hand, economists are looking for ways to bring economics uh, closer to humanitarian knowledge, including philosophy and theology. An outstanding example of this is the aforementioned research led by Professor Lawson at Cambridge. I've already mentioned Peter Rona, but would like to say a few, word more, a few more words about his Economy as a Moral Science project at Oxford. A group of Catholic economists and theologians at Blackfriars at Oxford undertake um, quote, to redefine the domain of economics so as to provide the foundation for re-establishing the spiritual nature of man when acting as an economic agent. Peter Rohn argues that free will, intentionality, and moral judgment were excluded from economics, which resulted in creating unsatisfactory and unjust world. The idea that facts can be separated from values in individual and group social action is fundamentally wrong, according to him. But this is the foundation of modern economics. And so I, I, Isaiah Berlin, the founder of my own Wilson College at Oxford, wrote along these lines, quote, as any description of what is embodies an attitude that is a view of it in terms of what should be, we are not contemplating a static garden. We are involved in a movement uh, with a perceptible direction. It can be correctly or incorrectly described, but any description must embody evaluation. That is a reference to the goals toward which the movement proceeds and in terms of which it can be understood." End of quote. We can see here how the language of sociology can be helpful in such a description, as indeed it includes evaluation and a reference to the goal, which is the divine Sophie in Bulgakov's thought. On the other hand, philosophers and theologians show a tremendous interest in economic knowledge. As we uh, have evidence at this conference, theological mainly. This interest is evidenced also by the many published articles and monographs, and even the emergence of a new subject, economic theology. We can mention here the recently published Rutledge Han uh, Handbook of Economic Theology, just in 2020, uh, by, um, edited by Stefan Schwarzkopf, and the Oxford Handbook of Christianity and uh, Economics, edited by Paul Ossington, um, which uh, published 2014. Um, which um, these publications reflect the emergence of a new interdisciplinary field. 
the value of Bulgakov's philosophy of uh, economy for modern and environmental uh, for modern environmental and ecological research has recently be, been pointed out um, by Bruce Foltz and in um, brilliant publications um, by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Theokritov. On considering all of these publications, one is amazed how Father Sergei Bulgakov anticipated many of these problems more than 100 years ago. An astonishing thing, an astonishing thing perhaps, is that his ideas haven't, haven't lost their relevance today, many of his ideas. It would be more correct to say that his theological thought, including those applied to economics, are more relevant than ever. Therefore, we'll now proceed to the very brief consideration. Uh, there is no, and I want to start um, to go aside a bit. There is no agreement among researchers concerning the style of Bulgakov's thought. Those of, of them who tried to apply the logic of dogmatic theology or philosophy uh, to sophiology inevitably conclude that Sophia is a myth as uh, the logic of sophiology is inconceivable to them. I argue that it is possible to distinguish in Bulgakov's writing the, uh, writings the terms which belong to the languages of theology, uh, of proper theology and philosophy, uh, well, rather not proper, traditional, and philosophy from his meta-language of sophiology. Bulgakov introduced this meta-language in his writings as his personal theologumenon without intention to replace the language of traditional theology. There is an example where he published a book on theology without employing his theological language, and Bulgakov maintains, of course, I admit and consider obligatory for my theology all the doctrines of the church. And elsewhere, my sophiology is a theological doctrine which has been only mine so far. I have never uh, had an idea to charge anyone who opposes sophiology with heresy or unfaithfulness to orthodoxy. Bugago speaks of a sophianic interpretation of the doctrines of the church and claims to be fully orthodox. I confess all the true doctrines of the orthodoxy. My sophiology by no means relates to the content of those doctrines, but only to the theological interpretation. So, in the light of the theme of my paper, the question arises, how can this interpretation of Bulgakov be useful for us, and what does um, he try to achieve through the application of his meta-language to economics? Father um, Nicholas Sakharov writes, uh, uh, quote, the work of salvation, uh, and I fully agree with this, the work by which God in Christ restores wholeness to the universe is a work that relates at every point to the physical world, to the human body, to the material environment. This is something which again comes to light very clearly in the work of Bulgakov. As an economist and as a former Marxist, Bulgakov never loses sight of the practicalities of these relations between human beings themselves and then between human beings and the things amongst which they live." And of course, of course it also resonates very much with the words of uh, Brandon, uh, the, his, um, the talk which we, uh, he, I think, concluded his paper. Therefore, the economy is not some kind of separate, not important for salvation sphere of life. The economy should be salutary for the body, for the soul, for the whole person. According to Bulgakov, one of his immediate tasks in writing the philosophy of economy was the, the interpretation of the Christian patristic heritage. He wanted to present, and quote, the religious ontology, cosmology, and anthropology of St. Athanasius, of Alexandria, Gregory, of Nyssa, and others, in the light of modern philosophical thinking. In contrast to materialism and idealism, Bulgakov develops the idea of religious materialism. Part of this general plan was the substantiation of the ontology of the economic process. Making a diagnosis of his contemporary economy, Bulgakov notes that uh, economic materialism should not be denied, but overcome from within, explaining its limitation as a philosophical abstract principle in which one side of the truth is sold as the whole truth. 
speaking about the economic theory of his day, Bulgakov makes the following important observation, which is in many ways relevant even now. In practice, economists are Marxists, uh, even if they hate Marxism. Um, that's Bukakov's quote. We might remember Peter Rona uh, from Oxford in this respect, who echoed Bukakov insisting that modern economics is an ideology uh, in a scientific garment. Bukakov links the economy with the concept of life, as we heard in the previous papers, as such, um, uh, with the concept of life as such, while giving a preliminary definition of the economy. According to him, life is the principle of freedom and organicism. The whole world process is a contradiction between a mechanism, a thing, and an organism of life. The economy thus turns out to be a struggle for life. Economy, according to Bulgakov, is not a well-honed mechanism for extracting wealth from nature and the organization of material life. On the contrary, it is aimed at overcoming the mechanism in itself as the beginning of necessity. Its task is to expand the realm of cosmic freedom, transform a mechanism into an organism. One might ask, what did Bulgakov mean by the sophianic nature of the economy? Above all, the sophianic nature of the economy is revealed in its teleological nature. Economic activity overcomes the divisions in nature, and its ultimate goal outside of economy proper is to return the world to life in Sophia, writes Bulgakov. The beginning of the economy is also outside this world. Man is the natural ruler of the world and the vehicle of Sophianism. Um, it's very important, Bulgakov's quotation, that economic activity and investigations of science, the labor on a real and ideal object, began in an Edenic state, when the metaphysical essence of man's relation to the world was still unharmed, when he didn't fear death or hunger, for the tree of life was accessible to him. The labor of cognition and action could here be performed only in the spirit of love towards God creation. In this sense, we can speak of the Edenic economy as the selfless, loving effort of man to apprehend and perfect nature, to reveal its Sophic character." End of quote. This is striking how Bulgakov's Christian economic theology is resonant with more recent non-religious even ethical proposals. For instance, Hans Jonas, the author of The Imperative of Responsibility in Search of an Ethics for Technological Age, develops the topic of environmental responsibility. He rejects the traditional ethical anthropocentrism, um, which reduced the problem of moral responsibility solely to the relationship between people. Yet this kind of non-religious ethics, one can argue, can be called the ethics of fear, which might seem effective for the purposes of pure survival, uh, but still being inferior to the Christian ethics of love, which is at the core of Bulgakov's sophiology, and is reflected uh, also in the encyclical of the uh, uh, Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church in Crete in 2016. In conclusion, I would like to highlight two main, uh, main ideas regarding the question how Bulgakov's deliberations on Sophia can be helpful in tackling the ecological crisis and why it, is, it matters theologically. First, Bulgakov inspires Christians not to avoid economics. He urges us to take care of the created world out of love, with this in mind and in heart to translate the language of economics into the 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 theological language. Christians should be the leaders of the ecological movement. Um, and second, our hope is confirmed by St. Paul's words about little yeast which leavens the whole batch of dough in the first Corinthians. Bulgakov's idea that um, economic materialism should be overcome from within means that when new Sophianic language acquires meaning in the sphere of economics, the old one will necessarily lose its power sooner or later and attractiveness not only in the eyes of Christians but it can become a powerful missionary tool in converting, in converting the world to Christ. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Father Tikon, for this inspiring uh, paper on how the thought of Bulgakov is in fact a forerunner for the problem we face now, how to cope economics with uh, the ecological crisis, and uh, we find here space to rethinking the uh, dialogue and the relationship between these two uh, big uh, problems. And uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce our respondent, uh, Nikolaus Asprulis, who is Deputy Dire Director of the Volos Academy for Theological Studies. He uh, studied notably the many Orthodox contemporary uh, theologians and theology, uh, Zizioulas and Florovsky, and uh, uh, the problems uh, that we face now about uh, uh, creation and uh, um, also crisis in uh, ecology and environmental. And so he, I think he's uh, the most uh, um, important person that can uh, uh, introduce now to the debate that will follow afterwards. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the three speakers for their efforts in dealing with certain aspects of Sergei Bulgakov's sociopolitical thought. In what follows, I will try to critically comment on concrete aspects of your presentations. I will start with Yuri Savlokov's uh, text, which begins with the claim, quote, that the religion which had been banned into privacy by dominating secularism of the 20th century experienced a social renaissance under the following post-secularism, end of quote, which constitutes the background pattern of his whole presentation. I'm not quite sure, though, if this strong assertion upon which the whole argumentation is based really expresses the deeper meaning of secularization. Considering that secularization originally emerged as a Christian term, I can refer here to Augustine, which accounts for making something godly, godly which according to the best modern literature on the subject, it by no means accounts for a biased marginalization of religion, but rather offers a neutral space for all the religious voices to emerge beyond a whole separation point of view. Given this all, uh, taking in consideration all this, secularism, secularization should be certainly understood as a more complex phenomenon. One can speak today about multiple secularizations than it appears to be understood by Yuri. In addition, Shall we speak of a return or a revanche of religious, religions in terms of religious fundamentalism, for example? Or even further, can we speak of a return of religious, religions sorry, or rather of spirituality, another quite broad term much used today in religious studies? Beginning with the historical overview of the church-state relationship, one could expect the speaker to start with Jesus' own political attitude in front of the worldly powers of his time. This provides the reader with a specific pattern of how Christians should act and react with regards to the surrounding political status quo of its era. Again, I'm not sure if Constantine's policy was, the, was what caused the abandonment, quote, of Christian apocalyptism, end of quote, or rather the very delay of the second coming. Otherwise, external parameters seem to define certain core aspects of the gospel message. One further thesis which also triggered a reaction in me was the following assertion. A, a quote, the church state symphony did not appear as an ingenious intellectual flash, but had solid, traditionally founded roots. One of the starting points is the patristic thesis that every human being is responsible for his entire surrounding, end of quote. Although I'm not a patristic scholar, I cannot recall strong evidence for this claim in patristic tradition, considering this shown again stands against Podius Pilate, as well as the ambivalent relationship in both East and West between the emperors and the church officials. If I may, I would read the, this Basilian view as an expression of the priestly role of human beings, or a Sophianic view of creation, rather than as a confirmation of the church state's symphony model, 
if such a symphony ever really existed, according to their certain literature. In his overview, the speaker presents various instances of the church-state relationship. What is lacking, however, is both a brief review of the developments in the West and also a certain focus of FCBS of Caesarea, who seems to have contributed much to this sort of symphony model. It is rightly asserted by the speaker that, quote, it is not worthy that the interdependence and permission of church and, and, and empire left no room whatsoever for a secular sphere in Christian society. Everything considered public and personal life was more or less ecclesiastic, end of quote. Can we say, though, that this applies to nowadays? Can we, re we really claim that today there is only one sphere, a religious one, or and not a public one? Can we say that uh, we have only uh, a religious sphere? The text appears to hold the view that the so-called symphony was a proper pattern for the church-state relationship, without, however, taking to, into account the dialectic between history and eschata, which strongly questions any sort of compromise whatsoever with earthly matters. The speaker gives a balanced and well-informed account of the church-state state relationship in Russia, Russia until the Council of 1917-18. Although negatively appreciated, the speaker refers to the final goal of modern state as commonwealth, and not salvation, which in contrast is the goal of Christian life. But is it possible for salvation, a, clear, a clearly eschatological vision, to become part of a state agenda? Salvation or theosis has a certain political importance, as recently argued by Papa Nicolaou, but this does not account for it becoming part of a political agenda. Even though it is true that, quote, the Russian church never accepted the state-imposed synodical model it finally condemned it at the local council of 1917, end of quote, a word needs to be said here for the current unholy alliance between the Moscow Patriarchate and the Russian government. With, with regards now to Bulgakov's view on the church-state relationship, the speaker argues more specifically that for the Russian theological, quote, an isolated parallel existence of church and state is therefore impossible, while defining, again, quote, power as a God-given instrument of external resistance against inner evil, end of quote. But what is the meaning exactly of Bulgakov's assertions? Is, is it that Bulgakov's state, uh, the study of the state, equates to the one of the Byzantine or Russian symphony? I really doubt that this is the case, since for Bulgakov, and now I quote, I quote uh, regular, secure freedom, the human rights language, democratic values, and social justice, end of quote, are major, major tenets of a state. One can hardly argue that the Byzantine or Russian Empire state has been defined in this way. At the same time, for Bulgakov, the fight against evil never stops. And for the church, this is her main goal, one which even culminates in a revolutionary attitude against powers abused by the state. Savlokov rightly stresses that Bulgakov, quote, argued against any support for political regimes by the church, and that he, Bulgakov, diagnosed the lack of the equilibrium between the state and the church, end of quote. At the same time, according to the speaker for Bulgakov, the, the church-state alliance, quote, will be overcome by the historical process it advocated a separation between the church and the state as the most appropriate modus vivendi for both institutions. A free church, uh, the speaker continues, independent of, of it unsupported by the state, would be more likely to avoid the dangers of clericalism, end of quote. In Orthodox years, and especially in many traditional Eastern Orthodox countries, these words still sound quite strange, or even as representing a Western worldview as a result of the secularization process. By saying this, Bulgakov appears to have foreseen certain developments of our age, where the church is not the only 
voice to be heard in the public sphere, but one amongst many. He gives us then many clues of how to tackle an increasing non-Christian, but not necessarily anti-Christian world. Let me now turn to the second, to Father Vasiliev's uh, presentation, which focused on a different aspect of Bulgakov's thought. Again, this text is well structured and well informed. The text starts by rightly exploring the deeper nature of the environmental crisis, which should not be restricted to economic factors alone, meaning priority, give, giving priority to economical models, but should also take into account our consumer view, according to the speaker, as perhaps the basic reason which caused the current climate catastrophe. This is a view that has not been yet fully apprehended, despite the current ecumenical patriarch's Bartholomew efforts to show the, that ecological crisis is more a spiritual problem than economical. Vasiliev then refers to certain efforts undertaken by Professor Tony Lawson, who, quote, opposed mathematical modeling as the only proper or serious scientific way of doing economics, end of quote. At that, again, a quote from his paper, that economics should be concerned with questions of philosophy, end of quote, a claim which amounts to the original meaning of the word economy as a, as a household, which goes beyond uh, an uni, uni, utilitarian and mathematical abuse of the word. He again refers to a similar process underlined by Peter Rona at his economy as a moral science project, where he argues that, quote, free will, intentionality, and moral judgment were excluded from economics, end of quote, which resulted in creating an unsatisfactory and unjust world. Rightly then, Vasilev stresses the need where, quote, a world economy is conditioned by values, and therefore ethical, philosophical, theological discourses should be considered in the global decision making, end of quote. Without, however, giving any idea of how such a moderated studying of the economy affects the current critical climate crisis. Although Vasiev at some point rightly claimed that, quote, Bulgakov anticipated many of these problems more than 100 years ago, that his thoughts have not lost their relevance today, and that his theological thought, including those applied to economics, is more relevant than ever, he does not, in fact, reflect on Bulgakov's own theological suggestions. He rather takes pains in discussing third, certain methodological prerequisites of sophiology as a sort of meta-language in order to justify its use in the discussion of relevant modern problems. He then clearly argues, quote, that whatever Bulgakov touches with his sophiology, be it the church, doctrine, or economics, it ceases to be what it was before. It becomes part of Bulgakov's meta-language with its own logic, end of quote. If I understand Vasilev's intention correctly, sophiology is not a new doctrine in itself, but a conceptual tool to interpret the goal. It is not quote, a dogma, but only an interpretation of the dogma. It is Sophia in this respect becomes the universal methodological principle, end of quote. In other words, it, it, this is something that it is deduced from this uh, presentation. Sophiology is a system of thought with its own logic, and thus applicable to every single theological or other doctrine. If that is the case, which is really what I think, Bulgakov has been actually misunderstood, not only by the ecclesiastical authorities of his time, which condemned him, but also by neopatristic interlocutors like Florovsky and Losky, who misunderstood his system as a circle of organism and pantheism. But let Bulgakov speak for himself. Quote, my sophiology by no means relates to the content of those doctrines but only to their theological interpretation, end of quote. In the last part of his talk, Father Vasiliev provides a sketch of a Sofianic interpretation of economics by being based on Bulgakov's religious materialism and his bold insistence on the role of the body and human personhood in salvation. 
Bulgakov provides a different understanding of economy as a struggle for life, where human freedom and its efforts towards the transformation of the world, or in his words, labor restoration of the world, and the overcoming of natural necessity constitutes its inherent cornerstone. One can see here the personhood, freedom, nature, necessity dialectic at play. At the end of the, his presentation, the author rightly refers to an endemic, uh, endemic economy where Bulgakov goes beyond a narrow anthropocentric understanding of the relationship between human beings and the environment in its entirety, overcoming thus any human exceptionalism, which often prevails in human interaction with nature, leading to the present uh, climate catastrophe. Let's now turn to the first paper by uh, Dionysius Cleris, who, did, who dealt with uh, politica, the political aspect of Bulgakov's theology. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to review this paper since I received it only yesterday, but some points have been already discussed in relation to Father Vasiev text. If I would like to provide some uh, more comments, that would be the following. Importantly, it's clear it underscores, under, underscores the attention given to, by Bulgakov to different meanings of economy such as scientific, philosophical, and of course, theological. To the extent that Bulgakov recognizes the importance of human freedom, economy acquire, acquires a new understanding as struggle through labor for life. In addition to many parts of his work, Bulgakov applies here also a Trinitarian pattern. In his view, labor has a Trinitarian meaning since, I quote, it is a form of exteri exteriorization of the subject that brings quite close the subject with the object of labor, end of quote. I would disagree with Sclery's assertion that Bulgakov is, close to, is closer to Marxism when he claims that labor is particularly a human aspect in contrast, in contrast to natural forces of life. Given that labor constitutes an act with a certain purpose, which is fight for life, meaning to overcome death, then it is rightly uh, considered as a unique characteristic of human being and not of animals. Although this later view is under question within the current uh, development of animal studies. What lies behind uh, in the background of this discussion is the question about the relationship between history and nature, between freedom and necessity. But one last uh, comment on uh, Sclery's paper. There is a tension, uh, in my view at least, in Sclery's reading of the role of materiality in Bulgakov's system. One could say a lot about this topic, but the missing point in my view is that Bulgakov, being in favor of a religious materialism, gives a new understanding to materiality beyond any utilitarian Marxist or other perception. This can be further confirmed by Scully's own uh, claim of a cosmic communion being transformed to a Eucharistic communion, but also but by what I mentioned uh, earlier with regards to Father, Father Vasiliev's uh, text. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sproulis, for introducing our debate, and uh, since you have uh, um, addressed a critical observation to the three uh, panelists. I, I would suggest to begin with a, a very brief reply from these three uh, our panelists. Uh, I will give two minutes uh, each and then we will open the floor to uh, eventually other questions from the public. And since the, um, Professor Sophocles was the first to be addressed, I will give you the floor now just to <coughs> Uh, yes. Thank you, Professor Asprulis, for your most um, uh, useful uh, comments, really. Um, I just, um, I mean, I can only just take them with me and, and elaborate on them and um, comment. Um, I th it, some some points, minor points. I mean, uh, you spoke about religious fundamentalism as uh, a relevant 
um, a religious um, appearing in, in the modern world. And I think it's um, um, that what uh, religious fundamentalism has at least to do with is religion. I think it's just kind of um, um, covering uh, used to just um, um, justify the violence. Uh, but it's, it can be, of course, um, um, uh, it can be elabor elaborated on. Um, um, uh, I, th I think you, you were uh, critical about uh, the juxtaposition of salvation and commonwealth. Um, if, if, if the one does not or should not include the other, um, of course it should. Of course it should. And um, if um, if you read Sergei Bulgakov, it, it, it does as well. So it's it's his point of enchurching, of uh, uh, inspiring, enchurching the world, the, the politics, and and so on. So you um, of course you connect the one with the other. But um, where I um, spoke about it was. Um, the situation in the Petri in Russia, where this was um, um, this was not a combination, but an either or, either salvation or commonwealth, and uh, the emperor should uh, care only for the commonwealth and not so for not, not at all for uh, salvation. Um, the, um, uh, you you pointed out, I think. Uh, or you, 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 um, you spoke about the, the, the church-state state alliance, uh, which should be overcome by historical process, as uh, Bulgakov put it. Um, and um, what we see now uh, in our present days. Uh, I, I think I, I, I understood it this way. It's, it's from unfading light. Uh, so Bulgakov writes first uh, about the past, then about the present, and then he comes to this historical overcoming. And I think this vision he has uh, is not historical, it's, it's eschatological. I think it's what's, what's, what is to come. Uh, it's not what we, what we have now, but what is to come. So it's just a okay. minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now perhaps Father Thikon has to something to reply. Two minutes. Um. Well, um, <clears throat> if I got it uh, right, perhaps you were a bit suspicious about my um, uh, concentration on methodology rather than analyzing concepts. But anyway, I wanted to reiterate that, that yes, um, well, because of the time limits, but uh, also because I consider it really important um, to speak about uh, sociology as a rather a method um, and these, well, uh, <laughs> difficult to find proper words, um, concept, uh, which can be applied. Um, this method, methodology can be applied in different uh, spheres of thought, of India, including um, economics, the economic theory. And we find it, yes, we find Sophia not only in Bulgakov's um, dogmatic theology, but also in his economics. Also, yeah, well, my, my view of this work as, uh, um, was rather retrospective, because I, uh, yeah, maybe that's how it was. Maybe there are some more questions. Professor Skleris. Thank yes, thank you. And, uh, um, I have tried, about the subject of totalitarianism, I have tried to show that um, Bulgakov exercises a critique to the conflation between science and philosophy. This conflation means that uh, what should be regarded as contingent is finally regarded as uh, necessary. In general, Bulgakov thinks that science, as well as historiography, are, the, are disciplines that uh, consider the, the contingent realm with analytic uh, methodology, whereas philosophy is a speculation also about necessary truths, and there is need of synthesis. If uh, someone conflates the two, then there is a danger of totalitarianism. Uh, so I think this was my approach on this subject. And I also, what you said about uh, labor is uh, very interesting. I think that uh, Bulgakov does not accept the theory of uh, values 
that is dependent on labor, which we have in Marxist, but also in some, um, some pre-Marxist, rather liberal uh, uh, theories. And uh, he sees, uh, as you s he sees uh, labor mostly as uh, in its expressive uh, power, and also, as you said, as uh, an echoing of a Trinitarian archetype, uh, as, a, um, a, as a synthesis of subject, subjectivity and nature in the product of labor that is an active uh, synthesis. In a similar way that in a Trinitarian theology of Augustinian flavor, the spirit is the link between the father and the son, the copula, the link. I think I will leave it at that. Yes, thank you anyway for uh, the remarks. We still have some minutes for further uh, questions or remarks, uh, so the floor is uh, open to uh, any comments uh, or question to the three panelists. Uh, you, may, you may present yourselves once again so everybody can uh, yes. understand, begin to, to, to know each other, please. Yes, Sarah Levick Moses, Boston College. Thank you all to the panelists. I, I suppose my question is relevant to, to each of you, but um, came up specifically for me in Father Tikhon's paper. Um, I have to admit a very shallow understanding of political and economic theory, so I will ask a theological question. Um, and it, that's specifically to do with the eschatological, which was mentioned a bit during the responses to the response. Um, it seems that any self-conscious Christian theory of the political or the economic or something at the intersection of the two must admit a kind of eschatology under, underneath it. Um, I mean, that could look like a realized eschatology as we see in liberation theologies in order to expedite the action in the social and worldly realm of the Christian faith. Um, but a, a to realize eschatology might also lead one to a, a non-religious materialism or even imperialism on the other extreme. Um, and yet, uh, an eschatology that remains too future-oriented might lead one to a kind of isolationism um, in the kind of, I mean, dare I say, Rod Dreyer sense. Um, so I just wonder for each of you, or maybe just Father Tikhon if we don't have, have time, um, in what way do you see Bulgakov, who seems to have both a sophisticated realized eschatology and his um, understanding of religious materialism, economy as art, um, and the created Sophia, and yet maintains this constant revelatory and eschatological waiting for transfiguration and deification? Thank you. Well, in, in, in my view, um, Bulgakov's works, and especially these um, works on economics, um, well, as perhaps also works by Marx, are performative. So they are trying to, you know, to form, as it were, a new person. Um, but whereas, of course, Marx uh, has his own um, views and ideas and goals. Uh, Bulgakov has in mind, um, well, being um, converted, um, uh, well, returned uh, um, to Christianity and uh, he, of course, had in mind um, this eschatological view, uh, this um, I don't know what I can add uh, more to what's here. When I read Bulgakov, um, I was um, surprised, astonished even, uh, because what, what he writes, um, you, I mean, you, you don't have uh, this uh, 
um, I mean, a political part of the book and the eschatological part of the book. It's, it's all, it's not the same, but it's, it's common. So he writes about the here and now. Uh, however, you see that what he writes about is at the same time eternal and timeless. So he writes about politics and how the church should engage in, in church and, and so on. And um, uh, there you have this passages of kingdom of heaven and uh, as the church, uh, the church which, which emerges to this kingdom. It's, it's all in the same chapter. It's in the same passage sometimes. Uh, so um, I, I, I just think his vision, he, I mean, he just, he does not... Um, separate the sects, the one from the other. So he's, it's just like um, it's, it's like in the apocalypse. He, uh, I, I come, I come, and I come soon. Yes, come, uh, Lord Jesus. So it's, it's how he reads, he, how he reads uh, the, rea the reality, and how he writes about the reality. So, um, and this is why um, there there is no is isolation as isolationism by, by him because he. He is in the, in, in the present time, he is in the here and now, and uh, he doesn't, of course, um, exclude himself or the Christians from, um, from the world outside. He, he, is, he understands them fully as, as part of the contemporary world. May I also follow up, I'm just a little <laughs> inspired by this uh, response, that yes, indeed, and um, Sophia, sophiology, um, intrinsically is a sort of as, as catalogical because it includes the goal and um, intentionality and it mm, and also um, it's very um, much his experience of a, a liturgical life and life in the church as a Christian as a priest well, uh, of course, um, when he was, uh, he was writing his philosophy economy, he wasn't a priest, but he um, grew up in a priestly family, so, and later in his uh, autobiographer, um, uh, in his notes, uh, he, uh, in his diaries, he mentioned uh, that um, this um, Sophia Sophiology is a sort of like a spirit of orthodoxy for him which he could feel being a child, raised up in this priestly family, and later he tried to articulate it in different ways. There's his feelings of being Orthodox, being Christian. So it's very much um, about his experience of Orthodoxy, of Christianity, of well, well, Orthodox true Christianity for himself. That's, um, that's why and these, you know, his writings, his sophiological writings are very, are very often not um, very consistent and uh, sometimes repetitive. Um, his ideas, because he tries to um, express an expressible perhaps or something which is uh, not um, purely logical. We have touched a very important uh, topics now, the eschatology in uh, Father Bugakov, and indeed uh, the time is running and uh, we have uh, trespassed our uh, time for coffee pause of five minutes, but I think that everybody is grateful to our panelists and to our respondent because we touched uh, important uh, issues uh, uh, on uh, post-secular conflicts uh, and uh, ecological crisis, and we have seen how the thought of Father Bulgavo is still uh, up to date and it's ch is still challenging for all of us. So I think that we can uh, thank once again our panelists and our respondent and we have uh, another session and uh, 16.45 after the coffee break. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back to our last session of this very political day about Bulgakov. I introduce Nathaniel Wood, who is Associate Director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center of Fordham University in New York. And he is Managing Editor of the new, quite new Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies edited by this very institution. And he uh, did a PhD in systematic theology that was called Deifying Democracy, Liberalism and the Politics of Theosis in 2017. So today he will speak to us about Bulgakov's Chalcedonian Politics of Divine Human Personality. All right, uh, thank you all for being here at the end of this long uh, but productive and interesting day. So I will try my best to keep you all from falling asleep. Um, although uh, much of what I'm going to say we've already uh, discussed in one form or another earlier in the day. Um, so one of the fascinating aspects of Bulgakov's theology is his integration of the doctrine of theosis and political theology. A connection between these two has always existed within the Orthodox tradition, at least implicitly, but overwhelmingly it has been expressed in the Byzantine notion of church-state symphonia, the main focus of which is the institutional cooperation between uh, the imperial and ecclesiastical authorities uh, within a Christian theocratic context. And therefore, it, it offers little in the way of general principles that might guide Christian action within other kinds of political communities, such as modern liberal democracies. Um, although Bulgakov certainly addressed the uh, issue of church-state relations in this institutional way quite explicitly and extensively in many places, um, his political theology is really noteworthy for the fact that its starting point lay somewhere else, namely in a desire to protect the freedom and the dignity of the human person and to promote personal development. So Bulgakov stands at the front end of this broad stream of theological personalism that was dominant in orthodox theology across the 20th century and into the current century. Uh, among the major emphases of this personalist stream has been uh, an essential link between personhood and theosis. Not only is personhood the main category through which deification is understood, but one of the chief functions of theosis is to establish an ontological foundation for the absolute value of the singular person. The person's irreducible uniqueness, irreplaceability, existential freedom, etc., a set of themes that are most popularly associated with the work of John Zazulus. Even though there are many significant points of divergence between Bulgakov and the neopatristic model of theology in which this person theosis link uh, is most commonly articulated in 20th century orthodox theology, Bulgakov's own intellectual turn to the doctrine of theosis was in part motivated by a, a, a similar sort of commitment to personal freedom and irreducibility. But whereas someone like Zizoulas gives relatively few clues about where his personalism might intersect with political theology, Bulgakov's concern for the person was from the beginning unambiguously embedded within the political debates of his day, as, as we've seen. Uh, his theoretical defense of personhood was always intended to support a political defense of personal freedom and personal dignity. Uh, and so his embrace of theosis was really meant to transform this seemingly otherworldly doctrine of the human being's participation in the divine attributes into the basis of a political theology that was centered on human freedom and human flourishing. 
Bulgakov's political theological linking of personhood and theosis uh, opens up new possibilities then for thinking about the church's relationship to politics uh, that go beyond uh, stale repetitions of symphonia, possibilities that might inform Christian approaches to liberal democracy. So that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. Bulgakov's personalist leanings preceded his uh, full reconciliation with the Orthodox Church and the beginning of his career as a theologian, and uh, were in many ways a catalyst for his transition away from his youthful Marxism. In his contribution to the 1902 volume Problems of Idealism, Bulgakov argues that the highest model of social progress would be one that takes the human person as its starting point. The aim of progress, he argues, is the creation of the conditions for the free development of the person, which he considers to be morally axiomatic. Three years later, now hoping to take advantage of the opportunities of the 1905 revolution, he reaffirmed this commitment, now casting it in explicitly Christian terms, in his essay, an urgent task, which we heard about earlier, where he describes the freedom of the person as the absolute ideal of Christian politics. This essay proposes an ecumenical union of Christian politics whose guiding principle was to be the political and economic emancipation of the human person from Russia's centralist and autocratic despotism, combining democratic self-government, civil rights, and socialist economics. Bulgakov's turn to theosis, which was already, um, the roots of which were already starting to take shape in an urgent task, would grow out of this political commitment to liberation. Since, since theosis made up for what he thought was lacking in positivist approaches to social progress, specifically a metaphysics of personhood. Describing his own disenchantment with Marxism in 1906, Bulgakov cites positivism's failure, failure to supply an ontological foundation for what he calls the single, irreplaceable, and absolutely unique personality. Positivism suffers from a theoretical disregard for the person, a refusal to confront the question of the person as an individual. Instead, relying on what he calls a crude sociologism, that dissolves the concreteness of persons into sociological abstractions, uh, reducing personhood to uh, what he would later describe as not much more than a ripple on the wave of society. Therefore, even though Bulgakov was able to praise uh, posi positivist versions of socialism uh, for what he describes as their faithful and courageous defense of oppressed people and of the laboring classes, he parted company with them on the deeper meaning of such economic liberation. For Bulgakov, socialist and democratic movements were necessary to create the external conditions for the cultivation of an inner personal life. He says the battle against poverty is fundamentally a battle for the rights of the human spirit. Bogakov thus coupled his socialism with the defense of various uh, rights of personality, such as freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of association, and other broadly liberal values. However, because personhood within a positivist framework is metaphysically empty, the positivists neglected the development of personality in favor of a one-sided focus on the improvement of social and economic conditions. They substituted the human person as the subject of development for humanity in the abstract, to be perfected in the future. And at worst, positivism, Bulgakov argued, reduced human personality to nothing more than an instrument of the realization of this collective humanity. And it treated the rights of personality merely as a means to an end and therefore subject to restriction when necessary. But for Bulgakov, these rights were sacred and inalienable as an aspect of the personal dignity of human beings that could no more justly be violated under the banner of social progress than under that of czarist autocracy. 
So in a broad sense, Bulgakov can be placed within the liberal tradition insofar as the centerpiece of his political theory uh, was the rights of individual human persons. However, Bulgakov's person is not just the empty abstract individuality that is commonly associated with liberal theory, especially by critics. Nor are his rights of personality based in the subjective uh, self-assertion of these abstract individuals. If Bulgakov takes the free development of the person as the guiding principle of politics, then this raises the metaphysical question, towards what are persons developing? And this is where theosis has to enter into his political theology, uh, mainly under the influence of Vladimir Soloviev. Soloviev had also been centrally concerned with formulating a metaphysics and a political theology oriented around the absolute significance of the person and had grounded that significance in the person's capacity for deification. That is, the capacity for the person to be a bearer of an absolute content through union with God. Bulgakov adopts this same basic approach, embracing theosis, as providing uh, the metaphysical basis for these rights of the person that he wants to defend. As with Solovyov, Bulgakov's theosis has a Christological and a Chalcedonian shape. Uh, deification is accomplished first and foremost in the humanity of Christ, the God-man, the one who perfectly harmonizes the human and divine wills and unites humanity to God and of in whose deified body we are all called to partake. What this means, though, is that the goal of social progress is not the positivist's abstract humanity, nor even human personality taken as an abstract principle. Um, but specifically, it's the person of Christ. The person of Christ gives a concrete shape to personal development as such as all human beings are called to become persons uh, after the manner of Christ's personhood. And so even as early as 1905, uh, Bulgakov had already begun to speak of history um, like Soloviev had as a, a process of the God-man. And he had begun to tie his political theology directly to Christology. And that theme would only intensify over the course of his career. Christian politics as a politics of the person uh, is going to be one that's founded on the incarnation. Uh, this is the point at which Bulgakov's political theology really starts to deviate not just from the atheistic positivist socialisms, um, but also from mainstream versions of liberalism. And not just because he is invoking confessional theology, but also because the shape of his Christological personhood uh, is one that is at odds with the anthropological individualism that um, is assumed by uh, many liberal theories. So that tension is apparent in the social dimension of theosis, which is tied to the metaphysics of all unity, which Bulgakov had adopted and adapted from Soloviev. Uh, all unity is a sort of a projection of the Slavophile doctrine of Ecclesio Sobornost uh, onto the, the world's divine foundation. In its cosmological aspect, all unity describes the basis of the created order as a cosmic harmony within diversity, the essential nature of which is self-giving canonic love. Bulgakov sees uh, this concept as ultimately being indebted to Maximus, the confessor's uh, theology of divine prototypes. There's a unique logos for every creature pre-existing within the divine logos. And the metaphysical content of creation is a kind of extra divine uh, repetition of that content that uh, Bulgakov describes as being eternally spoken by the logos within the depths of divinity. While this content uh, is eternally differentiated within the Logos, the prototypes do not exist in a state of atomization or of discord, but rather in a kind of ontological peace 
uh, the peace of an eternally actualized unity of love, which Bulgakov actually refers to um, as a universal cosmic subornos. So he makes that link between uh, the prototypes and subornos in multiple places. For Bulgakov, then, uh, this peaceful harmony of subornos becomes the Christological blueprint of creation, but one that's partially obscured in our empirical observation of the world. This is because the act of creation casts the prototypes into the milieu of becoming and potentializes the cosmic subornos by dividing creatures from each other along you know, spatio-temporal lines. And so the harmony that is eternally actualized within the Logos must be actualized now in and through multiplicity as divine wisdom inwardly overcomes, that's Bulgakov's term, creaturely separateness by enticing created beings towards a communion of love. In this framework, sin becomes associated with egoism, with a kind of hostile self-positing of the individual creature against other creatures, which binds the creature to its empirical separateness. Egoism thus fractures creation along the lines of individual difference and transforms that difference into discord and thereby overshadowing creation's foundation in the subornal peace um, with a kind of illusory universal conflict. So if personal development is understood as progress towards union with Christ and towards conformity uh, with Christ's personality, uh, then it entails an ever-deepening communion with the world. To perfect oneself and to be deified is going to involve shedding one's egoistic attachment to an isolated individuality and growing into this Christological subornus of being. This has some significant implications for how a political theology of the person might approach something like liberal democracy. Deification is a social phenomenon. The perfection of the human person requires the perfection of relations between persons and relations of, uh, perfection of relations between persons and the world. It's no surprise then that Bulgakov often denounces the atomization of society, since atomism runs directly counter to the entire vision of personal development that he's laid out. Bulgakov actually directed most of his criticism of, ad of atomism at atheistic socialism, um, but it does have some bearing on liberalism as well. A politics of personhood needs some kind of answer to the problem of atomism, and so the question is whether liberalism can provide that answer. At a theoretical level, it's not clear that liberalism um, in its most common articulations can provide it, to the extent that liberal ontologies of society tend to treat atomism and discord as humanity's natural state. While liberalism has done a great deal to secure uh, some of these rights of personality that Bulgakov desired for the Russian people, such as freedom of conscience and freedom of speech and so forth, the theoretical framing of these and other rights within liberal theory, um, theories of social contract and so forth, um, it might actually function to reinforce the rights claimants' bondage to their sinful egoism. Bulgakov, for his part, acknowledges that liberalism has done a great deal to deliver human beings from various sorts of eternal oppression, but at the same time, he recognizes that the advancement of liberalism and of democratic ideals in the modern world has also strengthened this spirit of atomism in society. So there's a kind of ambivalence about it there. All of this suggests that liberal, liberal democratic communities are not sufficient by themselves to foster the kind of personal development that's foundational to Bulgakov's politics. At the very least, liberal principles of individual freedom and rights would need some kind of a supplement. And for that, uh, Bulgakov felt the need to turn to a different sort of community, 
the community of the church. Bulgakov came to see the church as the true basis for social development fairly early in his uh, break with, with Marxism. So in an urgent task, uh, he uh, immediately after he calls on Christians to cooperate with secular liberation movements, um, he does declare that the real hope for personal freedom in Russia uh, wasn't to be found within democracy or within socialist principles um, themselves, but instead within the ideals of anarchic communism found in the first Christian communes. And of course, there is a reference here to the Sobornos of the church. The church is a kind of mediator of deification and uh, as the social body of Christ, as a society that's organized around subornal love and around the renunciation of egoism, uh, it serves as our collective way uh, into the cosmic subornost. And so human personality then can reach the height of its development only when it freely assimilates itself into the relations of the church. For this reason, Bulgakov's politics of personhood calls for a distinctively ecclesial social theory, a theory of the church as the foundation and the goal of all human sociality, what Bulgakov refers to as a Christian sociology, an alternative to secular social theories. In Bulgakov's view, I quote, it is only the church that possesses the principle of true social order in which the personal and the collective freedom and social service can be given equal weight and unified harmoniously. It is itself this very principle, a living subornost. This ecclesial sociology uh, is an essential supplement and corrective to secular political thought and the fulfillment of those traces of a personal impulse already present in the modern politics of liberation. And so Bulgakov rejects a, secular, a secularist strict separation between the ecclesial and the political. Instead, he advocates for a Christianizing or a churching of culture, the expansion of the church's subornal principles of love and freedom into every nook and cranny of our social world. Social reform, uh, yes, yeah, social reform must involve transforming the social and political order in the direction of subornost. So he states, uh, you know, social life is to be organized according to the postulates of Christian love. So also the whole of political life. We must seek for a state of things in which the church may penetrate as with an inward power the whole of human life. Bulgakov goes as far as to argue that the end point of progress, uh, or at the end point of progress, the secular state and society will become fully transparent to the church as they are to be overcome and dissolved into ecclesial life. Or put differently, Bulgakov thinks the ultimate goal of Christian politics is to deify the political and the social. So ultimately then what I've tried to show here is that uh, Bulgakov's fundamental commitment to the absolute value of the human person leads his political theology down this logical pathway through deification to Christology to ecclesiology. Um, and now finally we, we get to the real theological meaning of the question of church state relations. So if, esch if the eschatological destiny of the secular order is to be dissolved into ecclesial society, it does raise the question of how the Christian community should relate in practical terms, here and now, uh, to secular society and secular politics. Um, so, in speaking as an American, for me, this is fundamentally a question about how the church should engage with liberal democracy. So at this point, we need to step back then to Christology. Uh, because I, I think that Bulgakov's Christology, specifically his understanding of the Incarnation, can provide a kind of helpful framework for thinking about this type of question. 
If we understand deification as an incarnation of heavenly subornost in the world, and in that sense a fulfillment of the cosmic dimension of Christ's incarnation, then the doctrine can serve as a model for Christian engagement with secular politics. The churching of the world can be treated as an extension of Christ's deification of his own human nature through his victory over human egoism uh, and human alienation from God. Therefore, the manner in which the church should overcome the secular order and subordinate the secular to itself should correspond to the manner in which Christ united himself to his own historical humanity, conformed it to his divinity, and transformed it into an instrument of divine action. That is to say that a politics of theosis should be a Chalcedonian politics, or as Bulgakov might put it, a neo-Chalcedonian politics, one that attends specifically to the dynamic interplay of the divine and the human within Christ's personal consciousness. Bulgakov qualified the position expressed by Vladimir Lossky that the humanity of Christ is a deified nature that is permeated by the divine from the moment of its incarnation. Uh, while that's true in a sense, uh, for Bulgakov, the incarnation was not accomplished at a single moment in time, but instead as what he describes as a ceaselessly continuing process of the attainment of the divine in the human and the human in light of the divine, stretching across Christ's entire earthly life. Here Bulgakov builds on Soloviev's earlier Christological canonicism arguing that Christ's canonic renunciation of his divine glory makes possible the attainment of that divinity and that glory in and through his humanity. Uh, he writes, the Son of God, eternally being God, comes down from heaven and abandons, as it were, the divine life. His divine nature retains only the potential of glory, which must be actualized anew. It's actualized measure by measure, Bulgakov says, across Jesus' whole earthly life drama uh, from Bethlehem to Gethsemane. Through Jesus' human obedience to the will of the Father, the renunciation of the independence of his human will, which was made possible by the prior renunciation of the divinity. In the incarnation, Christ abandons the divine life, which is restored in him only together with the human life, or only through the deification of his humanity. So it relies on um, what Bulgakov refers to as a, a victory by persuasion. And Brandon, in his paper earlier, uh, mentioned this term persuasion. It's, it's very important in um, in Bulgakov's Christology here. So the upshot of this is something along the lines of John of Damascus's divine human perichoresis. Uh, he writes, the divinity uh, was human and the human was divine. For Christ, there is no consciousness of anything divine apart from the human. Because Christ's consciousness of self and even his consciousness of himself as God is realized through human consciousness. This means that Christ's consciousness of his own divinity depends on the capacity of his humanity to receive it or to be transparent to it. Bulgakov argues the divine humanity consists precisely in such a correlativeness of the divine and the human. The divine consciousness in Christ is commensurate with the human, uh, with the excuse me, the divine consciousness in Christ is commensurate with the human consciousness and does not exceed it. In his incarnation, Christ, and these are Bulgakov's words, actualizes his divinity, his divinity for himself only in inseparable union with the human nature as a function of the human nature's receptivity. That is, only to the extent of the deification of his humanity. And so through this kenosis, 
the divinity restrained its manifestation in Christ until everything within his humanity was incommensurate with God, was inwardly overcome through the freedom of humanity itself. So you, you see the, the phrasing here of an inward overcoming, reappearing. Bulgakov uses that basic terminology uh, several times, both in his Christology and in his political writings. If we take this, Christo this Christological inward overcoming as a model for a political theology, uh, for a politics of theosis, uh, then it would rule out any sort of a political monophysitism in which the church would simply swallow up the secular state and society. Bulgakov had argued that the church is no longer meant to influence the state from outside or from above, but from within it and within a democratic way. Bulga uh, understood Christologically, uh, this, would mean, uh, this would mean that a, if Christian politics is to strive to church the liberal democratic order, then it should do so by, not by outstripping liberalism's own receptivity. I lost my place. Uh, not by outstripping, it should deify the liberal order, not by outstripping liberalism's own receptivity to ecclesial principles. Instead, the church should operate through canonic restraint and even submersion within the, liberal, within the limits of liberal democracy. As Christ's divine self-consciousness was submerged within the limits of the human, uh, in order to lure liberal democracy from within, bit by bit, towards ever greater transparency to sobernicity. It means, on the one hand, that instead of a, a rejection, a politics of theosis should engage in a creative dialogue, uh, not just with liberalism, but also within liberalism, aiming to develop the resources of the broad liberal tradition in ways that deepen its commitment to freedom and dignity while also dampening its atomistic impulses. But it also means recognizing the impossibility of ever fully incarnating Sobornost, an anarchy of love within liberal democracy or any other compulsory political order. Um, so to wrap up here, I think it's helpful to end with the Johannine metaphor of one of Bulgakov's contemporaries, uh, Simeon Frank, um, who talked about the churching of the world using this metaphor of the light shining in darkness. Liberal democracy, however darkened it might be by sin and egoism, can, Frank argues, it can and must receive the rays of Christ's truth. It can and must be illuminated by the light of that ecclesial love in which human personality finds perfection. But before the eschaton, the liberal order, like the moon, can shine only with a dim and reflected light. It can only indirectly reflect the influence of the church's light. So liberal democracy is never going to be the church. It's never going to fully incarnate that subornos. But uh, it can be made to reflect the church to greater degrees. Um, and Bulgakov's Christology and his theology of the person, I think, help point us in the direction of a helpful starting point for thinking about how that might happen. Um, and so I will just add here, as, as I end, um, at, at that point, in terms of looking practically how that would happen, I think it's very helpful to... Uh, look more closely at the work of Simeon Frank, who um, has not received anywhere near the attention from theologians that Bulgakov has, um, but he talks similarly about themes of churching of the world and so forth. And in uh, books like uh, The Spiritual Foundations of Society and The Light Shines in Darkness, he does develop proposals for a, a Christian democracy that I think put... Uh, Bulgakov's proposals in sort of concrete terms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nate. So we have 
a little time for questions. I would ask you to come forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. You spoke about a lot of things. Um, I would like to mention my presentation, but I couldn't uh, due to various reasons. Um, it's specifically this parallel you draw, Bogakov draw, and you um, elaborated on that, between uh, incarnation and edification. Um, and I, it, I, I have it in my, in my paper, it, um, this, um, this formula of ceaseless attainment. I have it myself. And, um, but I think if you, um, uh, if you understand it as it stands by Bulgakov, you, have, you, you are confronted with a problem because incarnation, um, it's, not, it's not only ceaseless, it's also a historical process. Now, Jesus Christ um, uh, incarnated and he fulfilled his mission and now and then risen and um, that was the end of this historical process. Now, um, deification is timeless, ceaseless, and uh, you said yourself, deification is impossible in any political order. So how do you combine um, the, the historicity, so to say, of incarnation and the timelessness of deification? Um, because I think if you, if you, um, if you, if you translate it in political terms, programs, it would be quite difficult to explain to people that um, um, it, it's good to engage politically, but it's, um, but it's aimless because the aim is timeless and not to reach in this life. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you for that question. Um, you, you're absolutely correct that uh, there, you know, the process of deification that happens in Christ's incarnation is uh, a, a, a historical event, um, and it is something that Christ had accomplished within his life. Um, I'm not trying to downplay that aspect of it at all, uh, but uh, Bulgakov does also make use in various places of Solovyev's idea of there being a, a kind of expansion of the incarnation beyond that, you know, the historical speci specificity of Jesus. Um, so Solovyev is probably more explicit about this in more places than Bulgakov is. Um, but, you know, there's a great deal of talk about um, history now being a process of universalizing the incarnation. So it is an event that happened at one time and place, but Christ's theological significance um, goes beyond that point. It's, it's a, he's, you know, the prototype of creation. So the created order is, is going to end up being contained within this bigger universal process of incarnation. So um, they're, they're not at, I, I don't see that they're at odds with each other. Um, you can, on the one hand, talk about the historicity of Jesus just fine, but then also talk about the expansion of that humanity beyond um, the physical person uh, of Jesus Christ, because you know, according to pretty much all Christian theology, the body of Christ is not, it is the physical, historical body, but it also has a, a meaning beyond that, that includes uh, at least all of us, if not the whole world and the whole cosmos. So, um, yeah, I, I think there would be no issue holding those two aspects together.
Hi, I'm Taylor Ross from Duke University. Thanks, Nathaniel, for a great paper. Um, it's one of the classical critiques of political liberalism um, or liberal de democracy is that the, the notion of personhood that it sort of offers lacks any positive content, that it's a purely formal sort of idea um, that uh, a political economy can't be based on, right? Um, and it's striking to me that the places in Bulgakov's corpus where you see that kind of critique happening of a sort of purely formal, empty personalism, um, it may be my ignorance, but mostly it's in, it's in uh, f philosophical critiques. You know, it's critiques of Kant and Fichte, for instance, um, tr texts like Tragedy of Philosophy. Um, so I'm wondering if you see those sorts of critiques of the epistemological and ontological failures of authors like Kant and Fichte especially, bearing some sort of political um, critique as well, or if there's a, there's a political payoff for Bulgakov in those um, sorts of critiques of the kind of personalism you see there. No, that's a good question. Um, and to be honest, I haven't looked, I haven't thought about that question or looked extensively at the source material that would help with that. Um, I mean, he does, he does, he does make this critique uh, a few places in uh, in his more politically themed works, um, uh, although you know, as I had said before, he's mainly direct within the political context. He's mainly directing that critique not at uh, not at liberal democracy, but at the the atheist uh, and positivist forms of, of socialism, um, and also at uh, He's directing it at some of the earlier Russian thinkers, um, like Alexander Herzen, uh, the, these early Westernizers from the previous century, um, from whom he does draw a, a good deal of inspiration in terms of his personalism. So he praises them for their uh, critiques of these various forms of instrumentalizing a personhood, but ultimately um, thinks that they fail because of their positism, because they don't offer any, um, they don't give any attention to the question of metaphysics at all. Um, so that primarily is the, I guess, the context in which I've thought of, about those critiques and I've sort of extended uh, that critique that he makes of, of those westernizers mainly um, into uh, to apply that to these standard critiques of, of liberalism that you mentioned um, the idea of, of, of an empty abstract individual Brandon Gallagher um, uh, University of Exeter um, I, um, I have a book which is coming out with uh, Father John Kosugis on Florovsky, and um, uh, I went through a lot of the old interviews of um, uh, Blaine with Florovsky, and Florovsky goes on and on and on about how he hates politics, um, but yet I know that he was a member of the Republican Party because Matthew Baker used to carry around his Republican Party member card. But I, what strikes me in just listening to you um, is, is uh, here you have all these major figures um, uh, in the neopatristic synthesis and even uh, uh, people today who uh, may hold right-wing views but uh, you know, claim they're not political who are major theologians in the neopatristic thing. Um, what do you think is the major thing that divides them? What, uh, I mean, because clearly both parties have uh, uh, an attention to Chalcedon. They, they, you know, everybody agrees with that. Um, is it their doctrine of creation? Is it um, some understanding of the spirit? Um, why, um, uh, with Bulgakov, do you have this, uh, you know, completely, well, something that is actually rather refreshing for the Orthodox, uh, you know, a, a different uh, approach, an engagement, whereas all these other theologians who are, you know, worshipped and they name libraries after them at my um, esteemed alma mater, um, they, you know, are completely in, uninterested in politics or they, you know, they become Republicans and do nothing, so. That's a good question. Um, and I, I would say that there's certainly, there was a potential for uh, the neopatristic 
school to go in a direction that would have been more concerned with politics. Um, because I mean, I know Florovsky early on was actually engaging a bit with, with Herzen's work um, and dealing with uh, his, his view of progress, um, you know, which was uh, all about politics. Um, you know, but for some reason, uh, we see that that kind of personalist critique that Florovsky was open to uh, early on, eventually that morphs into this apolitical sort of defense of, of persons in um, later on in, in the neopatristic school. Um, I don't know enough about, say, Florovsky himself. Uh, I, I simply haven't studied him in depth. I don't know enough about Florovsky himself to identify where that division would be. But when we talk about someone like Zizulas, who I know a lot better, um, I, I think that one of the dividing lines would be that by the time you're talking about personalism in Zizulas, you really are starting to talk about a personhood that is empty, in a sense. Um, it, it's about relationality, um, but there's, there's really no deep attention to uh, the, the nature that these persons personalize or hypostasize. And, I think, uh, you know, so for someone like Zulus, at least, that neglect of nature, that desire to almost abstract human persons out of nature in a way, rather than to see uh, personality as um, being a kind of dynamic engagement with nature, uh, I, I, I think that that does tend to lead them away from political engagement. Um, that would be one of, one of my suggestions. Thank you very much, Nate. So I think we will move on. And I have the pleasure to introduce Antoine Arshakovsky who is a doctor in history. We all know his major work about Rus religious thinkers in the Russian emigration in Paris that came out in Russian, in French, and in English. We also know his very nice book about Le Père Serge Bulgakov, Un philosophie et un théologie chrétien, that came out in 2007 with his several essays about Sergei Bulgakov. He is research director at the Collège de Bernardin of Paris. And yes, he also will talk about sociology and personalism, pillars of a new political science for the 21st century. So the floor is yours. Merci, Regula, and merci aux organisateurs pour leur invitation. Uh, Je suis heureux de parler du père Serge Bulgakov dans cette assemblée, devant ces petites marguerites des Alpes, c'est charmant. Euh, et maintenant que j'ai dit mes trois mots en français, je passe à l'anglais. Les the organizers took the risk to ask me to speak in English, so I will do my best. I prepare the text, but uh, forgive me if some words you don't understand. The theme of my presentation is sociology and personalism foundations of the new political science in the 21st century. Um, this text is, for me, connected, first of all, with this book. Uh, we translated in French the uh, Apocalypsis of John, the latest book of Father Sergius Bulgakov in French, and I wrote an introduction to this um, text. I'm glad that now it is in English. Um, and now I would like to go further to explain why it is 
the, the, the summit of the sociological thought of Bulgakov and why this epilogue of the double trilogy of Bulgakov uh, gives us um, a lot of resources to think a new political and moral science for the 21st century. And the other reason is also because we see a crisis of political science today. I will take just one example. It's what happened this last day in Afghanistan. It's not only uh, more than 100,000 people who died during the 20 years of uh, the Western presence in Afghanistan. It is also a total failure of political science. The, the, the think tanks, the, 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 the specialists of international relations advised the political leaders of America, but also of France, other countries, to, to fight uh, in Afghanistan with, at the end, no results. And what we see is that during 20 years, every day, every day, 300 millions of dollars were spent for the invasion of Afghanistan. Every day, 300 millions of dollars during 20 years. So it's a total failure. Uh, we wanted to, to fight against fundamentalism, and today we are thinking how, on the contrary, we will recognize the Taliban's on the international level. And it's the same for the France position. I speak with a lot of diplomats of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of what we could do in Ukraine and Russia. There is zero euro which are spent for peace building projects in Eastern Europe. Zero euro. So I think it is a, 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 a moral crisis. And the political science doesn't want to have any relations with uh, ethics today. And this is why the book of John Milbank with Adrian Papst, Papst, The Politics of Virtue, is so important because it is also a foundation for a new moral and political science. So now, what I want to share with you is that in this book, what we see is that personalism and sociology are founded on eschatological metaphysics of Father Sergius Bulgakov. And from this first part, then I will go to the second part to say, from this eschatological personalism and eschatological sociology, what could be this new political science? So the first part is the following. Even before the Russian Revolution, Sergei Bulgakov, in his courses in political and economical science at the Moscow Commercial Institute, had shown the limits of the modern conception of political science. For Bulgakov, it was appropriate to recognize Machiavelli, Machiavelli's part of truth in the face of the political theology of the papacy in the Middle Ages. Machiavel had been right, according to him, to criticize in the continuity of Dante the theory of the two swords of the papacy. He was bold in breaking away also from the Augustian view of history understood as a long, empty corridor where men can only suffer while awaiting their salvation at the end of the time with the descent of the city of God. There was nothing Christian about this vision, but there was nothing evangelical also in the rehabilitation of the Roman conception of the state by Machiavel. The mobilization of the virtue made up of skill but also of devious blows and manipulations in the name of the prince's interests had nothing to do with Christian virtue. It drew on a pagan Greek background, 
according to which the world was ruled by fortune, that is to say, by all that we do not owe to the merit of our own actions. The latest book of Bulgakov, The Apocalypsis of John, completes all his political thinking by taking seriously the perspective of the kingdom of God on the earth. The last book of the Bible was indeed for him, I quote, the revelation of the millennial terrestrial reign provisional, and then of the universal reign of the saints to the centuries of the centuries, end of quote. According to his exegesis, there is a Christian form of interpreting the coming of the reign of Christ and his saints for a thousand years, announced in the revelation of John in chapter 20, as well as in the description of the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem to the earth described in chapters 21 and 22. The second description of the descent from heaven of the Jerusalem described in chapter 21, 10, belongs truly, according to Bulgakov, to the history of this world. I quote, it is therefore a divine human work that crowns the history of men. And that is why we must understand this humanity of its own to the end. But in this work, this divine human work, it is also revealed the action of grace, the strength of God manifested in the transfiguration. It is the manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth in still earthly forms as a divine revelation." End of quote. This revelation allows us to understand why Christ taught his disciples to pray to the Father that his kingdom come and that his will be done, I quote, on earth as it is in heaven, end of quote. The awareness by Bulgakov, but also by Berdyaev, of the historical and political implication of this Jesus prior, beyond the heretical millenarian temptations of Joachim de Flore, Henri de Lubac wrote about that, brought about a reconciliation between sapiential theology and personalist metaphysics. Neither of them, Bulgakov or Berdyaev, for example, believed in the coming of a time of the spirit as a deus ex machina. That was not their vision. On the other hand, both thought in an eschatological, personalist and sociological way the relation of the personhood of God to its own Trinitarian consciousness. The philosopher Berdyaev, in his commentary of the Mysterium Magnum by Jacob Böhm, identified the Sophia with the deepest freedom of God and of man. Whereas Bulgakov understood wisdom not as a new divinity, but as the Trinitarian self-consciousness of the divine personhood. Their stroke of genius, to put it in a nutshell, was to think of an intermediate eschatology, une eschatology intermédiaire, between the temporality of participation in ecclesial grace, which recognize that the kingdom of God can manifest itself in a community way in this world, in the church, and the temporality of the gift of, the gift of glory, when God will be all in all. Berdyaev, in his essay on eschatological metaphysics, in the end of his life also, insisted on the fact that every creative and ethical gesture makes it possible to complete fallen history and to manifest in this world the kingdom of the saints. And truly, they were surrounded by saints from Mother Maria Skobzova to um, Lagovsky and many others. Bulgakov also 
theorized his eschatology, which combined the, tame, the time of grace with the time of glory. I quote, Known of these aspects of the kingdom of God, communion with God and eschatology exhaust the whole meaning of the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God which is in us, although it inaugurates eternal life, does not exclude life in time. On the contrary, it affirms the meaning of what is happening in time. In time, we understand the meaning of the last judgment, because in time, in a way, eternity is considered. The aspiration for the second coming does not destroy the feeling that the history exists, even if the time between the first and second coming is longer than originally thought. And this time is not for us an indifferent course of events, but the history of the church, the authenticity and the content of what is happening in the church. History finds its justification." End of quote. This is the contrary of the amillennial position of Augustine. While the modern conception of sovereignty inspired by Machiavel and also in France by Jean Baudin in the 16th century proved incapable in the 30s of the 20th century of stemming the, the rise of conspiracy theories, populism, and finally totalitarian regimes, and we know what's happening today is also a post-truth uh, situation. Father Sergius Bulgakov proposed a conception of politics connected with this new metaphysics. For him, God has not withdrawn from the history of man. God reveals himself to mankind when mankind is ready to turn to his divine wisdom through the reign of the Father, the power of the Son, and the glory of the Holy Spirit. Genuine design consisted of being aware of both, being thrown into the world and being able to participate already now in the kingdom of God on the earth. The whole history of humanity is therefore that of the encounter between divine and eternal wisdom and created and temporal wisdom. This means in particular that the church, which is both the body of Christ and the bride of the Lamb, is called to go through the same stages of divinization as Jesus Christ. The passage from a prophetic conscience to a sacramental conscience, and finally, to a royal conscience during the millennium announced by Revelation in chapter 20. And for Bulgakov, this royal consciousness of the church didn't happen yet. If Augustinian amillennial political theology is to be condemned, it is because it excludes any participation of humanity in the advent of the kingdom of God. This is a kind of ecclesiological docetism without any participation of the human dimension of the church. However, according to Christian revelation, history does have a meaning which will be manifested by a period of peace on earth thanks to the action of the Virgin Mary, the saints, the just, starting already now. And, and we find lots of prophecies in the Bible about that. You know, So that was the main answer of Bulgakov to Augustine, and he, he was adding also that the devil was never put in jail in the last 2,000 years. So you can't say it's already now in the church. So this intermediate eschatology is found today, and this is very interesting for me coming here to Fribourg, in the Catholic Church also, as it emerged from the work of the Catholic theologian Cyril Pasquier, and you can find his book uh, with the other books that you published here. In the thesis, he recently defended at this University of Fribourg, Approche du Millennium, une Christologie de l'Histoire, two years ago. 
This, refers, this book refers more to the sapiential thought of Louis-Marie Grignon de Montfort than to that of Father Sergius Bulgakov. But his Mariology brings him closer to Bulgakov intermediate eschatological personalist and sociological metaphysics, which means that there is a, a prise de conscience of an ecumenical prise de conscience of this importance of intermediary eschatology. So the second part is now, what are the consequences of this eschatological metaphysic on a political and moral science? The new eschatological metaphysics, both personalist and sociological, is neither a return to the theory of the two words, nor a new sacralization of public power. For this vision, the world is indeed constituted by power relations. But authentic power is not found in the claim to be able to destroy one's adversary. For the soul is an indestructible reality. Genuine sovereignty consists in manifesting the the just, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Some states may spend their fortunes on propaganda, but the recent history of totalitarianism shows that truth always triumphs over lies. And we see also the, the tremendous budget that are put in propaganda shows the, 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 the strength of truth. This spiritual metaphysics in, induces a certain number of developments in political and moral science, which can be briefly sketched out, starting with a new theory of sovereignty and law, an ecumenical conception of political action, and finally, a rediscovery by Christians of the sense of their involvement in politics. So let's start with sovereignty and law. The state is not, as Jean Baudin thought, the secular power capable of imposing outside any participation in divine life an absolute power, at the same time unique, indivisible, and intransferable, which is the basis of our international system since the, tra the Treaty of Westphalie. Contemporary authors like Pascal Lamy, who came recently at the Collège de Bernardin, the former director of the WTO and the president of the Peace Forum of Paris that Emmanuel Macron launched recently, he has shown the ridiculousness of such a claim in the age of globalization and the advent of multinational powers, especially financial ones. Nor is the state as Hegel's modern epistemology imagined, the fulfilling people spirit that puts law as its service. This vision, which refused to link any conception of justice to public power, as Ernst Cassirer has shown immediately after the Second World War, dans le mythe de l'État, was also shattered in the 20th century. Rather, the state should be understood as a spiritual power. And Jesus says to Pilate, tu n'aurais aucun pouvoir s'il ne t'était donné d'en haut. You wouldn't receive no power if it would not be given from, from high. So the state should be understood as a spiritual power, itself subject to divine justice, capable of subjecting society to legal relations. The latter must itself be at the service of the highest conception of justice, both distributive and appreciative, according to the theory of Michael Sandel, who is a, uh, an American Jewish political scientist of Harvard. So this conception of justice, both distributive and appreciative, according to the theory of Michael Sandel, wants to prevent, to prevent the state from dissolving into corruption or anarchy. This is why law itself must be placed at the service of that which transcends it, namely wisdom. 
as King Solomon knew. It is through wisdom that God gives that man can recognize divine justice. God answers Solomon's prayer in this way, dans le Livre des Rois, in King's Books. I quote, Since you ask for wisdom to exercise right, righteousness, behold, I will do according to your word. End of quote. It is therefore on God that the gift of wisdom depends, and it is by this wisdom alone that man can recognize justice. In the book of Proverbs, the second chapter, I, wisdom makes justice depend on itself. I quote, For the Lord gives wisdom, then you will understand justice, tzedek, equity, mishpas, righteousness, and thus you will walk in the way of the good people, you will keep the path of the right, righteous. End of quote. So human justice can therefore only be understood and followed through the wisdom of God. The New Testament conception of law is also eschatological, the glory of the nations and therefore of the human rights is preserved in the heavenly Jerusalem as evidenced by chapter 21 of Revelation. Likewise, Matthew insists on this word of Jesus Christ, you will be judged as you have judged. This means that God adopts to judge a man not the absolute of righteousness, but the righteousness of that man. He judges him according to his own criteria, according to his words, according to his rule of life or law, according to his judgments. And man finds himself condemned, not first of all by the absolute holiness of God, before whom he is annihilated and who appears only when God forgives, but above all by his own justice. This eschatological conception of law is hostile as much to positive law as to natural law because of their refusal of any transcendent and personalist vision of justice. The French thinker Jacques Ellul, a personalist thinker who was close to Berdyaev but also to Wilhelm um, Wissertruft, published, an, an, he was a, a Protestant who work, worked a lot of, on Karl Barth, and he published an important book on this subject in 1946, Le Fondement Théologique du Droit. For Elul, as for Bulgakov, is just what is in accordance with the will of God. What is ordered in relation to that justice is right. The act of God that establishes law is the covenant, that is, the righteousness of God in motion, in history. Consequently, in this eschatological conception of justice, the legal construction must derive mainly from discernments in concrete situations, from a judgment based on historical facts, more or less just, according to the justice of God, and from human relations with bringing into play human rights and God-given institutions. So here we are very far from Paul Ricoeur's understanding of justice, where there is not at all this idea of God's justice. Paul Ricoeur parle des de, de just institutions, but not at all uh, the God's wisdom. Second, Eschatological metaphysics is fully ecumenical and must be investigated in all forms of interconfessional, interreligious, and interconvictional dialogues and joint actions, which is not at all the case in political theory at the Institut d'études politiques de Paris. Um, recently, all the churches, all the religions in France were against the new law that was adopted last month in Paris, which adopts um, the uh, les chimères, 
the embryo with uh, human and animal together, or which adopts, for instance, the, uh, 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 the, the, the possibility to have babies for lesbian uh, couples. So religions in France were against that, and nobody was interested by this position. So there is not at all the idea that political science should be careful to interreligious positions. The same for the Conseil National uh, d'Ethique. In any case, for Bulgakov, the advent of the kingdom of God on earth, marked by the advent of the city with 12 gates in the name of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, described in Revelation 21, will be the triumph of Judeo-Christianity in the whole world. That will go together, the millennium and the triumph of Judeo-Christianity in the whole world. This ecumenical character can be actualized today through political science. The state for sapiential personalist and ecumenical metaphysics is the power capable of embodying divine human wisdom through its executive, legislative, and judicial expressions. According to the Judeo-Christian tradition of wisdom, the state should be able to embody virtues such as wisdom and discernment, counsel and valor, knowledge and fear, which are in the Bible and which you can find also in Richard de Saint-Victor, Hugues de Saint-Victor, and the others. Now, wisdom is a gift of the spirit which belongs to the different spiritual traditions of the East and the West, as David Bentley Hart has shown very well in his beautiful book, The Experience of God, where he speaks about Sit Shat Anandi, la, 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 la divinité indienne. For the sapiential tradition of Asian religions, rediscovered today by the jurist Mireille Delmas Marty, who was professor at the Collège de France, uh, harmony is found in the balance between freedom and security, competition and cooperation, exclusion and integration, innovation and conservation. So this is not at all natural law or positivist law, the criteria between, let's say, freedom and security is the dignity of human being. It's the dignity of the creation, and so on. And here, of course, in this balance, in this notion of harmony, we see the, the oriental influence. In the book that I have my, myself just completed on ecumenical metaphysics, I show that the four pillars of religious faith just glorification, faithful memory, moral uprightness, knowledge of justice, and the four ways of acquiring the truth, correspondence, stability, authenticity, consensus, are found in varying degrees of consciousness within the main religious and convictional traditions. Also, to deprive oneself of the spiritual dimension of faith, as Western democracy do, is as absurd as to deprive oneself of its rational death, as fundamentalist and dictatorial regimes do. This is why the political and moral science of the 21st century will necessarily be based on an ecumenical theology and ecumenical metaphysics of politics. Finally, the, the third possible influence, the new political and moral science also offers a response to the contemporary craze for transhumanism from Julian Huxley to Ray Kurzweil today in Google through his eschatological and ecumenical anthropology. There is a vision in transhumanism that we will qualify as Manichaean, or neo qatar The soul is captured there as a disembodied mind to the point that artificial intelligence researchers and video game designers 
already imagine that they can download the human mind and transfer it from one computer to the other, which is the mind uploading. There are lots of films about that. Bulgakov, like Berdyaev, had the merit not only of criticizing this dualistic or even monistic vision of the human spirit, but also of proposing an alternative by re-establishing a ternary anthropology. They particularly appreciated the thought of Fyodorov, in particular his great project of raising the dead from the dead, which was to become the common work of humanity liturgically united in Christ. Both admittedly criticized Fyodorov for failing to see that there is two possible conceptions of the resurrection, a resuscitation in the material body and a resurrection in the spiritual body. But what was important to them was Fyodorov's proposed updates of the ternary anthropology of the church of the first millennium. And we know the importance of this uh, influence of uh, Fyodorov on uh, the cosmic uh, tendency of Vernadsky in the Soviet period and so on. We know, in fact, that the Apostle Paul addressed the Thessalonian in this way. I quote, may your whole being, spirit, soul, and body be kept without reproach, end of quote. So it's a Trinitarian, it's a une vision ternaire uh, which goes together with personalism and sociology. Following Bulgakov, we can suggest that political science should be associated with a fully eschatological and ecumenical vision of the vocation of man in order to overcome the transhumanist gnosis. Future political and moral science should not be afraid to confront the question, the question of victory, at least partial, over death. For evangelical faith testifies that Christ brought resurrection power into the world. Indeed, as the evangelist Matthew reports in chapter 10, Christ made it clear to his apostles that they would be concerned with his disciples as they carried out their mission of resurrection. But this was based above all on an active faith in the proximity of the kingdom of God on the earth. Christ's words to his disciples are, I quote Matthew 10, go preach and say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, expels demons. When we study, end of quote, when we study the text closely, we see that the orthodoxy of the apostolic faith in the proximity of the kingdom consists in holding together the glory, the memory, the law, and the justice. The sick, the dead, the lepers, the demons. And it is also holding together the two visions of the descent from heavenly Jerusalem, which are intertwined in the perspective of divine humanity, which is the, the, the main problem of Bulgakov in these books. There are 100 pages why there is, first of all, the eschatological descent and then the divine human descent. And the, 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 for me, that's my personal interpretation. interpretation. It goes in this intertwined perspective of divino humanity. There is this vertical axis is discerned in the first vision of heavenly Jerusalem. In fact, we find here on one side the celebration of the glory of God, namely the gift of resuscitating since, as the apocalypse attests, of death there will be no more. Revelation 21.4. This gift is intertwined on the other side with the work of authentic memory. That is the coming of kingdom. This is the authentic memory. This is why it is advisable to accomplish a work of purification with regard to the fallen memory 
In the Gospel of Luke, the leper who is justified is the one who remembers that he was healed by the Lord. This is why it is necessary to accomplish a work of purification of the forgetful memory by the glorification of the divine action. The angel therefore asked John to write because these words are certain and true. Here is the truth in this unity of the two glorification and memory. But we can also discern a horizontal axis of faith between law and justice and also ecological justice. In the second vision of the messianic Jerusalem, namely the incarnation in moral law of divine justice and therefore the expulsions, the expulsion of demons from the divine human city as it is in the Revelation 21, 27, expulsions of demons. We observe also in the book of the Revelation the fulfillment of God's righteousness in the political life of the nations that will walk in the light of the Lamb. This allows the ability to heal the sick. And here we find the justice in the vision of St. John with the trees of life whose leaves can heal the pagans. So conclusion, of course, the rediscovery by Christians of their authentic political vocation requires prior spiritual work. Likewise, the virtuous and harmonious state which could succeed the various figures of the state in the postmodern era, from the ultra-liberal state to the mafia state, has no chance of seeing the light of day unless contemporary consciousness managed to free itself from the modern doctrine according to which the finality of politics is the conquest and conservation of power, which is already from the time of Bulgakov and Jacques Maritain, uh, the, 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 the main problem of our political science. And Raymond Aron, in particular, played a big role for this. If all the students in political science are starting with John Rawls and Machiavel, I think, and Emmanuel Macron wrote his own master thesis on Machiavel, we have a problem. The new political science must be able not only to, 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 to follow the common good, but to, to seek the kingdom of God on the earth. On the, on the basis, of course, of all religious traditions. I would like to quote, um, to, to take the example of Kate Reworth. You Maybe you know her, she's from England, she's an economist. Her new economics, respectful of social life as much as of creation, draws on the resources of Buddhism as much as on the Christian vision of the tree of life. Sophia, uh, her book is the, the Donut Economy. It's a beautiful and very interesting book. Sophiological thought agrees with personalist thought in recalling that the end of politics is the common good of a people united within just institutions. Only such a metaphysics allows man to be in the world in the mode of being both embodied in this world and participating in a realm which transcends the limits of this world with the first resurrection of the saints. Like Berdyaev, Bulgakov refused to sanctify the state, the secular state, and distanced himself from the monarchist circles of the Russian immigration. In the 20s and the 40s, he defended a democratic state on the American model institutionally separated from religious institutions while cooperating with them and based on the principle of human rights of the human beings understood as divine creatures. And this is what especially was important for Martin Luther King, who was, who was reading Berdyaev, uh, this personalist dimension of Martin Luther King for him, was coming from Berdyaev, which I think is interesting. 
But for Bulgakov, only an in-depth rediscovery of wisdom in God and in creation was able to transform the conception of the solitary state into a new form of personalist sovereignty, virtuous, inclusive, and respectful of creation. Ce sera donc le passage de l'état-nation solitaire à la fraternité des communautés solidaires. Voilà. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antoine, for sharing your visions. We are at the end of the time of the first day. Are there immediate reactions that have to be said now? Okay. This is Alexei Kozirev. <laughs> perspectives eschatologiques brillantes, mais euh, qu'est-ce que vous pouvez dire à propos euh, du problème des conflits euh, euh, intérieurs des confessions euh, Le problème qui existait même à l'époque de Bulgakov, nous savons bien cette histoire des Karloviens et Elogiens, euh, et maintenant, c'est aussi le vrai problème, surtout dans le monde orthodoxe. L'année suivante, on aura le congrès universel de l'ONU à Saint-Pétersbourg sur le dialogue interconfessionnel. Mais il y aura aussi une section de dialogue à l'intérieur des confessions. Est-ce de l'Organisation des Nations Unies à Pétersbourg. Est-ce qu'il y a euh, le moyen d'inclusion euh, de ce problème, euh, des tensions vraiment affreuses qui existent aujourd'hui euh, à l'intérieur des confessions Et deuxième question peut-être concerne l'islam. Soloviov touchait euh, islam dans ses œuvres. Est-ce que Bulgakov voyait islam euh, inclus dans Uh, ce dialogue et communique. Merci. Okay. So the question of uh, my friend Alexei Kozirev is about um, Bulgakov, Bulgakovian eschatology and uh, ecumenical dialogues. How is it possible to achieve this work together if there is division today? And the second question is about Islam, if Bulgakov was uh, dealing also with the question of Islam. Uh, concerning the first question, this is why I think it is important to speak about an ecumenical metaphysics. And this is why I spent one year to write this ecumenical metaphysics. We need to, to explain that ecumenism is a real science. But this science is not a, a little part of ecclesiology. It's not a, a little part of uh, religious studies. It is a real science, a vision of the world on an ecumenical, on a metaphysical level. And if we adopt this metaphysical level, then we can discuss of personalism, of sociology, of a, this ternarian approach also with scientists and so on. And that will help orthodox among themselves. That will help also dialogues between Catholic and Orthodox, Protestants, and uh, that will help for interreligious dialogue. That will help for interconvictional dialogue. This is my total conviction. I wrote 600 pages on this subject, so it's the right question. So yes. I would, I, would, I would recommend to this conference in St. Petersburg that you mentioned with the United Nations next year to include uh, this metaphysic discussion on ecumenism uh, in order to, to help a true peace-building politics in the world. Today, peace-building doesn't really exist in the budgets, as we have seen. 
this is not normal. We should change this, and we should make pressure on this. There is the Saint Egidio community, which says that there is a, um, a, 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 le Ministère de la Défense Nationale, the National Defense, uh, which is a strategic understanding of peace. But we should have also an, an anticipatory understanding of peace. And the Catholic Church with the Caritas, the Anglican Church, the many churches, and now the Orthodox Church with the social doctrine of the church could, could, could help for this. So this is for the first question. And the second question about Islam, I don't think um, Bulgakov, of course he knew the book uh, Soloviev wrote about Mahomet, but himself was much more concerned with the dialogue with the Jewish community. Uh, but when you, when you read his book on the, the Bride of the Lamb, he speaks about the, the, the borders of the church, and he goes very far because he says the wisdom is speaking to the à tous les fils d'Adam, to, to all the sons of Adam, which means to everybody. So it's, it, it, it includes Islam, of course. It includes um, Buddhism and so on. So it's a very broad vision of what should be the um, contribution of the different religions to this uh, understanding of the church as the bride of the land. Thank you very much, Antoine and Nate, for this very interesting session about political theology. Thank I think you. I would like to remind you of the notions we heard uh, of Rowan Williams, <laughs> that is care and nurturing. So I think that was, is what we need now. <laughs> and I would like to invite you to our welcoming reception. It's not far away, it's just here in the hall you already know. So you're invited to enjoy the evening and Come back tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.